Yo, what's up? I'm QRS and Terry, and you are now watching to go. Thank you for joining us. The people who are just joining. Us, please let us know in the chat where you're coming in from. We're glad to see that this is a worldwide event. I've been seeing some of the registrations come through. We have live on screen Brooke Pierce or Dr. Brooke Pierce and Amy Lennox Brown. Oh, Bowley. I'm messing Bowley. up. Sorry. <laughs> I will not do that again. I really apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm just, lots good. We're at Vertigo Day. Tell me how it all kind of came together. I know Dr. Pierce reached out to me a few days ago, or it feels like a few days ago, and we were just like, hey, we're going to do this Vertigo Day thing. But Amy, I know, got involved. And for the people that are just now watching and tuning in, how did this come together? Well, I think the excitement really is pulling kind of the this worldwide group of resources together. And Amy and I, for a long time, along with Chelsea, have known, you know, what happens in our clinic, um, you know, happens all over the world with regard to lack of resources. So by the time we're seeing patients, the frustration level of the lack of what's in their immediate area or what they need, um, it's frustrating. And so we just really thought, you know, we'll, we'll throw something together for patients, you know, that we know need the resources, but at the same time have a very candid very honest conversation about what's currently out there yeah and I, I'm, I'm very much the same so uh i mean i always quote the st st stats which are you know it takes usually four specialists and f between four and five years before a, a patient gets uh, a clear diagnosis with what's going on with their dizziness and you know we've me and Brooke have been working together a lot, trying to disseminate information, getting information out there. And this just seemed like a perfect opportunity, especially with lockdown, to pull all our resources together and see see if we could put something really strong together for our patients. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We're getting a little bit of uh, feedback from, I think you're in, Amy. I just okay. check your internet connection. It's a little, or if you have headphones, please put headphones on. I think that, that okay. might fix I'll grab that. Some headphones. We have almost 100 people watching this live. Dr. Pierce, you have a presentation that is about to start here momentarily. Could you give a little bit of background into yourself? What brought you into starting the Dizziness and Vertigo Institute of Los Angeles and what you're excited to talk about today at the Z and Ver or at Vertigo Day? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things is I truly believe that knowledge is power. And so as a patient, whether you are experiencing vertigo yourself or you actually have a family member or a loved one, understanding what's happening in the system is really important. And so putting together just a, a little presentation, not only visually, but with some information that has a little bit of sub substance from a medical standpoint, but a lot more kind of functional application was our goal. So that's kind of where we wanted to kick things off with regard to the Dizzy 101 discussion. And then, you know, as far as myself, again, kind of echoing, you know, the lack of resources and knowing that I have such a passion for helping people return to their normal state. Um, Chelsea and I just knew that opening a practice that had emphasis on the Dizzy patient, not only diagnostically, but the solutions. And so that's why we opened the Dizzy and Vertigo Institute here in LA is because, you know, from beginning to end, we're able to hear the story, plug in the science and then get the actual resources um, together for the patient. It's a very exciting and very gratifying process for, for everybody involved. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, Brooke, before we get started, I know Amy is back. Amy, are you back? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what are you most excited to, to learn from Dr. Pierce's presentation today, Amy? <laughs> Well, I know that Dr. Pierce has been using very kind of um, new techniques, very forward thinking, not scared of kind of ch uh, challenging that paradigm that maybe some of us dizziness specialists have been stuck in for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and I know that what Dr. Brooke is uh, presenting and um, gives to her patients is, is, is very innovative, very pioneering and kudos to you for, for, for pushing forward and, and, and delivering that for your patients. Wonderful, wonderful. 
Oh, what we're about to do is we're going to go ahead and get started. We have about 130 people watching us live. Hello, everyone. Please let us know where you're coming from. We're excited to see all the locations. We're throwing that stuff up on screen as, as you come in. And mm -hmm. we will be in the comments. So if you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop us an email. I'll put that email on screen momentarily. Or you can just leave it in the, the actual chat and we'll get to it as well. So with that being said, I'm going to kick over to Dr. Pierce saying we're going to start up your presentation. How do you feel about that, Dr. Pierce? I'm excited. Let's see. Here we go, guys. All righty. Here we go. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. This is actually really exciting. We're going to go ahead and kick things off. My name is Dr. Brooke Pierce. I am one of the co-founders of Dizzy and Vertigo Institute in Los Angeles. We are Audiology Corporation and all up to you in just a moment. So the reason you all are here is because either you or someone you love is actually affected by dizziness. And so dizziness is pretty complicated. So I'm gonna start breaking things down. But our mission as specialists or specialists that work with dizzy patients should be clear. So our job is to help dizzy patients translate the complexity of these symptoms into real solutions. And you know it's really important to work in a collaborative environment with a collaborative approach, um, working with patients' physicians, working with occupational therapists, physical therapists, audiologists, chiropractors, dietitians, the list goes on and on and on uh, to really manage and treat vestibular disorders. So I'm going to break down what an audiologist is because it means um, different things in different parts of the world. In the United States, um, I'm going to read straight from the slide because it's a little bit of a long slide, but it's a clinical specialist that's uniquely qualified in a comprehensive way to identify, evaluate, habituate, and rehabilitate those of impairments of the auditory and then the vestibular um, system. Audiologists are professionals who identify, assess, and manage these disorders of the auditory, balance, or other neural systems. So one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle when we get into dizziness is what does it mean? Because dizziness really is an umbrella term. Um, when we sit down with patients, we ask them to just go ahead and tell us how they're feeling. Explain their symptoms of dizziness to us. And we get a whole slew of descriptions. Dizziness is the umbrella term, and underneath it is going to fall the actual description. So vertigo would be a spinning sensation, imbalance, disequilibrium, rocking, swaying, lightheadedness. We even hear um, walking on clouds or that they feel very visually disturbed. So whether they're seated or, um, you know, kind of watching things from side to side, it just feels like a big disconnect. Uh, fuzzy vision fatigued eyes, also a woozy sensation, um, even a floating sensation. Sometimes we hear it's sort of like an out-of-body experience, tendency to fall, unsteadiness, even a swimming sensation, um, hypersensitivity to really crowded or busy environments. So that could even be um, like at a basketball game or walking around the street, you know, on a busy sidewalk. Um, and then also spatial disorientation. So really feeling that there's a big disconnect between where your body is in space and where you physically are supposed to be in space. So here's what gets extremely complicated. So dizziness is a symptom of everything. And so you're gonna hear that throughout the day that it's, it's very complicated because it, it kind of sprinkles throughout specialties. So dizziness can exist um, from a cardiovascular component, from a neurological component, metabolic, vestibular, which we're going to get into a lot today, a visual impairment, psychological, um, diet and nutrition, medications or changes in medications, head injuries, um, drugs, alcohol, the list goes on and on and on. So. I think these statistics are pretty fascinating. And the more education we get out there and the more um, that these stats become common knowledge, the more resources that we can all tap into. 
So a third of all dizzy patients um, are actually, when they're reporting to healthcare professionals, um, can be broken up to vestibular patients or the inner ear is actually involved. So before I get too deep into it, I'm going to kind of high level um, the 101 discussion today. And then each clinician and physician that's going to be presenting today will take a deeper dive. But to think about all of those descriptions that I just went through from cardiovascular to neurology, and, and again, the list goes on and on. A third of those patients are actually coming from the ear, from the vestibular system itself. So stat number two up here um, is pretty interesting in the United States, and it's very similar statistically um, in Europe and Australia and, and throughout the world. Um, but our stats here in the States are 35% of people age 40 and above, which for us is about 60 million Americans, have experienced some type of vestibular dysfunction. So that's pretty wild to think how prevalent it actually is. And then with children, so when we're talking about the pediatric population, one in 20 kids in the United States are going to have dizziness or balance problems. So this is a pretty good um, rendition of what a lot of patients, you know, will describe as dizziness or what their symptoms are. So again, you know, it doesn't have to be a true spinning or a vertiginous bout or, or experience, a bobbing sensation. So, you know, what does all this mean and why are you guys actually here today? And I think the simple answer to it is, you know, we want solutions. We want to know what the next options are and how do we provide relief. So let's get into a little bit of the science. And we're going to kind of high level a lot of this. But one of the most important things to understand when we first get into the diagnostic testing is are we looking at something that has to do with the central system? So when we're looking at the actual um, kind of the scary stuff, the brain, the brain stem, and the way the brain is, is processing information, or are we looking at something that is peripheral, meaning that it's outside the brain and the brain stem? And in particular, when we're going through this discussion today, it's going to be how the vestibular system is involved. So before we take a little bit of a deeper dive, I wanted to just break down the ear, and we'll get to a schematic in a minute, but the ear has two parts to it. So there's going to be the hearing part of the ear, which most of us associate with, with the ear itself, and then the actual balance part of the ear. So the balance part of the ear is what we keep referencing or what I keep alluding to um, as the vestibular system. So it will start to make a lot more sense, you know, the, the purpose of this um, kind of meeting of the minds here is not to take a deep dive into the anatomy and physiology, but really the functionality and the fix of all of this. So really differentiating between central and peripheral dizziness can be really challenging. So going back to that, that step one, step one really is to rule out anything scary, any central causes. This is going to be your strokes, um, any type of TBI. So neurology is involved very heavily. Um, same with cardiology, making sure that we're not dealing with a situation um, that could potentially be life-threatening. So that's going to be the first stop for a lot of patients is to be medically evaluated and any type of those scary etiologies rolled out. The second step is really going to be to determine if it is peripheral. So really looking at what the functional applications of the system are and if there is dysfunction in one or even more of the peripheral system. So we'll get into a little bit of trivia. So when we start speaking about the peripheral vestibular system, just kind of think in your heads here, but I think this is super interesting and this is gonna really kind of speak to a lot more of um, the discussions we have throughout the course of the day. But does anybody know the major sensory organs that are in the vestibular system? So we don't have to go through you know, the names of them, but how many, how many end organs are in the vestibular system? So there's actually 10, which is pretty fascinating. And you're going to hear a lot of discussion about why all 10 of those end organs need to be evaluated. Um, but we have five on the right side and five on the left side. So let's break this down because 10 total major sensory organs are going to be making up the vestibular system. 
So there's three semicircular canals. So we all have these in our ears. They look like little, um, like little loops on a roller coaster. And those three canals are responsible for giving us the orientation of where we are in space, kind of the angular and linear acceleration, and then just overall sensation to gravity. So these end organs are very, very important because you could be seated and moving your head up and down. And the signal that's coming from these vestibular end organs is giving our body the input it needs. There is significant involvement in how these little end organs um, interact and, and send a signal for our overall balance. So they make a very big wave with regard to our equilibrium, um, our overall balance, our posture, and then even keeping our head upright, um, even as we're kind of moving our head around or bending up and down. So if we dive a little bit deeper, I think this is a really cool schematic. Basically, it's, it's telling us, or kind of breaking down how complicated the balance system really is. So if we think of the vestibular system as like a little GPS or, or basically telling our body where we are on a map, it's really important to see how the brain integrates all of that. So the, the brain is taking input from a lot of different sources. And so the vestibular system is one of them. The input from the eyes, the vision system, the joint, um, the position and the actual uh, proprioceptive input from our muscles, control of our motor skills and our overall posture, it all goes together. So there's basically three reflexes that are, are working seamlessly in the background. The first one is that reflex between the ear, the eye, the brain. So that's the vestibular ocular reflex. And it really does help with that gaze stabilization with head movement, and helps the eyes compensate. So when they're moving in different positions, or excuse me, when the head is moving in different positions, the eyes are correcting for that movement. The second one is gonna be the vestibular spinal reflex. And that one really is responsible for the motor control and then just overall postural support. And then the final one is gonna be responsible for actual kind of neck stability and overall head stabilization and position in space. So the brain's taking all of this in real time and, and processing it processing it pretty seamlessly when we feel well. So I think what's really kind of one of the biggest questions we get from a lot of patients is how do you even know that it's the vestibular system? How do you even know kind of what we're looking at? Because it is so complicated. There's so many different pieces of it. How do we know that it's not the heart? How do we know that it's not the brain? How do we know that we're specifically honing in on those 10 end organs? So really, it's pretty black and white when we look at things from an objective standpoint. Um, science and technology have come light years. Even in the last 10 years, we really are able to take the guesswork out of a lot of this. And so you'll see as we get into some of the more um, complicated and comprehensive talks throughout the day, this is not guess. It's not guesswork. There's no magic to this. It's black and white science with a lot of objective data and a lot of norms that we that we use worldwide that all of us are using to make sure we know what the end organs are doing and what they're not doing. So clinically, when you're going into a clinic, there should be two kind of wheelhouses with regard to the discussion that you're having with your clinician. So the first one should be subjectively how you're feeling. So what did happen when the onset of this occurred? What is your case history? Um, was there a cause of it? What does the duration of your symptoms look like? How often is it happening? Um, how severe is it happening? Are there triggers? You know, what makes it better? It should be a very comprehensive discussion. It shouldn't take five minutes. It shouldn't take 15 minutes. You know, it, it should be pretty comprehensive in the sense that you feel you're able to answer all of the questions that were placed on a lot of the questionnaires and that you're able to articulate your story in its capacity. And it, it could take a long time so that the clinician has a very good idea of what we're looking at. Now, from an objective standpoint, when we're specifically looking at the ear, so the vestibular system, the tests need to be robust in the sense that the clinician needs to understand with certainty what the system is doing and what those 10 end organs are doing. Now, previously, and 
when we speak with clinicians who um, are not in this space all the time, most patients will say, well, you know, they either did, um, you know, gave patients home, home epley maneuvers to try at home or Brant Duroffs to see if that helps. Or um, maybe the patient Googled, you know, or looked up on YouTube some videos, um, tried some exercises. It's really, you know, throwing a dart with your eyes closed at a target. You might hit it, you might get it right, but at the same time, there is a big, big margin of error. So we take the guesswork out of all of this, really going beyond, you know, trying to see what works or giving some global exercises to see if it helps and getting to the crux of what's really happening. So previously, I'm going to kind of go backwards forward because previously, Looking at um, G, so kind of going through my slide here, G is actually going to be what most people associate with balance testing or comprehensive balance testing. It's called a VNG. So it's the video nystagmography, and it's actually looking at, it's a sequence of tests that it's a battery that we're looking at eye movement, we're looking at um, the actual body positions, and we're putting all those puzzle pieces together to see how the system is processing input. A good battery. It's been used for a very long time, but it is absolutely a sliver of the pie when we're looking at the system comprehensively. So from, um, from an overall kind of global standpoint, we see a lot of patients that come in and say, you know, months and months and years and years ago, I had a VNG and it was normal and I was told to live with this and that, that's all we can do. Maybe that's all we could do 30 years ago, 50 years ago, maybe. It's not the case now. So having a normal VNG does not mean that your balance system is normal. It does not mean that the vestibular end organs are functioning in their full capacity. So now we have tests that look at all 10 end organs, and we know that there's different etiologies or causes of dizziness that will affect different parts of the ear. And so again, just thinking through what the anatomy is, if different parts of the ear are responsible for different sensations, a patient who comes in, you know, complaining of vertigo where they're spinning might not have the same diagnostic abnormalities that a patient who says that they feel like they're rocking and swaying all the time might have. And so using the right tests to figure out what's going on with the system is really, really important. So when we get in and we're looking at the vestibular um, kind of diagnostic story, we want to hear what patients are noticing, but we're kind of very quickly triaging the patient. What tests are they going to need to rule out the part of the ear we're suspecting is causing the problem or rule in the asymmetry or the weakness that we're suspecting? So it's really, really important to have uh, the tools at your disposal. Um, that's why comprehensive vestibular labs are very, very important. Um, dabbling in dizziness or clinics that, that kind of do it on the side where it's, it's sort of like a side hustle where they'll see you, they'll do it, but they don't comprehensively evaluate or have the right tools. Um, it might work for some patients. It just doesn't work for most. And so I'm going to go through the battery here, but the first test is a comprehensive rotational chair. Um, there's quite a few rotational chairs used worldwide. The, the rotational chair that we use clinically is um, it's called an eye portal. And the reason we really like this piece of equipment is because of the sophistication of the actual camera and then the actual frequencies and capability of, of movement of the chair. And so that's really important because the balance system is super complicated. It moves very slow and it moves very, very quick. And so whether we're working with professional athletes that have very, very quick reaction times and their system is, um, is, it has different norms than, than your average person, you know, walking down the street, it's important to be, be able to evaluate them at very high or super thresholds. Um, one of the other tests that we use clinically is going to be VEMP testing. And so a comprehensive clinic is going to have access to VEMP testing, which is going to be looking at specifically the otoliths or a part of the ear that's responsible for that gravitational pull and linear acceleration. The other pieces of the puzzle are going to be looking specifically at um, meneers or, or changes in the actual um, 
composition of the ear and this signal that's coming from different parts of the ear. So there's testing called an ECOG, and then there's additional testing called auditory brainstem response testing. So these need to be included in the vestibular lab's ability or the vestibular lab themselves needs to have access or that clinician needs to know where these tests are available so that if they are deemed necessary, that you're able to dig into them and, and really allow your physician and your clinicians that are working with you an idea um, very definitively of what the system is doing. Um, diagnostic testing as far as audiological testing is going to be referring to the actual hearing part of the ear. So looking in the ear itself, looking at the middle ear cavity itself, looking at how the actual nerve with regard to um, hearing and processing of that sound is occurring is important because of how the balance end organs and the, the auditory organs basically live in the, in the same space or same vicinity, neighborhood. Um, and then, so that piece of it is going to be an important piece of the puzzle. Going back to the balance, so the last couple pieces of the balance puzzle um, with regard to diagnostic testing are going to be computerized dynamic posturography, which we call, um, we tell our patients it's like the cliff notes of the balance testing. So it's looking at from a functional standpoint, how you're standing and then how your brain is is taking in the muscle input, the visual input, and then the signal coming from the ear. So those are really, really important pieces. And then the last one on here is, is a, a clinic favorite, um, just because it's pretty simple for patients to tolerate. Um, it's going to be uh, video head impulse testing. It's a really, really lightweight set of goggles, very, very tiny, very quick head movements. And we're actually taking calculations of the eye movement. And so um, a lot of clinics, this is, this is one of our newer pieces of technology for a lot of clinics, just because we're able to do a lot of the testing and evaluate the system when it's working without making patients feel, feel ill most of the time, um, which you might have heard with like the VNG um, during caloric testing where they're putting you know, the water or the air in your ears. So long story short, I know this was a long slide, but it's an important slide because what we see a lot of times is this piece of the puzzle just kind of like goes up in smoke. You know, you, you get a VNG or you go to an urgent care and you're kind of told, I, I don't know what it is, it's probably vertigo, good luck. You can't cut out this stage of it. And this stage of it is so comprehensive and needs to be very robust. And if it's not done with efficiency and certainty, patients are suffering for weeks, months, and years. So this piece is, this is my soapbox. I will spend a, a couple more seconds on this because if the clinicians, and, and again, there's different specialists all throughout the world. There's teams of physicians, there's teams of audiologists, and different clinicians that are doing these comprehensive tests. These are the, the lifeline for, for patients. And this is the most important thing because this piece of the puzzle tees up the actual treatment. What kind of treatment are you going to need? Is the ear involved or not? Or do you need to be seen by another specialist and pull in another group of specialists that are going to be able to help in that, that treatment plan? So these are some really cool pictures of the diagnostic tests. And so I think it's really important to understand how sophisticated a lot of these pieces of equipment are and how specific the actual calculations need to be. And so again, the eyes are actually the window to the vestibular system. And so a lot of the testing is done through cameras. So patients will be seated a majority of the time and moving uh, some of the time. And we're looking at the eye movements and looking how the eyes actually move under these, these camera lenses. And so this test kind of to the left of the screen is going to be very common for a lot of patients. This is the VNG testing where you're laying down and you're looking at dots and, you know, you're moving your head in different positions versus the middle is going to be rotational chair testing um, where you're kind of snuggled in. You know, we always tell patients this chair has a lot bigger bark than bite. It, it's not as scary as it looks. You, you're really tucked in and secured for a reason. So you're not shifting around or moving. Your body stays in one position as the chair rotates very slowly and very seamlessly. But we're taking eye recordings. We're looking at how the eye is actually moving. 
And so it's really important to, to look at the system, not only statically, where it's just laying there and resting, but also dynamically. What is it doing when it's working? Because if we're just looking at the system static, you know, where we're looking at, you know, like a VNG battery, that's not the real world. If you're moving around and you're saying you're having difficulty when you're riding in a car or you're going to get your kids from school walking down the hallways or you're on the field during football practice, that doesn't translate until you actually task the system and make it work. So that's really important to look at the system dynamically and then, you know, statically. Um, the top right screen is going to be the video head impulse testing. So again, the camera is a lot different. It's really tiny. The head movement's very rapid. It's very quick, but it's usually a patient favorite too because it's pretty simple. It's pretty seamless. The rest of the testing here is going to get into a few. So I'll go left to right again. So to the left, there are multiple computerized dynamic posturography platforms now. Um, this one is an older version that's used to basically visually challenge the system. And then you're on a force plate or like a moving um, floor. And there are advanced versions now that also integrate virtual reality to really get a good snapshot of how your system is processing and taking in visual information and then how that actually makes sense with how your body moves and sways. Um, the top one with a little button is actually looking at kind of subjective vertical upright and that is going to be a subjective test of how you perceive things to be in the environment. So again, it's looking at the otoliths or the part of the ear that's responsible for that gravitational pull. The bottom screen to the right is going to be the actual um, vent testing and additionally um, any type of electrophysio electrophysiological testing. So anytime we're using electrodes on you or anytime that we're actually trying to pick up frequencies coming from the system. Um, they're pretty simple to do. This one particularly is looking at the vent testing. So again, it's, it's sort of like getting a bad facial where you'll get scrubs, you'll get electrodes on, and then you basically are just going to rest and, and we're going to take the calculations from the system. The top right is just a really cool picture. We think it's pretty cool, but your eyes are going to be on the screen when we're doing a lot of the rotational chair testing. So we've got these huge kind of snapshots of what your eyeballs are doing on the screen and it's very very detailed and very specific it's taking tracings of your eye movements and then it's actually putting it into the software and making calculations in real time and so it's extremely calculated and again there shouldn't be any guesswork you either have a vestibulopathy or you do not um, the system is either functioning at thresholds that are um, um, normal or, or compared to normative data or not. Um, and again, this is not a general rule. This does not apply to every single person in every situation, but there is, there is a lot that goes into this that's, that's well beyond the BNG. So there's a lot that we can actually get from all of this data. And the, the way a lot of clinics work um, with regard to kind of the handoff of patients should pretty seamless. So patients where we see have the most difficulty are bounced in between different specialists and there's not this continuum of care. And so patients who are medically cleared on the front end receive diagnostic testing comprehensively in the middle and then are transitioned to therapeutic application that takes those thresholds from the diagnostic testing is where it all comes together. To skip one or to go in the reverse order is not going to work. Again, just getting, you know, handout exercises or just skipping to a rehabilitation program, it works for some, but for most patients, understanding what the right ear is doing, what the left ear is doing, what the etiology, the actual cause of this is, what the current functional application of the system is, and then moving from that point is where this all kind of gets strung together. So looking at all of this and going through all those tests and then sitting through all of the, the diagnostic testing, if necessary, um, should give us a, a really good snapshot of what's happening. So not every patient needs every test. And again, it could be very quick where the patient's coming in, they're going through repositioning maneuvers and 
you know, they move on with their lives, or it could be very comprehensive. And so here's kind of a rundown of, you know, a lot of different pieces of, of the vestibular puzzle. Um, you're going to get a lot on this today. And so I just wanted to give an overview because the physicians and the clinicians that are presenting on this, um, you're going to get some really good meat from the presentations. So the first one is going to be BPPV. So that is positional vertigo or benign positional vertigo. Um, the second one is going to be labyrinthitis or vestibular neuronitis chronic versus acute vestibulopathy, migraine-associated vertigo or vestibular migraine, visual vertigo or visual disturbance, mal de Barkmont syndrome, um, dizziness that can be age-related or imbalance, and even um, superior canal dehiscence syndrome or a paralymphatic fistula. So just a few, I'm going to pick kind of some of these top disorders and give you a little bit of an overview. And you're going to take a deep dive later in the actual um, day so that you can kind of understand what this looks like. But benign positional vertigo or BPPV, you've probably heard before. Um, it's been described as rocks in your head or crystals. And the long and short of it is that there's literally rocks in your head. Um, we all have them. You want them. They're supposed to be there, but they're not supposed to move out of the position they're designed to live in. And so when they come out of the position they're supposed to be in, they cause a very, very intense but brief bout of vertigo. So it's like a true spinning sensation. It's last usually less than a minute so usually it's going to be seconds up to a minute and then the symptoms stop and so literally the symptoms stop when that little calcium deposit or the rock or the the actual crystal moves back to kind of a resting position so I'm not going to get too into this but you're going to get a whole talk on this today that's that's extremely interesting this type of vertigo sort of is like a like a wave a magic wand and goes away kind of vertigo for most patients. So upwards of, you know, 85% 85, 85 of patients will get a treatment or two and move on with their lives. Um, so it is a pretty simple um, treatment for a lot of patients. And same diagnostically, it's pretty easy to see in patients. The eyes move a really funny way. So you can see on the schematic, they don't just move side to side or up and down. Um, if you're dealing with the back canal, so the, the bottom canal is called the posterior canal, um, the eyes torque. They kind of move in this really funny torsional fashion. So for us, what we're looking at is nystagmus. We're looking at eye movement. Um, all of our testing is done under goggles. It's really important for our clinic and for a lot of clinics worldwide to use goggles because we can figure out which canal, right or left, up or down, or even the side canal involvement. Um, and then it helps us with the treatment too. The fun fact that I wanted to put on here is that residual symptoms after BPPV can actually last for months. And so we're going to have a, a, a pretty interesting talk on this later. Um, but it wouldn't be the spinning that's happening any longer for patients. It would be um, any imbalance, unsteadiness, disequilibrium that they still are having after the treatment of the spinning. So the other um, one that we're going to kind of touch on is going to be vestibular neuronitis or labyrinthitis. So the main difference with this is really going to be, is the hearing affected or not? And so with this, a virus basically enters the system. And with labyrinthitis, you're going to have a change in hearing and a change in balance. And so having a comprehensive audiological eval or looking at the hearing is going to be important. Um, because sometimes patients are coming in and they say, you know, it feels really full in my ear or it feels like maybe the right ear hears differently than the other. Taking the guesswork out, is it fullness in the ear or is it change in hearing of the ear is going to be really important. Um, the, the treatment for this is really going to be medical management and it's very important that the physician is involved with regard to medical management of the patient initially. In most patients, you know, a couple of weeks, they move on with their lives and they're fine. Um, sometimes they will need medical intervention that's going to include vestibular rehabilitation therapy in addition to any type of steroid or antibiotic, antibiotic um, regimen that the physician is going to recommend. Um, but for the most part, most patients will get it. It's pretty nasty for, you know, a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And then, you know, they're completely resolved. Um, 
little fun fact on here again is going to be cold and flu season is actually the busiest time of the year for labyrinthitis and then vestibular neuronitis. So Meniere's disease is going to be another one that I just wanted to touch on. Again, you will get a talk, um, but some of the hallmarks of this I think are really important to understand because there are so many patients that will say, well, I, I have vertigo. Okay, what does that mean? Or I have Meniere's disease. I was told I have Meniere's disease. And so when you go in and actually try to understand what that means, and we go through, okay, do you have pretty intense bouts or drop attacks of vertigo that are lasting for hours at a time? Do you have roaring tinnitus where your ears really just kind of sound like somebody turned on a fan or it sounds like, um, you know, just a, a whole jet engine kind of turns on? Um, do you have fullness in your ear or ears where you feel like it's literally full of liquid or fluid or you need to pop your ears? And do you have fluctuating hearing loss? Is your hearing coming and going? Is it getting worse over time? So those all need to come together. Um, being evaluated by a neurootologist um, or, you know, even a physician in general that's going to be able to just allow you to kind of say what your symptoms are and kind of go through the, the boxes. Is it the vertigo? Is it the tinnitus? Is it the fullness in the ear? And is it the actual fluctuations that are documented over time of hearing loss? Um, if it's one or none of those, it's not Meniere's. And so that's why it's important, again, to get the diagnostic testing. Um, the ECOG testing and the audiological testing are very important for this patient population. So another fun fact is going to be Vincent Van Gogh actually suffered from Meniere's. So migraine-associated vertigo is going to be, this is such an interesting um, very, very interesting etiology, and there's so much work going into this right now with regard to research and and treatment and how these patients are managed. So migraine in general is one of the most debilitating chronic conditions in the United States, and that's pretty similar throughout the world. And so what I think is one of the most important things to really note is that 40% of patients with migraine will have a vestibular component affecting their balance or dizziness. So that's really important to understand because a lot of times when you say migraine, you know, sometimes patients will say, well, I don't have headaches. I don't have headaches. Understanding what migraine associated vertigo is and what it's not is very important. And so again, you're going to get a very comprehensive talk on this, but this is a very exciting piece of the puzzle as far as research and, and treatment that's coming out because patients are starting to really understand um, what this management looks like and what it looks like to be managed medically from a medication standpoint, from a supplement standpoint, but also dietary, what it looks like to be managed, you know, from, from a trigger identification and working with dietitians that are able to really go through and really make sense of anti-inflammatory diets and what specifically the triggers are to that specific person, um, which is really important. So the diagnostic criteria, criteria um, for migraine patients is, you know, going to be a family history. Most patients have motion intolerance, even in childhood. Um, they're presenting with vestibular symptoms. And there's a whole kind of checklist or tick list um, that's followed, you know, when you're in front of the right specialist who understands what migraine associated vertigo is. And if they don't understand it, getting you to the right specialist that's able to really go through and, and manage that condition for you. So with all of that being said, you know, you'll hear, or maybe even you just want, you just want a magic pill. You want this to go away. You want it to be better. You just want things to, to kind of go back to how they were before this all started. And so initially, especially in the States, when patients are going into urgent care, they are screened for, for stroke, making sure that they don't have any stroke. Usually they're getting imaging that's going to include a CT scan or an MRI. And then if that's fine, they're kind of sent on their way. And so you know, not to keep things, you know, too global, but for the most part, making sure that they're not anything medically that needs to be, you know, evaluated quickly or anything that's life-threatening. And if it's not, 
you know, here, take a meclizine or take an antivert or take something that's going to make the symptoms go away temporarily. And so what works very, very short term and, and the use and the design of a lot of these um, vestibular suppressants is short term. You're supposed to use them short term. They're supposed to help short term. And so they're not meant to be used for weeks and weeks, months and months, years and years, decades and decades. It doesn't work that way. Your system doesn't, it, it doesn't happen with regard to recovery that way. So the brain can't fix what it can't see. It can't habituate. It can't adapt. It can't compensate unless it's getting and receiving the error signal itself. And so if you're taking the meclizine or you're taking the anti-motion um, or anti, uh, basically a vestibular suppressant, an anti-vestibular medication, it's like a spring. You're pressing down on a spring long term. And so one of the biggest things, once that diagnostic testing is done, is to get the rehabilitation going. And so that's really working with the right specialist, whether it's the vestibular specialist, you know, that, that really knows how to do this or finding the vestibular specialist in your area that knows how to do this is going to be very, very important. There's going to be a talk later on the time frame of all of this and why that is so important. You don't want to sit around for weeks and see what happens. You don't want to sit around for months, let alone years. Your system needs to be just kind of guided and moved in the right direction so that the, the rehabilitation process can happen. So we've got standard vestibular rehab therapy, just the one-on-one of all of this, is going to be kind of tried and true. It's very, very effective. It works a majority of the time for patients, as long as it's done consistently. And it's usually ran through very three kind of um, systematic ways of introducing the exercises. So it's going to be adaptation exercises that are designed to address the symptoms of gaze instability and with head movement. And the point is really helping your brain adapt to seeking this, these um, visual targets within you know, the real world and helping your brain starting to integrate those processes again properly. The next sequence is gonna be substitution exercises. So they're really designed to address symptoms that where the impairment of the balance or um, the actual system itself is no longer capable of using all cylinders. And so it's really helping the brain seek new input and use new input. So it's either going to be, you know, reweighting the system from a visual standpoint or a sensory standpoint because you're not getting what you need from a stimulation standpoint coming from the ear. And then the third one on here is going to be habituation exercises. So they're really designed to provide temporary symptoms. So you will be triggered when you do these exercises. So again, trying to provide like a little mirror to the balance system. So helping the brain see when it needs to fix and see what it needs to actually work through and process. Because the brain is very plastic. It wants to fix itself. It's just these sequence of exercises ramp up just enough again, based on the thresholds that you were able to tolerate or were able to tolerate initially, and then building from that, sort of like um, like if you're going up a stairwell, you know, you, you want to build and then you want to plateau, build, plateau, build, plateau. What happens a lot of times is if you are, you know, playing Dr. Google and you go online and you just find a sequence of adaptation exercises or substitution or habituation exercises, and you haven't been evaluated by a vestibular therapist and you're not working with a therapist to go through and really basically know when to gas and break the system. When do you push the system so that it's growing, it's learning, it's changing, it's getting stronger? And then when do you gas it where you need to pause, relax, and allow the system time to rest and recover? And so working with the specialist, it, it's really, really important because that's the end game, making this efficient and effective so that you can move through as quickly as possible. So here's just a couple quick little snapshots of patients who are performing those substitution, adaptation, and habituation exercises. Pretty simple. You'll find them. There's all kinds of books and all kinds of resources. But from um, a physical therapy standpoint, from an occupational therapy standpoint, and a lot of other specialties that are working in this wheelhouse, they're, they're pretty classic and pretty standard exercises. When you move from one to the next, it's based on a lot of your subjective input and then objective data, which you're able to tolerate. 
there are a lot of clinics that are continually monitoring. So it's important, you know, as you move from one system um, or one sequence of exercises to the next, to the next, what is the, the graduation look like? Does it mean that you're scoring lower on um, certain questionnaires, uh, the DHI, for example? Are you starting to present with um, different input with regard to your SVV or SVH input? Are you scoring higher on your computerized dynamic postureography? Um, what does this look like as the process is, is moved through? And each specialty um, will be using different um, kind of rubrics to, to move patients through through with regard to next steps and, and continued improvement. So the next one on here is really going to be how technology is moving a lot of this forward. So instead of, you know, holding a, a card in front of you or putting your thumb in front of you, which is a, a very viable and, and a very helpful option, um, technology is advancing significantly. So whether it's clinically or with home use, um, patients are using a lot of optokinetic stimulation, they're using a lot of virtual reality application. There are a lot of companies now that we're using that are actually specific for vestibular rehabilitation. And so it doesn't mean that we're putting VR goggles on and helping you, you know, get used to riding a roller coaster and, and trying to make you sick while you're watching, you know, videos through the VR. That's not it. It's it's literally providing the bridge between where your system is functioning and what your system is functioning and the, the capability of your, your system's functionality and where it needs to be in the real world. So the real world has tons of sizes and shapes and colors and thresholds and lights that you're constantly being exposed to. But through a lot of the virtual reality rehabilitation programs, your system in the VR is very slowly and very systematically being exposed to a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit more each time so that you're actually able to bridge the gap between where you were, where you need to be. And, and the VR does a, a pretty phenomenal job of, of, of getting patients there. Um, and then a lot of the rotational chairs and a lot of the postureography equipments are being used um, therapeutically too. So patients are not only dynamically, you know, in there with their movement or in there during the diagnostic testing, but then again, being um, worked through and helping the system habituate along the way so that those thresholds are increased and, and they're getting improvement um, overall session over session. The home applications should duplicate a lot of what's happening clinically. Um, this is just a couple quick little snapshots of some of the virtual reality that we've created in our clinic. It should be fun and simple and crisp and clear. And so a lot of it is done through optokinetic stimulation. Some of it is done through a lot of visual desensitization. And a lot of it's done through gaze stabilization, the simple stuff that we're doing even with thumb movement. So it's really important for patients to understand that this is a process and there's a very systematic way that this process and the brain compensates, um, which is important. So kind of the take home is going to be that dizziness affects all of us at, at a certain point, whether it's directly or indirectly through a family member or friend. And so it doesn't matter how rich and famous you are. It doesn't matter kind of how high level your functioning is or how low level or, or slow or kind of sedentary your, your overall daily tasks might be, that this is something that is extremely debil debilitating when it hits, but there are science and, and solutions that are at the ready. And so that's really what we're excited to present today and kind of move through today. One of the most important things, just a quick little synopsis, you're going to get more of this, but it's going to be how on earth do you find a vestibular specialist that is going to know that this is more than the VNG? This is not, you know, circa 1970. This is more than the VNG, and we are able to test more of the system in a very comprehensive and very specific way. So you want to be working with a specialist that specializes in dizziness. And so if the first stop is working with your primary care doctor who does not specialize in dizziness, asking him or her who does, who in the area does specialize in dizziness. And it should be a day in and a day out dizziness specialty. 
It shouldn't be dabbling. And again, it, it really shouldn't be a side hustle. It shouldn't be something that you do because you kind of remember how to do it, or maybe, you know, you want to get into it. You got to dive into this because there's too much at stake with regard to time frame and, and loss of quality of, of overall just life. So it's also important to have advanced equipment to really be able to evaluate the entire balance system. Um, you know, using things that, that we did, again, kind of going back to that 1970, you know, time frame, we've come light years ahead. There's, there's no reason why we're not able to advance and look at the system comprehensively. And if the clinic that you're at does not have capability to do it, who in your area does? Because there are very comprehensive balance clinics throughout the world that have a passion for this and a, and a real knowledge and a real investment, not only financially, but in the overall outcome of patients. So finding those people who not only put the money down to make this right from, from an actual you know, diagnostic equipment standpoint, but understanding how you leverage that for patients and how you help the overall outcome, which is getting people better. Working in a team is huge. Not having a one-stop shop where, you know, oh, if it's not the ear, I don't know, you know, good luck with that. It, who, who are the specialists in the area? If there is some neurological concerns, where is the neurologist that you're going to be working with or who are they? If there's a cardiologist that needs to be involved, if there's a dietitian that needs to be involved, an occupational therapist, your physical therapist, all of this needs to go together and it would be very, very unlikely. I've never heard of one person that can do all of that. So it's really understanding, is your specialist, do they work um, with part of a team? And if they are collaborating within their community to make sure that the patient is getting what they need from beginning to end. Another important thing, and you have to do a little bit of digging on this usually, but really understanding, even when you're speaking with a lot of the support staff, you know, is that professional active in associations that are continuing their knowledge and are they current in, you know, their research and treatment? And I think it's a, it's a right as a patient to understand, you know, are they staying current? Because technology changes very rapidly and the treatment protocols and processes change very rapidly. So just to claim that you're in this space or just to, you know, work with patients that you think you can help with dizziness, isn't best practices for the patient or for the professionals who are really, you know, kind of helping gear and steer all of, you know, the, this funnel towards, towards one direction. And so the other thing and the final thing is going to be explaining your treatment options and how it works. There's a lot of different ways that this can be applied. Not all patients like virtual reality. Not all patients like, you know, some movements that they're going to be doing for gaze stabilization, you know, based on a home Pronounce. Not all patients want to follow up with a dietitian. Not all patients want to follow up with, you know, lifestyle modifications or, or going through what potential triggers could be. So understanding what the recommendations are and then what is going to be applied or be applicable to your specific situation. So the take home is really going to be if you're just looking at a small picture, right? So the picture to the left is going to be a little tiny little snapshot. If, if I'm just looking at the VNG testing from a diagnostic standpoint, or I'm just talking to the patient for three to five minutes about their dizziness and trying to really quickly understand what's happening, am I getting a full picture? And so I don't know, I would have guessed maybe it's like a little boy's haircut or like a, a top of a, a little boy's head. With a long and short, if, if you take a step back and you start to look at the big picture, there can be so much more involved. And so not just doing the VNG, not just doing a quick get up and go, you have to look at the patient comprehensively to make sense of all of this. So with that being said, I am really excited to kick this off. I think it's going to be a very informative day. Um, you can always reach out to us if you have any questions. Our info's at the bottom. Our email is info at dizzyandvertigo.com or on our website at dizzyandvertigo.com. And wonderful, wonderful. Are we live, Q? You're live. Awesome. Well, it looks like Amy, you've joined us. Brooke might be coming back from uh, 
from there. Amy, if you want to field one of these questions that we're taking, um, uh, Laura asks, are there any barriers to treating vertigo when a woman is pregnant? Yeah, so um, obviously when a woman is pregnant, um, you always want to be extra careful with any kind of treatment and management that you provide. However, as long as you you very kind of, uh, it's a two-way street. So it's not it's not a clinician delivering the treatment program and that the, that's the end of it. It's very important that the um, patient and the clinician work together to make sure that any kind of steps forward or any kind of um, rehab is not, too much and doesn't overwhelm the system. Um, I think it's also important that if there is a pregnancy involved, that there is so, some sort of medical input as well, just to kind of oversee it as a whole, keep an eye on the cardiovascular system and any other, other complications that may arise because of the pregnancy and not necessarily because of the dizziness. Gotcha, makes sense. Um, Brooke, uh, here's a question from uh, Debbie, who said her telltale vertigo symptoms have changed from the spinning sensation to a more bouncing spin sensation. Is it common for vertigo symptoms to change over time? Yeah, Debbie, thanks for the question. So I think one of the biggest things that we want to get into is making sure that we're not specifically answering specific medical advice, but that understanding what your dizziness or the etiology of your dizziness is initially. Um, again, if we go back to those 10 end organs in the ear, the, the spinning sensation that can originate from a certain type of dizziness versus, you know, kind of a rocking or a bobbing sensation, um, they, they, they typically come from different parts of the ear. And so working with the right specialist to understand what the cause or that etiology is, is really important. And then as the system progresses and the system strengthens and, and starts to compensate, um, you know, you can start to feel different sensations along the way. Makes sense. Uh, there's a question here from Monica who was wondering, how would you suggest tracking and identifying one's own triggers over time? And then once you know those triggers, I guess, what's the best course of action? Is it avoiding them or is it, you know, sensitizing yourself to them? So I think, you know, obviously tracking them is really important because you can kind of feel from day to day, you know, it, it can be pretty overwhelming. So we always ask, you know, to track your symptoms so that we understand if there are stress triggers, if there are fatigue triggers, if there's food triggers, hormonal triggers, there's a lot that can go into it. And so working with the right specialist to identify those patterns um, is very important. And then moving through with your treatment specialist um, that can be, you know, become a part of the actual um, treatment protocol. Uh, moving forward. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, this one comes from April. She, you know, this can be kind of a, a more generalized one, but for people who have multiple vertigo diagnoses, say vestibular neuritis and vestibular migraine, how do you, what's the process for distinguishing what's causing which issues if they have multiple diagnoses? So Amy, do you want that one or do you want? No, I can go. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I think that's where the really comprehensive testing becomes very important. So if if you've been given multiple diagnoses and you maybe haven't had the comprehensive, so if you've just had the NG, that's really important for you to have the, as many investigations that are available to you um, after that once there's a bit more of a bigger picture of what's going on I suppose dealing with the, the your symptoms uh, is kind of how we would build the treatment so for example you might have patients with um, I don't know a, per a peripheral vestibulopathy that have a visual component to their symptoms or you might have patient B who has the same vestibulopathy but they have no visual component to their symptoms so then that's when you're dealing with the symptoms and working with them and, and, and making it very patient specific. Makes sense. Um... Chris was wondering when uh, vertigo is gone, how can you tell if there's still damage to your vestibular system? So, so after treatment has been finished, how do you know if there's still damage? 
Yeah, I think that goes back to kind of the objective and subjective pieces. So we always look subjectively. There's a lot of questionnaires that are used um, going back and making sure that, that subjectively that you're feeling better, that the questionnaires are, they should pull within um, normative range. But there's quite a few different studies right now showing that some of the testing will actually show normative data when you go back and look at it after the fact. So um, working with the right clinician to understand, you know, what was initially abnormal from an objective standpoint uh, during the testing. And then if you're interested, a lot of clinicians will do comparative testing. So more of like a graduation when you're done with your treatment, um, going back and comparing apples to apples and kind of bookending um, the treatment process. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, one more question here, and then we'll take a, a brief break before the next one. Um, Patricia is wondering, and not sure if there are any answers to this, but has anyone done any research into dry needling sessions for stopping chronic symptoms of vestibular migraine? I mean, maybe we could have a little publication search during the break and answer mm -hmm. that one after the break. How about that? That's a great, great idea, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Q, you want to put us into a break and then we'll uh, reconvene for the next one, which is going to be BPPV. Thanks, guys. Yep.
Dr. Brooke Pierce. Hi, guys. And, a and Amy. Hello. We are now back. It is Vertigo Day. Yay. <laughs> we, how was your break? Did you enjoy your break? It was great. We have a few <laughs> questions. Uh, we have a few questions in the, the comments, uh, and then we'll get into Professor Alfargal's presentation. The mm -hmm. first question that I thought was pretty fascinating was talking about the diets for uh, people that are diagnosed with vertigo and dizziness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What uh, what are there any particular dietary recommendations for people that want to be vegetarian or that are vegetarians and also have vertigo or dizziness? Question for either one of you all. So I'll jump in and I know Amy's got a wealth of knowledge on this. So I think that um, kind of chatting when the physicians kind of pop on in just a few, but making sure that you're working with your physician and or a registered dietitian, um, because there's there's quite a few different things that, you know, being deficient in certain vitamins can cause dizziness, whether it's B12 or vitamin D. So making sure that, you know, you're working with your physician with an accurate blood panel and then working within the, the parameters with whatever dietary kind of limitations or restrictions that you have is really important. Got it. Now, Professor Alfergal, I'm going to add him to the stream really quick. There he is. Hi. Hi. Hello. All right. Now, for the people that don't know, he's going to be talking about BPPV. And just to give a quick intro, 30 second intro about Professor Alfergal uh, and where he comes from, Amy, would you mind taking it over there? Of course, I'd be honoured. So, um, Professor Alfagal is Mohammed is um, from Jeddah, and he has been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years, disseminating information to uh, clinicians all across Egypt, uh, Middle East. That's how it started, but it has now grown into this huge network where he has been sharing his knowledge. Um, He's trained all around the world. He's trained here in the UK. He's trained with people in the US. So he is just a wealth of knowledge. And thank you for joining us today. Professor Alfred Gall, can you hear us? I don't. He's getting ready. He's getting, He's getting ready. He's getting ready. Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. All right. Well, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump into the presentation. I'm going to start it up on screen. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that has any questions, you can email us. We'll throw our email up and you can also leave them in the chat on YouTube. And with that, we'll be back momentarily. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you about uh, benign paroxysmal position and vertigo. Uh, before I proceed with my slides, I want to uh, introduce myself to you. My name is Alfar Al Muhammad. I am Egyptian, but I do live and work in Saudi Arabia. I am a medical doctor and at the same time a clinical audiologist. I got a doctor of audiology degree from the United States. And I am currently working as a director of hearing and balance clinic at King Abdulaziz Medical City, Jeddah. And at the same time, I am uh, currently the president of the Arab Balance Society. So this is in the left where I work. This is the King Abdulaziz Medical City in Jeddah. This is on the right, the logo of the Arab Balance Society. So, BBV, uh, it points to benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It is the most common cause of vertigo and dizziness, absolutely in all over the world. Uh, its light prevalence of BBV was reported to be 3.2 in females and 1.6% in males and 2.4% overall. Other names given to this condition are inner ear stones, uh, rocks, crystals, or particles, and sometimes it's called the high shelf vertigo. 
So in this diagram, uh, it shows the structure of the human ear. The human ear composed of three main parts. Uh, the external ear, it's composed of the auricle and the external auditory meters. And the middle ear, which composed of the eardrum or the tympanic membrane and a space for usually normally filled with air and it contains small, three small tiny ossicles and the ostation tube. Then the third part is, the, is called the inner ear. It's uh, composed of two main sections. One is called the cochlea, which is responsible for hearing, and the other section is called the vestibular system, which is responsible for the palate. In the next, uh, in this image, uh, it better uh, gives, uh, um, explains the vestibular system. So as you see here, the vestibular system is composed of three semicircular canals. They are uh, pony canals, includes membranous canals, which is filled with fluid um, named indolent. And this is the superior semicircular canal. This is the posterior semicircular canal. And this is the horizontal or lateral semicircular canal. They are connected or end to another organ. It's called the utricle. Uh, it's a part of the otolith organs, which are the utricle and secure. This one is called the secure. But the three semicircular canals, they are open to the utricle. Um, and uh, the semicircular canals, they are responsible to uh, feel the head movements, angular head movements and uh, uh, through their connection to the extraocular eye muscles, they uh, keep the visual image stable while we are moving our heads. So during walking, running, still we can see clearly, no blurring, no solopsia. And uh, the afferent fibers from the semicircular canals, they are connected to uh, two divisions of the vestibular nerve, the superior vestibular nerve, and the inferior vestibular nerve. Both of them combine to uh, make the uh, vestibular nerve. The vestibular nerve combine with the auditory nerve coming from the cochlear uh, nerve fibers to make the eighth nerve, which goes to the uh, brain. So uh, here another view to uh, explain the inside structure of the semicircular canals and the otolith organ. So if you see here, if we take a transverse section in one of the semicircular canals, we will see what's called the ampulla. And this is the ampulla of the semicircular canals. It's like a gelatinous mass. It contains a hair cells arranged in a special, special way. And it's floating uh, inside the endolymph fluid within the semicircular canal. So with any kind of heat movements, uh, uh, one or more of the semicircular canals, they got uh, stimulated by the fluid movement inside them. Uh, and this fluid movement makes them to send signals to the vestibular nerve and to the brain. And the brain analyzes these signals and uh, it percepts the head movements and it does the proper adjustments of the eye position uh, to ensure a clear vision. And uh, uh, if we take a cut section in the otolith organ, especially the utricle, we can see here that it's composed of a similar uh, structures, but it's called the macula. And it's, there is some hair cells arranged in a special, special way. And uh, over the hair cells, um, there is a cilia. And this cilia embedded in a gelatinous membrane, which contains uh, otoconia. So this autoconia is a tiny particles composed of uh, calcium carbonate, and it helps in the sense of gravity. It helps in the sense of linear movement, like movement back, forth, um, left to right, uh, up and down. So this is the autoconia is a, a normal uh, part of the vestibular system, but it should be placed and present in the uterine. So whenever it detaches from the utricle and migrated to one of the semicircular canals, 
that started to create some problems. And this is the main pathophysiology of the benign paroxysmal positional therapy. And this is a, an image to explain to you that is, uh, each semicircular canal is connected to a pair of extraocular eye muscles uh, on the same side of the semicircular canal and on the contralateral side. So with this connection, each semicircular canal, when it gets stimulated or inhibited, it just it creates some sort of eye movements, which we call it nystagmus. And uh, we cannot see the inner ear uh, by otoscopic examination. We cannot see what's going on. But it's easy to see the effect of a stimulation or inhibition of the semicircular canal by just looking into the eye. So each semicircular canal, when it gets excited or it gets inhibited for a reason or another, it creates a specific eye movements uh, more or less in the plane of the semicircular canal. So like, for example, the posterior semicircular canal, when it gets stimulated by, for example, presence of otoconia, it creates upward torsional nystagmus. So the clinician, by uh, watching this kind of nystagmus, uh, he can recognize where is the otoconia, which canal is affected, and which side is affected. So no wonder that is testing for the BBV is mainly by looking into the eyes of the affected subject. Uh, this is to make it uh, more clear uh, what's happening uh, during the BBV. So this otoconia, which is normally should present only in the otitis organs and the secure and in the utricle to do its function. Uh, for feeling the gravity and linear acceleration, it sometimes, for some reasons, get detached. And when it get detached, it just uh, migrate into one or more of the semicircular canals. Most commonly, it migrate to the posterior canal because it is the most dependent. When we lie down, it's the most inferior, most dependent. So by the effect of gravity, this uh, autoconia get precipitated mainly in the posterior canal. But uh, also it sometimes migrate into the horizontal or lateral canal. But very rarely it's present or migrates to the anterior canal. And this is simply because the anterior canal is in a higher position and its posterior wall is in a direct continuity with, with the utricle. So even if it happens that some autoconia migrated to the anterior canal, uh, it will self-clear in no time. So that's why it's the most rare type of the semicircular. Uh, it's uh, the most rare type of PBV is to affect the anterior canal. So the most common, it affects the posterior canal. Second common is the horizontal canal. And the least common is the anterior canal. This is a microscopic or electromicroscopy image of the autoconia. So it looks like a very small rocks. Sometimes they get amalgamated and they make like a mass. So it causes more symptoms. When they get dispersed all over the canal, the symptoms become less intense. So that's why it's a nat natural history that it, uh, it subsides spontaneously over a few weeks. Uh, the autoconia can be placed in different locations in the semicircular canal. This is very obvious in the horizontal canal. There is different possibilities. Is the autoconia can be in the anterior arm or can be in the posterior arm, can be attached to the cobula of the semicircular canal, and rarely it can be on the auricular side. So the clinician, by careful examination of the eye, uh, of the nystagmus uh, provoked by different positions, uh, he can know where is the autoconia most likely located. So why do PBV occur? Uh, it could occur for no unknown reasons, of uh, unknown cause, idiopathic. And it could occur secondary to another ear disease, such as Meniere's disease, 
vestibular neuronitis, autosclerosis, or after your surgery. Uh, Post-traumatic, uh, if BBV developed 24 to 72 hours following hit trauma, we call, we name it post-traumatic BBV. And the hit trauma, even the minor ones, such as domestic injuries, school injuries, dental care can trigger autoconial detachment, leading to the development of BBV. Types of BBV, the best classification of types of BBV is based on the affected canal. So as I mentioned before, posterior canal is the most commonly affected canal because it is the most dependent canal. So the gravity uh, pushes the autoconia to be precipitated in the posterior canal. That's why it constitutes 75 to 80% of the cases. And interestingly, it's most likely occurs on the site uh, where the subject is sleep on. So if the subject used to sleep on the right side, so it's uh, uh, there is more opportunity that the BBV develop in the right side. And this is, makes sense because uh, lying on the right side um, uh, most of the time will give opportunities that the gravity precipitates the autoconia in this side. And uh, it's known that most of the people all over the world, they sleep on the right side. So it's more common in the right side. Horizontal or lateral canal uh, BBV, it constitutes 15 to 25% of the cases. And the anterior canal, it's the most, um, it is the least common type of BV. It's only reported in one to two uh, percent. Some more complex forms of BBV can occur like the multiple canal BBV, either due to bilateral affection of the posterior canal or due to mixed canal affection, it constitutes 6 to 20% of the cases, and it's most common in post traumatic cases. Diagnosis of BBV, it depends on the history, it's very important. Examination, clinical examination or office or bedside uh, testing, then investigations. Fortunately, investigations uh, are only required for atypical or resistant cases of BBV. But the typical uh, cases of BBV can be completely and accurately diagnosed with a bit side uh, testing. So what are the risk factors of BBV? It's known that it's seven times more common in elderly people. So above 65 uh, years of age, uh, the incidence of BBV increases by seven times. It's known to be more common in females. And this is maybe because of uh, the uh, probability to have osteoporosis are more common in uh, females. Also migraine, uh, which is another risk factor of BBV is more common in females. Most common to occur at the sleeping site uh, that's why it's more common in the right side, as I explained previously. It is three times more common in migraine patients than the general population. Osteoporosis and vitamin D deficiency are risk factors for BBV. As we mentioned before, uh, the autoconia is composed of calcium carbonate. So it's in some way related to calcium metabolism. And of course, it would be related to vitamin D which takes, uh, plays a major role in the calcium metabolism. Uh, prolonged bed rest, like after surgery, major surgery, or uh, in cases where there is restriction of lying down to one side, or uh, because of uh, like a fracture, because of like a pain, uh, like some patients, they put a pacemaker on the left side, so they usually cannot lie on the left side uh, because of hemiplegia or something. So people who um, um, are prevented or restricted from lying to one side and they have to uh, sleep or lie on only on one side, they are at risk of uh, to develop BBV in that side. And also uh, uh, people who have been in a long term bed rest like after uh, pelvic fracture or major uh, surgery, they also at risk to develop BBV. Conditions which cause inner ischemia, 
uh, like uh, diminished cerebral perfusion or vertebral basal insufficiency. The inner ear takes its blood supply from the posterior circulation of the brain. So when this uh, blood flow to the posterior part of the brain got compromised for any reason, uh, definitely the inner ear will be affected and uh, this effect can lead to detachment of the autoconia from the esophagus. And of course, there is uh, other risk factors, but they are uh, less common. History and symptoms. Usually, PBV presented by a position or head movement induced intense vertigo, lasting for less than a minute in most of the cases. It might be associated with nausea, vomiting, and sweating. When the lateral canal or horizontal canal BBV is involved, subjects may complain of mild unsteadiness during walking. Patients sometimes become stressed, anxious, and panic. So, in this slide, I'm sharing with you the five positional items from the Dizziness Handicap Inventory published by Jacobson and Newman in 1990. And in our clinical practice, we use these five questions to screen the general population for PBV. So uh, the five questions uh, are all related to the uh, positional dizziness or uh, uh, positional symptoms. So uh, the first question is, does looking up increase your dizziness or your problem? That's why it was uh, called high shelf vertigo, because sometimes the, the symptoms occur when the subject tries to pick an item from a high shelf. So does looking up increase your problem? Do quick movements of your head increase your dizziness or problem? Does turning over in bed increase your problem? Does quick movement of your head increase uh, your problem? Does bending over increase your uh, symptoms or your uh, problem? So those five questions, they could be used uh, to screen for the PPV. So if uh, some of them, uh, they have been positive, or the subject answer, they, they do experience uh, dizziness or vertigo in any one of these situations, so that means they are most likely have DBT. So uh, we can confirm or diagnose the presence of PBV by uh, what's called a Dix-Holpike test. This test was published by <coughs> Margaret Dix and Charles Holpike a long time ago, and it's mainly intended to test for the posterior canal PBV. Uh, and the test uh, is to turn the head uh, 45 degrees to the side, then uh, briskly bring the head in the supine position uh, 30 degrees uh, from the horizontal uh, line or like 30 degree extension of the head. So in this position, the posterior sinus canal become vertical relative to the gravity line. And this is well, uh, let the autoconia within the posterior semicircular canal move uh, with the gravity, and it starts to produce the typical or characteristic vertigo and nystagmus. During the testing, it's always preferred to use infra video Google tool to um, record the eye movements and display it into a screen or a monitor with the use of video goggles. But some clinicians, they just do it without uh, goggles. But it's recommended to uh, examine for BBB with the use of infra video goggles. So when the head becomes in the uh, 45 degree to the side and 30 degree extension, in this uh, position, the semicircular canal becomes perpendicular to the gravity, and if it contains autoconia, the gravity uh, lets the autoconia move within the endolymph of the posterior semicircular canal until it reaches this neutral point. 
Uh, during that period of movement until it settles, uh, this movement of the endolymph fluid because uh, of the effect of movement of the autoconia, it leads to excitation of the posterior semicircular canal. This excitation leads to uh, the generation of upbeating torsional nystagmus, which is the typical of posterior canal baby. And it usually lasts just for less than uh, one minute. Uh, once the autoconia uh, get rest in the new position, the symptoms stop and the nystagmus stop. So uh, I put here some videos just to, to uh, show you what the clinician would see uh, when there is a positive case for PBV of the posterior canal. So let's see to run the first video. So this is in the right dexual bike. As you see here, there is upbeating and the torsional nystagmus. That's um, uh, abnormal movement of the eyes of the patient. As you see, it's, 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 it's a torsional movement. That's what makes the patient feel the room is spinning or the bed is spinning. Then just in like a 30 seconds, sometimes it stop and the symptoms disappear and then stigmas disappear. Each semicircular canal um, BBV generates, generates a specific type of nystagmus. So the video you just saw, it is uh, for a posterior canal BBV. But when uh, the horizontal canal got affected, it usually generate a, generates a horizontal nystagmus. So as you see here, it's a right beating nystagmus. But interestingly, regarding the horizontal canal BBV, it usually generates a nystagmus on the right side and on the left side. So we call it bidirectional, bipositional nystagmus. Uh, it's of two types. It can be geotropic or abogeotropic, but simply there is uh, a two phases of nystagmus. When you turn the subject's head to the right, it generates uh, right beating or left beating nystagmus. When you bring the head into the opposite side, the nystagmus reverses. So it's either left or right. So when the eyes beat, uh, the nystagmus is directed towards the ground, we call it geotropic, and uh, when it um, beats uh, far away from the ground, we call it abogeotropic. So uh, the clinician always look for the nystagmus and analyze it to determine which canal is affected, which side is affected, and what is the uh, type or subtype of BBV is present especially for the horizontal canal. Is it geotropic type or abogeotropic type? So if we uh, get a positive case of BBV posterior canal with a typical nystagmus, with a latency of few seconds, with a transit repeating torsional nystagmus lasting less than one minute, uh, with the associated feeling of a spinning, uh, usually that's uh, enough to diagnose comfortably benign paroxysmal positional vertigo of the posterior canal. So uh, we can immediately proceed for the treatment. Uh, the most well-known maneuver to uh, treat the posterior canal BBV is called the Ibley maneuver, published by Dr. Uh, John Ibley from the United States. So uh, this is a four, five steps uh, maneuver intended, intended to use the gravity uh, to just move the autoconia from the posterior semicircular canal and the, to bring it back into the uterine canal. So usually the first step of Ibley maneuver, it is the Dixwell bike test or position. So uh, as you see here, this is Ibley maneuver for the right ear. And when we bring, we start by bringing the patient into the Dixwell bike position, the autoconia moves and until it came here to the middle of the canal. So in this position, because the Ibley maneuver depends on the gravity to work. 
we wait one or two minutes until the, all the autoconia came to this point. Then after one or two minutes, we turn the head briskly 90 degree towards the health side. All the maneuvers, which are uh, like uh, manual or uh, uh, some physical therapy for the BBV, is based on uh, bringing, moving the head gradually from the affected side towards the healthy side. So in uh, every maneuver, uh, after the first uh, step, we move the head uh, briskly 90 degree toward the healthy side. Uh, we wait for one or two, one and a half minutes until no symptoms, no nystagmus. And we can watch for the direction of the nystagmus on the monitor. Uh, if it's repeating like the initial one, that means the autoconia is moving in the right direction. If it's uh, reversed its direction, that means it's returning the back. Uh, then after uh, one and a half minutes, we go to uh, for the third step of empty maneuver by turning the head 90 degree uh, towards the healthy side. In this uh, position, uh, the downmost ear become now the uppermost ear. And this is a critical position, very important. We keep the head for two minutes in this position. So at this position, the autoconia becomes near to the common cross here, about just to go to uh, move back toward the uterine. So after two minutes, we just bring the patient in the sitting position. And in this position, usually the autoconia comes back, returning back to the uterine. Sometimes the patient in this position feels uh, 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 severe unsteadiness feels uh, like he's falling down. So it's important that the clinician uh, keeps on holding the head of the patient. Usually it's just last uh, for uh, less than a minute or something, uh, then all the symptoms are clear. There is another famous maneuver to treat the posterior canal. It's called the Simont maneuver, published by a French physical therapist uh, his name is Simon, and it uses the inertia to uh, clear the autoconia from the posterior canal. So usually, like uh, this is a diagram to show the Simon maneuver for the right posterior canal BBV. So in this uh, maneuver, we turn the head toward this, uh, the shoulder of the healthy side. So as you see here, it's turning the head towards the left shoulder. Then uh, we bring the patient on the side lying position. So in this position, uh, usually it provokes an nystagmus and symptoms. We wait for two minutes in this position. Then that's very important for a Simon to maneuver to <clears throat> the second step uh, to move the head very briskly in one second, uh, more than 180 degrees, and they bring uh, the head into the opposite side of the table. But the movement should be very fast to uh, work because it uses the inertia. So with this uh, very brisky, uh, fast uh, movement, the autoconia, uh, it can be cleared from the posterior canal. So the empty maneuver uses the gravity, but the same auto maneuver uses mainly the inertia. But both of them, they do work. But like in the United States, uh, empty maneuver is more well known. But in Europe, uh, same ones also uh, more known and commonly used. And both of them, they do work. But in our practice, we usually start with empty maneuver. Uh, for horizontal canal or lateral canal, it is the same name, horizontal or lateral canal. Um, we can use a special test to uh, confirm its diagnosis. So it's called subine roll or McClure-Bagnini test. And uh, it includes four steps. Uh, usually you start by placing the head in the supine 
then after 30 seconds, we turn the head 90 degrees to the right and watch for any nystagmus. We wait until the nystagmus subsides. Then we bring the head back into the supine center position. We wait for 30 seconds. Then we turn the head to the left side. Uh, we watch for uh, nystagmus and we wait until it subsides. Then we bring back into the center. And as I mentioned before, it depends on the location of the autoconia in the horizontal canal. It can give uh, different types of nystagmus, mainly it's called geotropic and abogeotropic type. So it depends on the location of the autoconia in the anterior or posterior arm of the horizontal canal. But as we mentioned before, it causes symptoms and nystagmus. Either we turn the head to the right or we turn the head to the left. There is uh, many maneuvers published to treat the horizontal canal, but here we only will show you a very simple and easy uh, maneuver. It's called a geophony maneuver for the lateral canal. Uh, and as you see, it's a four-step maneuver. And this is intended to be used for the geotropic cases. So if we have a right um, horizontal canal uh, BBV of the geotropic type, we do the Giofani maneuver for geotropic type. So if the right ear is affected, we, uh, as you see, like the patient sit down, then we bring the head 90 degree uh, towards the healthy side. So if the right horizontal canal has a geotropic BBV, we treat it by placing the head of the patient uh, um, on the side lying position, uh, 90 degree on the left side. Then after like one minute, we turn the head 45 degree down. Wait for another minute, then uh, we bring the head in the sitting position. Uh, usually, we combine this with what is called the forced prolonged positioning maneuver. So, after doing the Yufani maneuver in the clinic, we advise the patient to go home and to lie on the healthy side for one or two nights. So, either awake, either sleeping, just we need to stay on the lying on the healthy side. Uh, for like eight, 10 hours, uh, as much the patient can tolerate. And in this way, we use the gravity uh, to help us to clear any kind of autoconia in the horizontal canal. Post-treatment instructions. So um, there is some controversy about the value of the post-treatment instruction. The uh, controlled studies show it that it's not necessary. But some of the instructions, uh, they don't harm, they could be of benefit. Uh, they help to uh, improve the recurrence and to, to improve the outcome. Uh, so let's to go through them. So first, um, post the treatment after the Ibley maneuver or Simonti maneuver, avoid any large or fast heat movements for the first 24 hours after reposition. Uh, Otoconia believed to need like 24 to 48 hours to settle in the utricle and get attached back to its original place. So during that period, it's good if the subject can just restrict the head movements, especially for the posterior canal, the upward and downward uh, movements. For the posterior canal, uh, we advise uh, the patient to sleep on the back with a high pillow or towels under the head uh, for the first 48 hours. Uh, in case of lateral canal BBV, we advise the subject to sleep in the healthy side for the first 48 hours. So in, by these two recommendations, we want to use the effect of the gravity to help to clear any residual autoconia and to prevent 
reflux of the autoconia pack to the semicircular cap. And one of the uh, valuable advice is to avoid sleeping on the affected side for seven to 10 days after the treatment. This diagram to show how the towels can be used just to uh, raise the head. So it, may, it brings like the posterior canal in a higher position. So it uh, helps to clear any residual debris in the posterior canal. Avoid activities such as visiting the dentist, hairdressers, or swimming. Take care when shaving or using eye drops or washing the hair in the first 48 hours. And that makes sense. Uh, use a collar. When the collar here, uh, we mean by it a cervical neck collar or a neck collar uh, to limit the head movement. Actually, uh, the use of neck collar sometimes causes muscle, neck muscle spasms, and it causes discomfort to the patients. So it is unnecessary, and in our practice, we don't advise the use of uh, the neck collar unless um, it's a very uh, a case with a high recurrence. So, but usually we don't use the neck collars because they cause uh, neck muscle spasms. Vitamin D supplements. So many of the general population they do have vitamin D. Def deficiency or insufficiency. So uh, as we mentioned before, that is the autoconia is uh, composed of calcium carbonate. So uh, vitamin D is important for, um, to help its resorption in the indolent. So whenever there is a vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency, uh, supplements are advised. Even if there is normal levels of vitamin D, there is no harm to take a very low dose or a daily maintenance dose of 1,000 international units of vitamin D on daily basis for a few months. This is called improve the recurrence, and there is enough evidence that vitamin D supplements can decrease the recurrence of TB. Other maneuvers, there is, are other maneuvers to test the horizontal canal, like the Pawandeline maneuver, like the head extension maneuver. And there is other uh, maneuvers to treat the posterior uh, canal, like Gans maneuver. And there are special maneuvers to treat the horizontal canal and the anterior canal. So for horizontal canal, there is barbecue maneuver, Lambert, Logrol, uh, maneuver um, um, and we mentioned uh, forces prolonged maneuver and the Jufani Jufani maneuver. For the anterior canal, there is what's called the Acovino maneuver or deep hit, hit, deep hit hanging maneuver. But we'll not talk about them because uh, anterior canal is uh, rare. Differential diagnosis. Some other conditions could mimic PBV, so careful examination, monitoring, and appropriate investigations can differentiate PBV from other conditions. The best care for PBV is that the subject should be evaluated by a well-trained clinician who is able to provide accurate diagnosis, repositioning, guidance, and proper and appropriate referral or investigations when needed. COVID time surfaces. So we can use the five questions screening from the Disney's handicap inventory to screen for the conditions. And a more detailed history can be obtained through uh, the questionnaire or a telephone interview with the health care provider. Uh, we ask the patient to try to determine which side provokes more symptoms because this is could make it easy to know which side is more affected. Uh, we can teach the patient to use their mobile phones to record um, uh, uh, their eye movements after placing the head in the provoking position. Uh, and they should record the eye movements until the symptoms disappear. 
A family member can help uh, them during the recording. Then they can send the recording to the healthcare provider to review them. There is a tip or a hint here to optimize the recording, self-recording of eye movements by the patient. So go to your smartphone settings, uh, change the camera frame uh, from 30, which is the default in the most of the smartphones, and you make it 60 frames per second. That gives a better quality recording of the eye movements and stigmas, which make it clear for your healthcare provider to interpret them. We can use, uh, if we uh, are comfortable to uh, diagnose posterior canal BBV, we can teach the patient to do the home IBI maneuver. It is almost similar to the office implement maneuver done by the clinician with some little modification. So the main modification is for the safety of the patient. We use a pillow. We don't hang the head uh, down from the bed. This is called, uh, in uh, absence of the healthcare provider, this is could be difficult for the patient and inappropriate. So we teach the patient to put a pillow and to do all the steps of the Ibli maneuver uh, on the pet completely. So as you see here, uh, he starts by uh, sitting in the pet with the pillow under the shoulders. Then uh, suppose that he has a right BBV posterior canal, he will be uh, turning the head 45 degrees to the right, then extension of the head, but completely on the pet, using the pillow under his shoulders. Wait in this position for one minute or until the symptoms subside, then briskly turn the head 90 degrees towards the left side, wait for one minute or until the symptoms subside, then make another turn for 90 degrees, bringing the undermost ear to be the uppermost ear, stay in this position for uh, one or two minutes, then you sit down. So this is how home Ibli maneuver can be done safely. And it can be repeated uh, more than one time to be more effective. So this is something which can be used during the COVID time. Thank you. All right, Ryan, I'm going to let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Al Fargal. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. I uh, just have a few questions here. We'll run by you. Sure. So for you, Al Fargal, the first one comes from Jerry, and I think it's kind of right off the uh, last slide you had there. Quick Google search, and I find a ton of at-home maneuvers. What are the dangers of doing these home maneuvers alone without a physician? Uh, honestly, we don't recommend the home exercises until in a very special situations. The ideal uh, way to diagnose and to treat BBV is that is the patient goes to a well-trained and specialized clinician in dizziness, receive a very good examination a very accurate diagnosis and very effective and evidence-based therapeutic maneuver. I just put those slides uh, because uh, we did the recording at a time where is COVID uh, prevent uh, the regular services in different parts of the world. But uh, this is very exceptional and this is not the recommendation. So uh, the, uh, most of our patients, we treat, it, we diagnose and we treat in our office. And this is the best practice. In very exceptional cases, either with resistance, either the patient cannot come for a reason or two, we can do carefully uh, and under monitor and supervision of a trained dizziness specialist. Uh, it can be done, but this is very, very exceptional situation. The mainstream, everybody should get examination with a trained professional, get uh, 
a therapeutic maneuver with a trained professional in the office. So this is the recommendation. Rare cases. Okay. Um, Sumit, this question comes from Mara Miro in the YouTube comments with a bilateral BPPV, which side do you usually treat first? Is there any rhyme or reason to how you treat which side first? What's the, what's the idea there? Yes, this is, this is uh, actually, I wrote a book, a chapter on uh, multiple canal BPV. The book is named Understanding BPV and uh, it's in Amazon. So it just is simply if the symptoms uh, from uh, both sides, uh, they are not the same. One side provokes more symptoms. So uh, basically we can start by treating the more symptomatic side. Uh, in our experience, sometimes, uh, as I mentioned before, the side where is the patient lie on, like right or left, that's usually get more affected. Uh, bilateral BBV is uh, generally rare. It can happen in both traumatic cases. It happened, but it's not, not very common. And it's either you have equal symptoms from both sides, or you have one side more symptomatic than the other, provokes more vertigo and more dizziness. So if you have uh, a side which provokes more dizziness or vertigo, you can start by doing the Ibli maneuver from the side. Another uh, point that is uh, uh, you can, if you are using the Simunt maneuver, you can treat both sides at the same session. But if you use the Ibli maneuver, if you treat the right side, you disturb the left one. So it doesn't make sense if you have an equal symptomatizing PBV from the posterior canal from both sides, it doesn't make sense to do Ibli for uh, both sides at the same session. So usually you do uh, uh, the most symptomatizing one, the one which provokes more vertigo, and after a few days just to do the other uh, one. But if you uh, want to go for simultaneous clearance or repositioning, a CMUT maneuver, uh, it allow you can simultaneously treat both sides. But let me to add a very important point that sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's a pseudo bilateral. And what it means pseudo bilateral, it means that is only you have in one side and it provokes more dizziness. But when you turn uh, to the other side, it causes some uh, movement in the uh, inhibitory direction. So uh, most of the cases, what happened, this pseudo bilateral BBV represent 50% of the bilateral symptomatizing cases. So if the clinician uh, diagnoses accurately the affected site, treat it perfectly, and 50% of the times, symptoms from both sides, they get cleared. Gotcha. So this is the three possibilities and how to manage. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for that, Al Fargal. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Sumit so we can get him involved on this question. Uh, this is from Nima, who says, uh, as far as residual dizziness after successful repositioning, how do you manage some of the residual symptoms? Okay, Perfect. so... Al Fargal, we're going to let Sumit uh, answer this one to get him involved. Okay. Thank you, okay. though. Okay, so um, so you have done a correct diagnosis. You have managed to locate the BPPV. You have done the right maneuver, and yet the patient is still dizzy. So there are a number of possibilities. So first, I'm going to just briefly say that suppose you have done the right maneuver and you have managed to move the particles. So that means that you have effectively treated the BBPV, yet the patient is still subjectively dizzy. The reason for this is if BBPV is longstanding, there is a central vestibular processing problem which goes on because the brain tries to understand the BBPV and recalibrates itself. So even when you cure the condition, this residual dizziness will remain. And we find this in pretty much everything with uh, neuroetology, really, that Sometimes the way the brain acts, it actually outlives the original condition. So in many of my patients, actually, I would say about 20 to 30 percent patients, this extra 30 percent patients who would be dizzy, even though I'm sure that I've done the right thing. And how do I know that? 
I'll see the disappearance of nystagmus. Now, that is absolutely crucial. There was one question in the forum which asked that, can, is, can there be a BPPV without a nystagmus? The answer is there is one variety of BPPV which is extremely rare, less than 0.5%. That's when the particles collect in one particular area of the posterior semicircular canal. It has got two arms, a big short arm and a long arm. So it's one area which can generate uh, subjective dizziness and nausea without any nystagmus, but that's very rare, so we won't talk about it. So what essentially is happening, therefore, is this residual res dizziness is because of the brain function. And I would send these patients for a customized BBPV tailored rehabilitation, and we have developed a program here. So those patients are then subjected to this specialized post we call it post-BPPV customized rehabilitation. This is essentially to un entangle the mess that the brain has undergone, you know, trying to give the brain the right idea that, look, buddy, your particles are gone. So you need to really uh, keep your shape up or you, you really need to get back in shape. The second possibility is suppose with my maneuver, I have managed to dislodge the particles, not back to the utricle or the where they have come from, but I've managed to displace them back to a different semicircular canal. Now that's called the canal conversion, which is also rare, but it can happen if the particles are very, very brittle. You know what I mean? You know, they don't have enough weight. So in that case, the patient says that, no, I'm still very, very dizzy. So you'll have to repeat your Dix Hall Pike or the supine roll test or the deep head hanging, the different positions. And you then figure out whether you have actually done a canal conversion. And if you find a canal conversion, then you need to repeat your particle positioning again. So that's the second thing when the dizziness can persist after your maneuver. And the third thing when a dizziness can persist after your maneuver is even more rare. And that's called a canalith jam. Now, what happens there? This happens that you have moved the particles. Well, yeah, the particles are listening to what you are doing. You are moving the head. The particles are moving beautifully. But due to some anatomical variation in your semicircular canals, look, your canal is not the same as mine. You know, your canal might be broader than mine. There is a range. So what if your canal is very narrow and the particles refuse to move beyond a certain constriction or a certain kind of a narrowing, then the canals, then the otoliths of the particles jam. And this is called a canalith jam. This is much more common with horizontal semicircular canal rather than with the classical, more commoner variety, which is the posterior semicircular canal. So in that case, canalith jam is a difficult thing to treat because you'll have to increase the velocity of your particle positioning. And sometimes that's very difficult, especially in elderly patients with very difficult neck mobilities. So you can use a device, for example, a mastoid vibrator has been used to dislodge the particles. You put a vibrator behind the head. I haven't had many canalith jams in my life, maybe one or two. And usually what I did, I was lucky enough to increase the velocity of the head movement. So like something like a very drastic, high speed, high acceleration movement like a Simont. I mean, Apley is a much slower movement than Simont. I would use a Simont mainly for when the particles are stuck. I wouldn't use a Simont when the particles are free floating. But for a canal jam, I might have to use something like a Simont. So essentially, these three reasons, you might get a persistent dizziness after you have done a uh, particle positioning. And of course, it can come back, it can recur, and it can recur in a different canal. So there are a huge number of possibilities, which I don't think I'll be able to discuss them all. But I think I've given you the gist that these are the main three reasons and the three different sorts of treatment that you need to do. And uh, as a follow-up from that, Paula was wondering, um, is this different than persist uh, 3PD? Pers Absol you know, Absolutely, it's very different. It's very different, okay. Ryan. Uh, from 3PD. Now, the funny thing is, if one does not treat this chronic subjective dizziness after BPPV because the brain is trying a very long time to recalibrate, then there is a possibility it might lead to a 3PD. But BPPV, a properly treated BPPV, and the cure rate is more than 95%, then uh, a 3PD should not happen. And if you can treat the post-BPPV dizziness as well, then a 3PD should not happen. We should. This is a very good question from uh, the person who has asked this, that what about the residual dizziness? Even if your positioning is right, what do you do? It needs to be treated. You just can't leave it alone. You just can't say, this dizziness, you know, I'm not getting any nystagmus. Everything is fine, hunky-dory, so just go home. This dizziness will pass. 
it's not enough to say that. You do need to treat that residual disease. Absolutely. Gotcha. I think we have time for one final question. Uh, we'll ask you, Amy. Um, Kim was wondering, when you have BPPV, are you more at risk for developing other vestibular conditions? Is there any correlation between them? So in in the recent years, we do know that BPV can lead to secondary conditions, especially if it's untreated. Um, BPV is one of those ones that actually, if you get in the in the hands of the right specialist, it can be treated quite quickly. So if, if it can be resolved, that's really important. But if it is left for a long time, just as Dr. Sumit has said, then you will end up with some with, with residual or secondary conditions. It can lead to migraine, uh, 3PD, even though we resolve the BPV, which was the initial insult. Um, that that damage can lead to further issues gotcha wonderful well i think we'll uh we're right about time to lead into the next one right q yes and we will be talking about post-concussion dizziness with professor sumit for those that don't know we'd love to just give a quick intro to professor sumit while he's live on on screen with this Okay, so I'm going to introduce, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Sumit Dasgupta. He is the consultant audio vestibular physician at Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool. He also is um, the head physician um, at Sheffield Dizziness and Balance Clinic. Um, he has written many papers in both adult and paediatric diagnostic and rehabilitation um, and he's someone he's my go-to if I'm stuck or I don't know what I'm doing or there's a patient that's really really complex it's Sumit that I'm getting on the phone so you know thank you for all your support over the years and um, thank you for this presentation you're going to give us it's a pleasure to be here and especially now that Liverpool has won the Premier Yay! League <laughs> <laughs> I love that perspective European <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sumit, we are about to begin your presentation and we will see you afterwards. Hello, good evening and good morning to some guys because I'm talking from uh, UK, so this is GMT. And thank you very much to the organizers, Brooke and Chelsea, for um, inviting me to do this presentation about uh, dizziness and concussion. Now, um, there are lots of, uh, in a way, misinformation as to what concussion can do. So this lecture is essentially geared to one of the commonest, in fact, the commonest complication for concussion, which is dizziness. A little bit of introduction about myself. I work in the UK in the beautiful city of Liverpool. We are known for a football club. I am a consultant neurotologist. I also have got an adult private practice in Sheffield, so I'm all over the place. So I'm a true Brit, still under lockdown, trying my best to get out, but still can't. Uh, I also hold a chair in the University of Siena, and I also teach in two other universities. So first of all, let me um, define what a concussion means. Now, concussion is a term which is used very generally in the sense, concussion classically is a definition which is an injury to the head that may or may not lead to a traumatic brain injury. Now that is concussion. So the, uh, it is inherently suggested that concussion in that case is a temporary thing. And indeed, the classical definition of concussion is actually when all your symptoms following a blow to the head go away within six months to a year. But concussion is also used, in fact, in medical legally as well, when it leads to a more permanent sequel. So the real complication of a concussion is not just a temporary upheaval of brain function, but this has got a serious implication. It can lead to a permanent brain damage. So what exactly is a concussion? And what is the mechanism of concussion? Obviously, uh, purely by intuition, you can think of the brain as a soft tissue organ, which is protected very heavily by possibly the hardest bone in the human body, the skull bones. It needs to be protected, obviously, it's your brain after all. Now, obviously, intuitively, if there is a blow to the head, then the brain will move inside that skull. And that is a direct injury, that is a direct blow to the head. But there is another mechanism, which is equally important, 
and which sometimes gets missed. I mean, I, I appear for the court for so many times as an expert advisor, and I have seen that sometimes even experts miss this, that they do not consider an injury to the head without a direct blow. So what happens? Suppose you are in a car and the car stops. You are going at 50 miles an hour and the car suddenly, you suddenly have to stop the car because of something, some obstruction. What can happen? You can either be thrown forwards, but you will be prevented by the airbag. So your head will be protected against smashing into the windscreen. But what can happen is the moment you stop, your brain continues to move within the skull. And the skull is a rigid structure, it doesn't expand. So the brain gets squeezed and compressed. And in the process, it um, sustains an injury. This injury is called the classical acceleration deceleration injury, as I have put that in a figure, which is wonderfully drawn by the Mayo Clinic. So when the brain moves, the brain matter moves inside the rigid or bony skull, it is liable to be injured. And that's a classical acceleration deceleration injury. So the importance of this is, essentially, you do not need a direct blow to the head. You can have a concussion or a head injury, or even leading to a brain injury by the acceleration deceleration process. And the third type of injury is, of course, a blast injury, where you can be thrown into the ground, where you sustain a direct blow to the head. Or if you manage not to fall into the ground, then the sheer blast, the air pressure wave of the blast can cause exactly a similar thing as an acceleration and deceleration. And the blast injury, you know, I've seen many soldiers, I used to work for the British Army, I've seen many soldiers who actually sustained a blast injury without any direct injury to the head, and they ended up um, having a traumatic brain injury. So these are the three mechanisms by which a head injury can lead to a brain injury. Now, at this point, let me quickly tell you the difference between head injury and brain injury. You see, you know, when you are walking inside your house and you have a small bump to your head against the door. That is a head injury, believe me or not. And some of the neurons in your brain are lost, but they are not that severe that they will cause any function or clinical effect. Now that's a head injury. Has that head injury led to any tangible brain injury? No. Therefore, head injury and brain injury, they are the two terms are changed, are used interchangeably, but there is a difference. And this becomes important in a court of law. You can have a head injury without a brain injury, but a brain injury is almost always following a head injury. Now, brain injury, I'm talking about a traumatic brain injury. You can have a metabolic brain injury. You can have different pathologies causing a brain injury, but that's different. A traumatic brain injury almost always follows a head injury, but a head injury does not necessarily lead to a brain injury. And these two terms must be very, very important to distinguish and make a distinction between the two of them. Now, obviously, the head consists of the ear. I ask my students, why is the inner ear or the ear located in the head? Why can't it be located in your thigh? What is the evolution? Why does the hearing mechanism and the vestibular organ need to be located in the head? And the simple reason is its neural connection. Can you imagine your ear located in the thigh? It has to make such a long journey to go to your brain. So nature has solved this problem by locating the ear, which is a nervous or neurological structure, very, very close to the head. So the tracts and the pathways have got the least to travel to make their connections. And the inner ear consists of a very important or organ called the vestibular system, and that is in the head. So the vestibular system can be affected or can be injured following a concussion. So obviously, you can imagine that a blow to the head or an acceleration, deceleration, or a blast injury can actually injure the vestibular system as well. And today, because I'm a vestibular specialist, I'll be emphasizing mainly on this vestibular injury, which is sadly very much underdiagnosed, very much misdiagnosed, often missed, and you know, often not picked up even by experts. And I've seen this to be happening too many times, and I'm sure everybody will agree that this is like a, a kind of a disease or kind of a pathology which is hidden. But this is very real. And the commonest uh, symptom which can follow uh, damage or an injury to the vestibular system is a dizziness. And therefore, a vestibular injury can be accompanied with dizziness in most of the cases. However, 
there are instances where your vestibular system might be spared and your brain is injured only. In that case, what happens is you can still get a dizziness. Why? Because remember, the vestibular system sends all its connections to the brain. So the final processing of the vestibular input or the dizziness is actually in the brain. And if the brain can't do it because of an injury, then the net result is a dizziness. So at the end of the day, dizziness is a symptom which is produced by an injury to the vestibular system or the vestibular connections in the brain. So what is the vestibular system? I'm showing you here two, uh, two figures. One is actually a video and the other one is a figure. Now, the vestibular system, as I said, is located inside the inner ear. That consists of really five different organs. You see these semicircles. These are the canals we call semicircular canals. So one looks at the top, one looks at the back, one looks at the side. They sense when you're moving your head in different directions, in different axes. These are called the angular motion sensors. In the middle, you have got the utricle on the top and the saccule at the bottom. These two are gravitational sensors. Now, these are ubiquitous across the animal kingdom. Even the smallest plankton will have some kind of a gravitational sense because gravity, gravity always pulls you down. So three semicircular canals and two gravitational sensors. Now, I once had an argument with a hepatobiliary specialist who said the liver is the most important organ in the body. That's a gross 20 kilo organ. Compare it to this bit. This is less than one millimeter, with one cubic millimeter in diameter. In every micrometer, 64,000 sensory hair cells are packed. Now, this is nature at its finest. If this is not fine, then nothing is. In fact, I tell my students that this comes out of science fiction, really. So these five organs, they generate or they, they kind of contribute to 60%, as much as 60% of your normal balance. What is balance? Your orientation in space. You have to orient your, yourself in space at all times so that you know where you are at any given point of time. Otherwise, your life is not compatible. And vestibular system contributes to 60% of your normal balance. It sends its connections to the brain, as I said, and then the brain sets up a number of what we call reflexes to your eyes, to your spine, to your legs, to your arms, to your neck, so that you can actually be stable and you can maintain your balance and be stable in your posture. Now, this is the vestibular system. And as you can also see, this bit is the cochlea or the hearing system. So the cochlea and the vestibular system, both are contained in that part of the inner ear we call the labyrinth. And when we talk about concussion, we sometimes say a labyrinthine concussion. Now, this is a small video, which hopefully will take you through the whole thing. So as you can see, that's the outer ear, which you can see, and this is the vestibular system. These are the three semicircular canals. When you are moving, the semicircular canals with the fluid inside them are moving in different direction, send the signal to the brain, and the brain tells you what's happening. And then, this is once again a fly through. That's the whole labyrinth, the cochlea and the vestibular system, the three semicircular canals in different directions. That's the nerve which makes the connection to the brain, different directions of movement, which the vestibular system picks up and sends to the brain. Now, very importantly, these are the different hair cells, which I said one micrometer consists of nearly 64,000 uh, of these cells which move as your head moves. And these are the fine, what we call hair cells of the neural cells, which move in different directions, driven by the fluid. This fluid is in the inner ear, and the fluid moves when the head moves and moves this bit of the semicircular canal. And that's how a signal is set up, essentially. Now, this is in the canal. This is when you are actually moving, and this is happening continuously. That's the gravitational sensor. You treat these chalk particles. These chalk particles are very important. They're called otoliths which essentially sends gravity. And please remember this, because there is a condition where these otolith particles can actually slip after a blow to the head or otherwise into the semicircular canal, generating a very distressing condition, which we will talk about very briefly later. So this is essentially the vestibular system, highly complex, and uh, as I said, coming out, right out of science fiction. And unfortunately, awareness is not as wide in the whole medical and paramedical fraternity as, you know, as let's say, for example, the heart or the brain or the liver. So 
that is an important thing. So what is vestibular concussion? Same mechanism of damage as head injury. And the quoted incidence is about 15 to 75% after a head injury. But the ones which really come to light would be less than 10%. And by definition, as I said, concussion results completely by three to six months because the brain compensates and recovers, but it can lead to a permanent damage. What are the symptoms? Dizziness, as I said, and obviously, if your balance is compromised, you might be unsteady on your feet. That is, you walk and you get different kinds of uh, accounts from patients saying that, you know, my husband walks like a, like a drunken man. So it's kind of lurching gait, unsteady, very broad base. So your feet are wide apart. The third one often gets dismissed as a visual or an eye problem. Because remember, the eyes can be hurt in a head injury too. This is dizziness in challenging visual surroundings. If I go to a superstore, the bright lights, that really makes me very, very imbalanced or dizzy. I cannot see the world moving past when I'm in a car. This is called visual vertigo, and this is actually dizziness in challenging visual surroundings, which by default comes from a damaged vestibular system and not from the eyes. And this is a very, very important symptom, which often does not get picked up by experts. The fourth one is also very important, difficult navigation skills. A common problem after a head injury is a complaint. I bump into things more frequently than I'm doing now. So what does that mean? I'm bumping into a door frame, right? When I'm going into the car, I'm bumping into the door of the car. Then I lost my way when I'm trying to come back home. Now, this is classically attributed to a brain injury, but it has been shown recently that one of the semicircular canals has got a very, very key role to play in case of um, a, a difficult navigation skill. The fifth one is also not very uncommon, vertigo, that is spinning on changing positions of the head. So you are trying to lie down, trying to get up, trying to take something from the top shelf in the kitchen, you get intensely dizzy. So any movement of the head against gravity makes you very, very dizzy. And this is because as I showed you in the last slide in that video, the small particles can shift from the gravitational sensor that is the utricle and saccule into the semicircular canals and they irritate the canals. And that's what happens. And it's very easy to be treatable and curable. The next one is also not uncommon. And once again, this is sometimes branded as a headache following head injury. But a head injury can generate a condition called vestibular migraine, which behaves exactly like a headachey migraine. But here the headache is replaced with dizziness. So exactly same symptoms as migraine, but you don't have a headache, you have a dizziness. The next one, difficulties to move in darkness. Now, obviously, when your vestibular system is affected or injured, you rely heavily on your eyes for balance. And you take away all the different cues for your vision. That means darkness. What happens? Your vestibular system decompensates and becomes very difficult for you to move in the dark or when the light is dim. And of course, your general imbalance leads you difficulties in moving in stairs, lifts, escalators, sometimes driving. In fact, uh, driving is a key thing, especially driving at nighttime which is sometimes very difficult for persons who have had a labyrinthine concussion or a damage. As I said before, this is often misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all, but so far you can appreciate that this has huge implications to lifestyle. In fact, when I uh, see my court cases, when I see all these medical league cases, when I ask them to fill up a psychiatric questionnaire, their quality of life is significantly centered around this imbalance and dizziness. And the other bit which significantly bogs them down is the cognitive or, you know, kind of higher planning skills, organization, memory, etc. But these two are very, very important. And these two. And one of, the, one of the things about a labyrinthine damage or a concussion is if it doesn't get treated, right, it might lead to a condition called 3PD, or persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which is a chronic condition, a person continuously feels dizzy throughout the whole way, throughout the whole day, and this is a very, very difficult condition to treat. So we should not let any vestibular weakness following a vestibular injury to this stage, because vestibular injury and its aftermath can be treated very, very well with a number of modalities which would be a part of this uh, webinar. 
how do we then diagnose a concussion and damage? And obviously, history is crucial. What are we looking from the patient? What do we what, what what do we want to tell us? Now, the important thing which we are looking for is to establish the mechanism of the injury. So, the mechanism, as I said, there are three. And usually, you will find the mechanism of the injury very beautifully described to you by either the patient. Now, sometimes remember these patients. They are speech deprived because of the head injury. It can be a severe head injury. Sometimes they don't recollect, they don't have any memory. Sometimes it's their partner or whoever is accompanying them giving you a surrogate history. Sometimes it's the medical records. But at the end of the day, we will have to coax this story out as to what is the mechanism of the injury. And why is that important? This is important because remember, even a very trivial head injury, head injury, not talking about a brain. Even a trivial head injury can knock out the vestibular system completely. And that is a real thing. So it is very important that we take a good description of the injury, and that can take some time. Then, of course, we perform a series of clinical tests. And as of last count, I personally perform about 23 different clinical tests in my clinic to assess how much of the vestibular system is affected. I provoke different body movements, head movements, I challenge their balance by asking them to stand on one leg with their eyes closed. So I do varieties of tests, uh, tests in order to assess their balance. Uh, one very difficult test sometimes is asking your patient to balance on a soft surface. So you take away the hard friction from the ground. You take away, you know, ask the patient to close his eyes. So you take away the vision. So your balance is now entirely driven by your vestibular system. And in that case, if you have got a damaged or a weak vestibular system, you'll fall. And obviously, you'll have to do this in a safe and secure way so that the patient doesn't sustain any injury. But at the end, all these tests and the history gives you a very, very good idea. And you can prove your case that there is a significant labyrinthine injury which has caused all these problems. After we do clinical tests, I would send my patients to the laboratory where all the different clinical tests which I have done can be physically measured by very high-tech software-driven equipment, which in fact have revolutionized the whole vestibular diagnostics. These tests are very important because these are physically quantifiable. In other words, these can tell you exactly what percentage of the vestibular system is affected. At the end, the idea is once again to get a comprehensive picture as possible. And finally, we'll have to exclude because dizziness can also occur from just a brain injury sparing the vestibular system, in which case we will have to exclude a neurological cause for dizziness, which you can make out not with any difficulty from all the different tests you have done. For example, the way your eyes move would be different if it's a vestibular injury than if it's a brain injury. So as you can see, this is a very comprehensive test battery, which includes the history which will lead you to a correct diagnosis. Now, why do we need a diagnosis? This is to formulate management and rehabilitation, which I'm sure features heavily in this seminar. A few examples of tests. Obviously, I'm not going to go into any technical details, but these are the two latest tests that we do. This is actually from a small girl, I think six years old. So what happened was she was trying to reach for something at the top uh, from, from the fireplace. And she used a stool, fell from the stool and hurt her head. No loss of consciousness, no vomiting, absolutely nothing. Went to a &E because she had a bump. Casualty discharged her home. She was perfectly okay. Three months down the line, she, her, her teachers complained she is not paying attention in class. Standard hearing test, one side, that is the right side, the, the, the labyrinth has been knocked out, which means there was no hearing. And the vestibular function tests were all over the place. But look, the child was perfectly normal from the functional point of view. And that is because of central compensation. So this is one of our tests. This is the right side, the right side of the inner ear. This checks the semicircular canals in the high frequency. So these movements are checked by this test. And this high frequency movement, a simple analogy would be when you're trying to join uh, a motorway, we call in UK, I think you guys call it a freeway. So when you're trying to join a freeway from a slip road, your instinct is that's, that's the frequency, high frequency movement, which we check here. And as you can see on the left side, that's the blue is the head movement. The green is the eye movement. The eyes move in harmony with the head 
when you move your head like this, but out here, the eyes are not moving. There's a clear lag, and the brain tries to catch up with it with these spikes we call saccades. Now, this, as I said, has changed the way we look into vestibular diagnostics. I think if you have to do any one test in order to do vestibular diagnosis, it would be this test. Yeah, granted, it doesn't give you all the information, but the information it gives you is absolutely crucial. The second test which we have done here is uh, same child, and this is the VEMP test, which is a very interesting test and which is now getting refined as we speak. Not very easy to do in kids, though. But uh, this test checks one of the gravitational sensors. So we stimulate that gravitational sensor with sound, and it should return a normal response. When it doesn't return a response, then obviously it's not functioning properly. As you can see on the left side, it's beautiful, this peak, this curve that you see, uh, this blue one, this is a peak that you see, which is normal. On the right, you see it's a flat line. So we took a big, good history from this child, and obviously she's six. Can I tell you something that if you're taking a history in a child with a head injury, the most difficult group of patients would be the teenagers, because even if they don't have a head injury, they hardly communicate. Now, if they do have a head injury, they don't talk at all, right? So it's just grunts and hers and her. Uh. So it's very important that you take the person around the child on board. Now, of course, this might not happen in adults unless they're very significantly uh, traumatized by the brain injury, which has kind of left them in a very significant uh, disabled state. So these are the two latest tests. As I said, if someone has to do some vestibular diagnostics, these two tests are absolutely crucial in addition to others. So just the arrows that there is no response. We have to fully assess the hearing of the person who had, has had a concussion because as I showed you, the cochlea is just next to, next to the vestibular system. And if the vestibular system is affected, then just by their geography, the cochlea is likely to be affected too. I mean, about two thirds of uh, labyrinthine injuries would have both cochlea and vestibule involved, about a third each where only one system is involved, either the vestibular system or the cochlear system. Now, treatment. Once we treat, why did we have to go to such lengths to diagnose? Vestibular rehabilitation, and that has to start early. If you are late, you are opening up the chances of a 3PD, a difficult condition to treat. And this will be covered extensively, so I'm not going to any details, but customized vestibular exercises, depending on what you have found, has got a brilliant and absolutely fantastic outcome. You might have to treat the migraine with medicines. The BPPV or the particle moving from the gravitational sensor to the semicircular canal, it's called the benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, very common condition. And that you can treat with head movements we call particle repositioning leading to a complete cure. Now, obviously, uh, persons with labyrinthine concussion or damage they do undergo a compensation by the brain itself. Any factor which can lead to a problem or an inability of the brain to do this compensation will prolong or sustain the vestibular symptoms. So obviously a brain injury does lead to kind of things like higher center problems like memory, planning, then psychological mood changes, depression, et cetera, et cetera. These also need to be treated aggressively if you want to achieve complete compensation. And often a situational awareness that is counseling from the vestibular specialist and self-awareness is very important. So it's not a one discipline thing. It's hugely multidisciplinary and they have to coordinate and have, we, are, we should be working in a team and uh, kind of tackle this problem head on rather than keep it for the future. And for that diagnosis is absolutely crucial. So at the end, last slide, your vestibular system is now being called your internal GPS after that navigation thing has been discovered. So it coordinates and teams up with different systems in your body and it leads to yourself orientating yourself in this vast infinity called space. And to prove this point and to emphasize how important is it for the system and therefore an injury can knock out many things, I'm playing you this video.
Thank you very much. All righty. Ryan, what are our questions? It looks like you're on mute. Thanks. Thanks, Q. Um, just uh, one question here for you, Sumit, from Paula. For uh, Can you elaborate a bit on concussion becoming 3PD, and then how is that treated and managed? Okay, so as I said, that concussion, if it leads to a labyrinthine or a vestibular damage, um, the initial presentation will be the different vestibular symptoms, of course. If there is no treatment offered, and this time frame is variable. I mean, it can be six months for one person. It can be a year. It can be two years, three years, because remember, the brain is an exceedingly resilient organ. But in some instances where the brain is unable to compensate properly, you would progress to the stage of 3PD, where the brain will be in a perpetual state of what I usually call a misunderstanding. So the signal is being sent by the damaged vestibular system, but instead of concentrating on how to get rid of it, the brain is actually getting more involved in not understanding what's coming from the vestibular system. And that is the situation where you end up with the 3PD. Now, the Barani Society, that is the parent vestibular body in the world, they have come up with different criteria for diagnosis of 3PD. It's not a psychological condition. It is now considered as a physical condition. And the most common cause is an untreated vestibular condition. And obviously, a vestibular damage from a head injury will be a part of it. Now, if it happens, the typical symptoms are, of course, you know, a chronic, what this was used to be called chronic subjective dizziness, so CSD, which has now been changed to 3PD. And a variety of situations where you will feel intensely disorientated. For example, your visual vertigo will persist for a long time. Uh, you might get this undulating kind of feeling as if you are in space, swaying right and left or back and to and fro. Um, all these things, they happen once one progresses to the 3PD stage. As I said before, it's a very difficult thing to treat. And at the moment, I think the treatment is a little bit controversial because some of us have got very good results with vestibular rehabilitation. Some of us have got very good results with pharmacological, with medical medicines, actually. We'll have to work closely with the psychiatrists as well as the neurologists. Some of us have, some of the patients, they have shown a spontaneous recovery once they know what's going on. So they devise their own coping strategies. So there is no really one recommended treatment I guess that what I would do, I would take one thing at a time and uh, go to the next stage if one thing is not working. But overall, the outcome is, you know, it's still quite debatable. Sometimes you achieve spectacular results, sometimes you don't. And I'm sure both Brooke and Amy will agree on this. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I definitely agree with that. And and we, you know, work in a very collaborative approach with these patients. So working closely with psychiatry, um, even EMDR treatments, um, following up with vestibular rehabilitation and a lot of optokinetic um, exposure and visual desensitization. So there's a lot, we always call them like tools that we're putting in the toolbox. So there's got to be quite a few different resources that patients are accessing. And the right hand has to know what the left hand yeah. is doing. Yeah, and one more thing I'd like to add, because in this world of digital world, you know, um, one of my colleagues in France, he is trying successfully some virtual reality, not just optokinetics broke, but some virtual reality, which he has devised. And he has shown me one of them where I almost fainted uh, because <laughs> I thought it was very severe. But I think maybe that is a future way ahead of treating 3PD with virtual reality. Yeah, you know? I think there's yeah, I think there's some really neat pieces to that. Brooke, uh, one question for you. Um, this just came in. How does concussion treatment differ between, uh, or post-concussion dizziness treatment differ between athletes and just normal civilians? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because athletes obviously have different normative data. And so when we're working with patients to base their thresholds or what we're going to expose them to or what's going to be kind of in their treatment program is going to be very different than 
a mother who's just attending, you know, gym classes weekly. So it's really important to make sure that specifically you're working to those athletes thresholds and really working with their trainers or working with, you know, if they're a professional athlete, their actual um, team that's surrounding them to maintain not only, you know, very slow and steady progress, but also make sure that they're reaching their maximum um, levels and, and previous performance levels. Got it. Got it. Uh, Q, you want to take a brief in that, That's all the questions we have from the dizziness st- or the uh, concussion stuff. So Q, you want to give us a little intermission and then we'll come back. Done.
We now have Amy Lennox Bally. You're going to be presenting uh, the next presentation, which is on anxiety, stress, and dizziness. Dr. Pierce, would you mind giving a quick intro as to who Amy is? I mean, everyone in the chat already knows her, but for those that don't know. <laughs> I will tee her up, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so Amy Lennox is going to be presenting. So she is an audiologist out of Liverpool, and she's amazing. So I think getting into um, the discussion or after the discussion, you're going to see, obviously, all of the value that she's going to be able to provide. Um, she owns her private clinic in Liverpool and does see patients um, in the clinic, uh, diagnostically and therapeutically. And then she trains all over the world, um, clinicians to make sure that, um, we're continuing to kind of spread best practices and help get a lot of this into, um, mainstream clinics. So it's accessible all around the world. All righty. Well, Amy, I'm going to let you take it away on this presentation and we will chat with you after. Hello, everybody. It's an absolute honor to be talking to you today at the first fair to go day. Um, now I've been given the task of talking about anxiety and dizziness, which is quite a tricky uh, subject to talk about because it's such a personalized individual thing. Um, if you're a patient, I'm just hoping that you'll get some resources and tools and tips and tricks to um, look at after today's presentation. And if you're a professional, I'm hoping that these concepts are something that you'll look into reading up on afterwards. Um, and again, I'm hoping you'll get some resources that you can give to your patients. Okay, so let's get going. So I'm gonna open with talking about three of my patients. I've changed some details uh, just so they can't be identified. Uh, but these are three quite common examples that we get through um, our clinic. First, we've got Samia. Now, Samia is a young mum and she's got her dizziness about eight months ago and she had a vestibular neuritis. She recovered in terms of the vestibular neuritis, um, recovered 
Eight months later, all her vestibular function tests were normal, yet she still felt kind of like this bobbing, uh, moving sensation. Um, she was off work for three weeks initially, but she had quite a hard time with her boss. He was not very understanding and uh, pushed her into going back to work as soon as possible. Then we've got Margaret. Now, Margaret is retired. She's been dizzy for 15 years. She has a, uh, a vestibulopathy, so she has a vestibular weakness on one side, um, but she has just not managed to get any better. She's had tons of rehab. She's been to lots of different people, and then she ended up through my door. And then lastly, we've got Vince. Now, Vince uh, does have a vestibular migraine, which means that he will get episodes of dizziness now and then. But it was fairly well managed. But he'd noticed over the last six months that his episodes were increasing. Um, and he just felt that it was starting to get out of control again. So these are three example patients. And what I will do is I'll go through the concepts and I will bring wrap it back up at the end with what we did with each three. Three very different cases. Um, they all had an emotional element to the dizziness. Okay, so with anxiety and dizziness, it's very much a chicken and egg issue. Um, dizziness is a symptom of anxiety. So when you're feeling anxious, you tend to hyperventilate, breathe shallow, and that in itself can induce dizziness. However, if you get a dizziness and you've never experienced anxiety in, severe, in a severe way or a moderate way before, um, dizziness itself can induce a lot of anxiety. So with you, when you're looking at this, what, what came first with you? Do you have anxiety? Did you have dizziness and then anxiety came on? Or maybe you're not even aware that you, there is some emotional element to your dizziness. Now you'll get an in detail talk about vestibular compensation on Vertigo Day um, by the lovely Margie Sharp. So she'll give you all the information as to what vestibular comp compensation is. Um, this is what we are aiming for when we treat you for dizziness. And if you um, compensate, uh, usually most of the time your quality of life uh, gets pretty much back to the way it was. There are barriers to vestibular compensation and we need to unpick what they are and they all fall under this kind of anxiety spectrum. First one's lack of diagnosis, a heightened autonomic nervous system. As a result of that heightened autonomic nervous system, you uh, adapt maladaptive techniques. Because of those maladaptive techniques, grey matter in your brain changes. And then you may or may not suffer from certain chemical imbalances. And let's go through them in detail. The fear of the unknown, that's a big issue with vestibular disorders. A disease known is half cured. It's a great saying from Thomas Fuller, who was a physician in the 1700s. And I think it fits very much with patients with vestibular disorders. Uh, I often get patients through the door who have had had dizziness for many years and often not been given answers 40 50 percent of the time if they get a diagnosis they can move on with their lives and pretty much have basic vestibular rehab and they start to feel better um there is an on average four to five years in the uk and the us that's the latest stat statistics before patients get a diagnosis for their dizziness and that is something that we here at Hypatia Dizziness specialist clinics and the guys at um, Dizziness and Vertigo LA are trying to change. The autonomic nervous system, um, that is something that all of you will know from an animal point of view. So um, animals will, if they're under threat, they will either fight, fly or freeze. But Humans have this very primal wiring as well. Now, the no autonomic nervous system is kind of driven from your vagal nerve, and your vagal nerve runs all the way through your body, and it connects to every major organ 
it connects your heart, your lungs, your digestive system, your liver, your pancreas, the lot. It's your gut brain, so it's your second brain. And you know when they say you've got a gut feeling, it's coming from your vagal nerve. It maintains things like blood pressure, um, how much oxygen is in your blood. um, And if you are in a heightened autonomic nervous system state, you will be in fight or flight or freeze mode. Now, it's very normal for you on a daily basis to kind of have certain stresses throughout the day. Become stressed, your autonomic nervous system heightens, but then it should be able to regulate itself and come back down to a normal state. What happens with people who are dizzy for a prolonged period of time, their autonomic nervous system remains heightened and they could not get any recovery from it. That in itself is an issue. And it affects your overall well-being. And the longer you remained in that heightened state, possibly the more unwell you will feel over time. Because you're remaining in a heightened autonomic nervous state, you probably will adopt some maladaptive techniques. Now, this concept is quite tricky to talk about because maladaptive techniques are different. They're very individualistic. So, for example, Samia, my first patient, she had normal vestibular function. I would give her very different advice to what I would give Margaret, who did have um, a vestibulopathy on one side. One common maladaptive technique that you will all be doing is not moving your head enough. Uh, Patients tend to come through the office and they have very stiff necks and they they will not move their head. That actually stops you from recovering from your uh, vestibular problem. Other maladaptive techniques are any kind of lack of movement, restriction from daily activities, any avoidance behavior. So if you avoid going places because of how it makes you feel. Um, Introspective monitoring, that just means when you're kind of really guarded and really kind of um, look and think and feel about how your body is and then guard guard postural control. So an example of that is somebody who is um, very careful when they walk in an unnecessary way. So when you are initially dizzy and you have a dizzy attack, yes, it's okay for you to kind of withdraw, ground yourself, you know, get yourself feeling a little bit better. But once you're coming out of that, you need to start trying to push yourself. It takes a lot of self-motivation and some good humour and some good guidance to kind of get through that maladaptive stage. Maladaptive techniques, though, are known to make changes in grey matter in the brain. Now, grey matter is responsible for concentration, memory, attention span and coordination. And it is well listed in the literature that there are changes Uh, in patients' concentration, memory, attention span, post a vestibular disorder. And there can be many levels to that. But it's important to be aware of that because there are things that you can do to help with this. And it's a case of you don't use it, you lose it. So it's things, I'm going to give you a list of tips to do coming up. It's things like puzzles, brain training apps, and there's a lot of technology out there to help you. The final point I want to talk about is our neurotransmitters. So these are your chemicals. Now your serotonin, your dopamine, they're your happy chemicals and they what they're they're what make you feel joyful, they help you sleep sleep well, um, they uh, are produced when you exercise, light exposure. So these are very simple kind of things that you can do to kind of improve those. But what's most interesting is GABA. Now GABA is your common neurotransmitter. GABA is what's released during the vestibular compensation process. However, if you're feeling a lot of anxiety, the GABA is released to maintain your heart rate and calm other parts of the nervous system um, if you have anxiety your your 
the capacity of your GABA is going to be lower because it's going to be used somewhere else and then you're going to have less capacity for vestibular compensation. So what does this all mean? Um, the, the crux of the matter is, is that if, if there is some anxiety, whether you know it's there or not, it's up to the clinician to try and unpick what, what is going on there. Vestibular rehabilitation on its own, giving you simple exercises will not work on its own if there is an emotional element to your dizziness and you will need some sort of personalised programme. Now, there's not many specialists out there that will be able to give you anything. I don't think there's any, but knowing that there's resources available and kind of steering you in the right direction for what you need is key to this. So here's an example of some of the uh, programs that you may or may not need. So talking therapy. So if there's a history of trauma or anything like that, a talking therapy would be very good for you. I have had patients in the past who are not comfortable with talking about whatever has happened to them. So there are non-talking therapies and the literature does say that they can be just as, if not more effective. Polyvagal stimulation, again, very well researched in general anxiety. And now there's been um, some published, published, some publications around um, vestibular rehab and polyvagal stimulation. Visual desensitization, resilience building, confidence building, that's something that we can now more easily provide in a vestibular rehab clinic. Um, due to the technology advances. CBT, which is cognitive, cognitive behavioural therapy, um, and there's many online applications available for you now. Mindfulness and med meditation. Um, I, I recommend this for everyone. I recommend this to my friends, my family, anyone, not, not just if you have vestibular issues. Deep relaxation, diet exercise, lifestyle changes, occupation, Occupational therapy, if there's a, any issues around work that are making life harder for you, it could even just be uh, the screens that you use. And if you have to use two screens, is there something that occupational therapy could help you to make that easier for you? And then sleep hygiene. We're surrounded by tech all the time. So sleep hygiene kind of means like how do you wind down before you go to bed? And can can you avoid being around um, social media and tech late at night is the things that you can do to suit your body before you go to bed. So with the current situation with social distancing, what I've done for you is put some quick wins together um, for you to have a look through because it's a lot difficult, to, more difficult to access the services. Uh, there will be a link below for you to click on to and you'll find a full resource pack to access links, apps, resources that might help you with what's listed on this page diet hydration and exercise every doctor will tell you every specialist will tell you no matter what your condition is that they are the key points um, you want a good foundation so you want strong muscle tone good hydration good diet vitamin levels and a blood pressure check are usually quite easy to access even now um, I think the pharmacies are starting to offer those services. Vitamin um, D and B deficiencies have um, are known to cause dizziness problems. So if you just get all that checked, and make sure that, that you have a solid foundation for us to work on. And again, as much sleep as you can possibly get in a, in, in a night is good. Identify any maladaptive techniques and try and reduce those safely. So if you feel that you are um, withdrawing, not going out for your, a daily walk, you should be going out as much, well, at, at least once a day to, to get some exercise. Uh, you need to do some self-reflection um, to see what issues or what things that you might not be doing because of your dizziness. Try and learn to identify an emotion, any emotional triggers. This is difficult because often we don't know what triggers us. And there's a full booklet in the, in the resource pack that I've put together of how to identify those emotional triggers and then how to deal with them or how to shift 
from that trigger in you. Um, human life is stressful. It does go up and down and it is okay to, to be triggered, but it's like, how do you ground yourself and how do you bring yourself back to, to center? Breath work, there's loads of great app, apps out there to help you learn to breathe deep. If, if you're an anxious type of person, you probably only use 5%, 10% of your lung capacity. Breath work is a really great way to change those o- oxygen levels in your blood system. Mindfulness, um, there's loads and loads out there on mindfulness and it is just a great way to calm the autonomic nervous system. Brain training apps are really, really good for grey matter and they're actually more entertaining than some of the other things you can do. But if you have any hobbies that you like, so gardening, cooking, painting, colouring in, anything that um, encourages fine motor skills, so anything which is small that you do with your hands, that's really good for grey matter. Online CBT, there's, there's a few free services that provide that. Interaction with other people, yes, that is difficult at the moment, but don't be withdrawing yourself and don't be isolating yourself without any kind of Zoom calls or people coming to your garden. Try and have interaction with other people. But the key to this is that they are safe people that make you, that comfort you. They do, you don't want, um, you need to have that in your life, not just people that make you feel stressed. And um, movement, movement energy. So what that means is kind of, state shifting it's like um what taylor say, shift says shake it off uh, so what you should do is if you're in a, st- a stressful state if something's irritated you what can you do to shake that off can you just stand up go for a walk can you do a little dance it does change the way you're thinking listening to music uh, this is part of kind of polyvagal stimulation therapy it has to be upbeat so no no um, no sad ballads Pop or folk is kind of what is recommended to kind of stimulate the vagal nerve. So let's bring it all back together and let's talk about Samia, Margaret and Vince again. So if you remember, Samia was the patient who was dizzy, uh, had a dizzy spell eight months ago. She had normal vestibular function, but she uh, was still feeling quite wobbly and not quite right. She had. some polyvagal therapy, some CBT, and more vestibular rehab. And she had pretty much made a full recovery within about three weeks. Then we had Margaret, who'd been dizzy for 15 years. She needed a little bit more help. Um, so we did some polyvagal stimulation, some CBT. She went to counselling, and she also had some um, a, a, a virtual reality rehab and after about six months her her scores she improved a lot she was a lot lot better and her quality of life lifted we also um encouraged her to spend more time with her friends because she'd withdrawn completely from them now vince was an interesting one very busy guy and he came in and he didn't acknowledge that he had any form of anxiety at all But after spending some time with him and unpicking what the issues was, he'd been doing a lot more travel in the last three months, which was the period in which his um, attacks had increased. And we were trying to figure out what were the triggers. And for him, the trigger was packing his car. It sounds silly, but he found that, that packing his car up in the morning would trigger him and make him feel unwell for the rest of the day so for the following eight hours so we just worked around that and got the lifestyle around that change so his wife would help the kids would help or he would learn he learned to pack the night before and he felt just by making that simple switch that that was all he needed so yes he will still get episodic to be the migraine but he wasn't getting triggered every time he had to travel for work. So thank you very much for listening. Um, You can find all the resources in the link below and there's the website to my training, which we provide training for vestibular specialists. 
and the clinic itself, which is in Liverpool, United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Uh, one quick question that I had that came up is, it's like you have to, as far as the chicken and egg problem goes, unpack both of these simultaneously, the anxiety mm -hmm. as well as the actual vestibular dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I guess, how would you recommend a patient going about doing that? Do they need to have their these two different specialists coordinate together? Is it about finding a specialist that can do it all? How do you usually uh, recommend a patient do that? Well, I would hope that the the kind of the understanding around this has changed over the last five, ten years. And I know that most diagnostic services are offering some sort of anxiety screen um to see if there is an anxious element to their dizziness it, it's very difficult and age to have two specialists involved but all dizzy or it doesn't matter what the dizziness disorder there usually needs to be a multidisciplinary team in place or a network in place for the patient to access the resources that are needed Yo, Ryan, I know we got some more questions. Uh, yeah, there weren't many um, for the anxiety and stress in particular, but I uh, thought we'd take this time to talk about vestibular migraine because I don't think that we cover that in any of the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Chrissy was wondering, are those with vestibular migraine more predisposed to MD, Hello, everybody. vertigo, anything like that? Amy, do you want to take that one? It kind of cut out for a second, Ryan. It, it, so, cut, it cut out, Ryan. Sorry. I'll, I'll, repeat, again. It. I'll yeah. repeat it. Um, Chrissy was wondering, are those with vestibular migraine more predisposed to MDDS or positional vertigo or any other condition? So with vestibular migraine, that's usually the condition that comes as secondary to other vestibular conditions. So, for example, long-standing BPV can can turn into a secondary vestibular migraine and even though you treat the BPV and resolve the BPV then the patient might be left with a, a long-standing uh, migraine with with MDDS I think that I think it's safe to say that that's kind of a completely separate issue um, but Barani Society have come out with a very, very kind of strict diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine and how and how you and how you diagnose that. And essentially, you're kind of ruling out any kind of other vestibular disorder first, resolving those first, and then you deal with the migraine. Got it. Got it. Uh, Ruth was wondering. What is the best type of specialist to diagnose and treat a patient with vestibular migraine? Is it a neurologist, neuroatologist, vestibular specialist? Who should somebody go to if they suspect they might have vestibular migraine? Brooke? Dr. Pierce, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Got it. Okay, going to take this one. <laughs> so so basically with this one, Amy kind of hit the nail on the head. It's important to work in a multidisciplinary fashion. So typically the neurologist or the neurootologist is going to be the treating physician that's working with the patient for medical management. And then um, simultaneously, they're working with the vestibular specialist to rule out any other vestibular conditions. So that's where a lot of the diagnostic testing will come in and a lot of the questionnaires and a lot of the follow-up. So usually it is that treatment approach with quite a few different specialists working along the way. Then as far as management is concerned, again, it becomes kind of a two and three kind of pronged approach where the physician continues to medically manage the patient. They are um, working concurrently, usually with a dietitian or working with um, kind of the, the dietary components that also include lifestyle modifications and trigger identification in addition to doing vestibular rehabilitation, um, which can be, you know, with the vestibular specialist to include the physical therapist or occupational therapist. Got it. There's a question in the chat from Victoria. Uh, with vestibular migraines, I was taught that they would not recover without being medicated first. Is that true or false? 
so it sorry <laughs> so in um in in the in my clinic uh we actually do do some medication first by the physician um and you normally need to be on uh, medication for about 12 weeks to make sure that you settle to it and you're close very very closely monitored and then as we know that you're kind of settling to that medication then we'll put the vestibular rehab on top um i don't think that vestibular rehab on its own or pharmacology on its own works i think again it has to be a very combined approach and again you can't just get be given blanket exercises or blanket pharmacology like we have we have to monitor you and keep an eye on you and see and see what's happening got it all right that's uh that does it for the questions so far if we want to uh take a brief break you I was thinking, you know, maybe we we jump ahead. Uh, we'll be a little bit above schedule. It'll be about ten minutes. But if you didn't mind, while we're here, could we uh, just go ahead and start and talk about Meniere's disease? Uh, go with me. Okay, good. Brooke, you're good with that. I'm good. Let's keep rolling. All righty. Uh, we have Professor Doctor Leonardo Manzari. He's going to be giving the next presentation. Amy and Dr. Pierce are cu curious, how do you know Dr. Manzari and, and, and what can we expect on his presentation on Meniere's disease? Um, so Dr. Manzari is the guy, certainly across Europe, Asia and Australia on uh, Meniere's. And I think he's got between 60 and 70, I've lost count. He's got lots and lots of publications specifically on that subject. Um, and he, yeah, so he's kind of been, again, pioneering and pushing forward uh, our understanding of many years. Understood, understood. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into his presentation. I will see you all on the other side. And thank you for tuning in to Vertigo. Oh, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Leonardo Manzari. Uh, I am professor at uh, the MSA and Academy Center in Cassino the center of Italy. I am an otorinologist uh, and I work with uh, DZ patient since uh, 30 years ago. Uh, my gratitude to be a part of this uh, great uh, uh, team of experts uh, and uh, my absolutely uh, joy to, to be in a part in this Vertigo Day. And uh, I was involved to talk about uh, what is Meniere disease and how it, it's treated. What is Meniere disease? Meniere disease in a, is a clinical syndrome. A clinical syndrome uh, affecting approximately uh, 50 to 200 per uh, 1,000 uh, adults. Uh, it's most common between the ages of 40 and 60 years. Prosper Meniere's, uh, the, the, the disease uh, takes his name from uh, this guy. Uh, he was a French doctor who first identified that the inner ear could be the source, com, uh, could be the source of uh, the condition combining vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus, which is now known as Meniere disease. Uh, Big issues is uh, uh, the problem to clinical classification. And in the last uh, 20 years, probably, uh, there are uh, uh, probably 30 years, there are three or four uh, attempts to classify classific uh, the, the disease. This classification is very important to obtain a consensus all over the world about the, the the, the diagnosis of the disease. The first uh, well-recognized uh, classification was, the, was that to, that came from this paper in 1995, published on uh, otolaryngology and the neck surgery, uh, from the Committee on Hearing and Equilibrium Guidelines for the Diagnosis and Evaluation of Therapy in Meniere's Disease. Uh, what the, uh, the committee established 
uh, that the diagnosis of Meniere disease was probably in four steps. The first step is a certain Meniere disease. The second one was definite Meniere disease, as you can see here. Uh, the definite Meniere disease was a stage of the disease that uh, uh, was uh, um, uh, probably characterized by two or more definite spontaneous episodes of vertigo that last 20 minutes or longer. Uh, and, this is very important, audiometrically documented hearing loss on at least one occasion at the time of the attack, tinnitus or oral fullness in the treated ear, and other causes excluded. That's crucial. Uh, as I said, um, as I, I will say to, uh, later, Probably, this is the key, since many, many attempt to, uh, to find the etiology of this disease have been made. Since now, we have no etiology. So we need to exclude other causes that probably uh, causes this type of, of attack of vertigo. The third, the third stage is probably meningitis disease, and since possible, Meniere's disease. The stage of certain Meniere's disease is probably post-mortem uh, diagnosis and uh, definite Meniere's disease and uh, needs histopathological confirmation. 20 years later, the Barani Society, the society that uh, involved all the autoneurologists in, all over the world, physiotherapists, and uh, all the uh, all the uh, all, all, all over the world uh, made this paper published in Journal of Vestibular Research named Diagnostic Criteria for Meniere's Disease. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the key point of this paper is that the, uh, the, the Meniere disease uh, was reduced in two uh, criteria to, class, uh, to diagnose and uh, to classify the, uh, the, the disease in a definite Meniere disease and probable Meniere disease. Probable Meniere disease uh, is uh, a stage in uh, which the, pa the patient uh, complains two or more episodes of vertigo or dizziness, each lasting 20 minutes to 24 hours. Another important key is uh, the fluctuating oral symptoms and uh, not better accounted for by another vestibular diagnosis. For definite Meniere disease, two or more spontaneous episodes of vertigo, audiometrically documented low to medium frequency sinusoneural hearing loss, fluctuating oral, oral symptoms and not better accounted by another vestibular diagnosis. Uh, in uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, classification was uh, uh, accepted also uh, from the Equilibrium Committee uh, of the American Academy of Otolaryngology at the Neck Surgery with this paper from Joel, Joel Gable, uh, published uh, in the same years in uh, the Otolaryngology at the Neck Surgery. Well, uh, Diagnosis, very crucial step. The diagnosis is clinically, is clinical, and clinically unilateral ear symptoms that can list can last for several decades. Attacks are typical, random, and episodic. Approx six or uh, eleven per year. Approx uh, one per month, one or um, per, or per two months. Remission may last month to years, and this is very crucial for the patient since the patient uh, thinks that the uh, disease is, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, finished, but it's not true, obviously. It's typically not made at one point in time, the diagnosis. It, it, may, it may take months or even years to fully appreciate the clinical manifestation. Second step of the diagnosis, 
to maximize the treatment, it's crucial, uh, it's crucial for the clinician uh, to clinically di distinguish MD from other independent causes of vertigo in a sort of MIMO that uh, uh, can uh, reproduce the symptoms of uh, Meniere disease. The third step is uh, the variability in clinical presentation of the symptoms uh, that I mentioned before, uh, or uh, better vertigo, hearing loss, oral fullness, and tinnitus. This is very important. Accurate and full diagnosis may take many months to obtain. And uh, this sentence speaks to the natural history and, above all, variable clinical presentation. So, when a clinician uh, sees a patient that arrive at a clinic with an acute attack of long-lasting vertigo, a major question facing the clinician is, what the cause of this attack? Is due to Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, or superior vestibular neuritis? Well, the patient come in the, major, in the emergency department with these symptoms, and imagine uh, three patients that, that arrive in our clinic in, uh, here in Casino, and uh, the patient show at the bedside examination, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, bedside uh, spontaneous nystagmus. On uh, the first patient, this, this, these are very old um, video, but they are crucial to me to understand what happened with this kind of solution. Looking at the spontaneous nystagmus can, cannot be the, uh, the ideal, the ideal uh, the, the ideal weapon to understand what happened uh, in uh, our patient. If you can see here, the patient, this patient, show um, a spontaneous nystagmus that beat to the right, uh, and the same for this patient, spontaneous nystagmus that beat to the right, the same for this last. The, three, the third patient here, uh, as you can see, same very third, third degree spontaneous nystagmus that be to the right. So three patients with the same uh, spontaneous nystagmus pattern. In this case, uh, four questions arise. Which side is affected? Which sensory region is affected? Can uh, we come up with specific tests for each vestibular sensory region? Of course, and or but more important, we need objective measure. Because vestibular tests until 2005 were spontaneous nystagmus, as I showed you, calorics, head impulse test, and cervical bank. Spontaneous nystagmus. Uh, as I showed, the presence of spontaneous nystagmus tells you that there is an imbalance between the two sides and the direction of the spontaneous nystagmus tells you which side usually but not always more affected in fact the nystagmus beats away from the affected dysfunctional side and uh, but we have a problem we are uh, uh, we have testing uh, horizontal semicircular canal function and a spontaneous nystagmus sometimes, especially in the Meniere's disease, could be uh, strange, strange tests, strange sign, clinical sign, since could be controlational, as Mayer and Van Mella in 2008 uh, published and Kuoid, a colleague, published in 2005. But the direction of the spontaneous nystagmus may change, as Baines and McClure showed in 1991 and 1981. So the spontaneous nystagmus is a variable indicator. Sometimes it, it shows the affected side, sometimes it indicates the healthy side. 
uh, calorics. Caloric stimulation is an old, very well known, uh, very well known uh, vestibular clinical test. Uh, until uh, probably 20 years ago, was the gold standard of the uh, vestibular test. And uh, this is a very low frequency test, which usually, which usually mainly stimulates the horizontal semicircular canal system. And uh, uh, the problem with this with this uh, with this uh, test uh, is that uh, the test is very unpleasant, and uh, the patient dislike it. They feel vertigo and nausea. So, head impulse test is another bedside clinical test, just like this. Uh, this is a bedside clinical test that show us in this case, a clear corrective saccade when the head of this patient is turned to his left side. Very clear. But sometimes the, the things are not so clear and we need objective measurements. To test the head impulse test, the gold standard is a search coil two coils of very fine wire wound in a silicon contact lens. But this is very expensive. Uh, each contact lens costs approximately uh, $700. And uh, the problem is uh, uh, we need a very complex, uh, very complex uh, clinical assessment. So, in the, last, uh, in the last years, uh, uh, since 2007, probably, Mamish McDougall from uh, PhD uh, from uh, the Sydney Vestibular Laboratory uh, invented and proposed to all over uh, to the world of the neurologist this kind of instrument, a very light, a very light uh, uh, mask. Uh, mounted with uh, a high-speed camera and a, a sort of tree sensor that uh, were, uh, are able to identify the plane in which the, uh, the, the head of the patient is moved. This is a trace obtained with the video head impulse test in a normal subject. When we turn the head to the left, I and I and the head uh, closely match, just like when the head is turned to the right. But we have also cervical vent to a conducted sound and one conducted vibration or galvanics, and these are the results. We can be uh, we can obtain this kind of results in many of disease patients, especially at the time of the attack. As you know. Uh, more recently, uh, 2007, 2008, new, new generation is born, recording myogenic potential from the high muscle to sound and vibration. And these are ocular vent, O vent, and they are a new simple measure of autolytic, autolytic function, and they indicate mainly the utricular macula function. These are the, the answer from the test obtained with the vibrator, uh, a vibration over the FZ point. And the uh, only things the, pa the patient must do is looking at, as you can see in this uh, pic, uh, N10 amplitude. N10 is the first wave obtained from uh, the patient, from the patient that looks up. We are recording electromyography of the inferior uh, oblique muscle, uh, one of the extraocular muscle. And uh, I repeat, when we record the hand 10, the hand 10 is this wave uh, recorded under the eye, the contralateral eye, we have the information of the irregular neurons that, um, that respond to this powerful stimulation, just like um, uh, a tilt, a tilt 
for the patient, we record the, the, the function of the regular neurons from the utricular macula. So now we have two VEMs, and then indicate primarily the function of the contralateral utricular macula. P13 of the CVEM primarily indicate the function of the ipsilateral saccular macula. That would, would close the circle. All the vestibular receptor can be tested at all. So, coming back to those three patients with acute vertigo, an absolutely similar pattern of spontaneous nystagmus that comes here in the casino clinic. The first one is this lady, this lady with this uh, pattern of spontaneous nystagmus. I tested there with the the video at the impulse test, bunk conducted vibration, FZ of M, bunk conducted vibration, FZ C band. We obtain this record from the video at the impulse test. As you can see here, a very clear cut uh, uh, black mountain, the eye, the slow face of the high movement uh, indicates that the horizontal semicircular canal to the left does not work, while the right horizontal semicircular canal work properly. Uh, I tested there with OVAMP and under the right eye, we found no N10, while under the left eye, we found a clear, beautiful N10 indicates that the right utricular macula properly works. Uh, finally, I tested there uh, with bone conducted vibration FZ C band, and uh, we obtained a clear P13 N23 under the left sternocleated muscle, muscle, and the same obtained over the right SCM. Diagnosis left neuritis. The second patient was this. This guy is a 72 years old man, come in the casino clinic with the same spontaneous nystagmus pattern and the same, uh, at the same time of the acute attack of spontaneous uh, vertigo. Uh, he complained nausea, vomiting, the same, just like the, uh, the first patient. And I tested him with the heat and there is a clear difference between the first patient and this one. As you can see, we have an increase of the black mountain. The eye velocity, the slow phase of the eye velocity is increased rather than the first patient when, the, when we turn the head of the first lady to the left, we found a cut black mountain over uh, um, turning the head to the left. Well, I test this guy with the same uh, bone conducted vibration, ocular vent, under the left eye, clear N10, under the right eye, dif very different from the first patient, and increased N10. The same for uh, the bone conducted vibration FZ C vamp, same results. So the saccular macula works properly, and diagnosis is left attack of Meniere disease. Finally, very interesting, uh, another uh, another patient. This patient was treated with intratympanic gentamicin for MD in his right ear three years before this attack of vertigo. And he came in the clinic with acute vertigo, as you can see. And in principle, he is in a right unilateral vestibular disease. So, uh, um, sorry, unilateral vestibular deficit patient. So why, if one ear works, this guy show me, show me, this kind of uh, spontaneous nystagmus. I tested him with video at the impulse test, and as you can see, we have a bilateral impairment of the horizontal semicircular canal. 
we have under the left eye no antenna, while under the right eye, the antenna absolutely fine, absolutely beautiful results. So, uh, under, under, over the right SCM, a clear P13 and M23, the same over the left SCM. Diagnosis, selective left horizontal canal paresis with vector effect. This kind of a new weapon, video at the impulse test and the VAMPs, uh, allows the clinician to obtain new information about the very key point in uh, diagnosing an MD. The, the, the very key point is the early MDs uh, and BC of VAMP uh, all of us to, as I show with you, uh, to, uh, to obtain this very crucial information. Because at the time of the attack, there is a crucial, a crucial, uh, a crucial uh, difference between the vestibular neuritis and the Meniere's disease. The pattern of the two diseases are totally different when we use bone-conducted vibration of M. But the spontaneous nystagmus was just the same. Here, the results of another patient at the time of the attack, as you can see, during the quiescence, and then are beautifully, beautifully uh, the same, while at the time of the attack, under the control level of the affected ear, we can see an increased antenna while the C band remains the same. And the VHEAT uh, is a very important uh, new weapon for uh, the clinician since a rapid fluctuation, uh, um, there are fluctuations, there are not only in the, uh, in the cochlea of our MD patient, but also in the vestibular in the vestibular sphere of the labyrinth so we pay, we publish this evidence uh, and uh, i will uh, i will show you two guys with the same acute attack of vertigo uh, in the casino clinic we tested this guy in the um, with the same video at the impulse test and as you can see acute attack of vertigo no oral fullness for both of them, but one show us a clear pattern for vestibular neuritis, the other one show a different pattern, increased VOR gain. Tested both of them seven days after. As you can see here, uh, the reduced VOR gain, while the VOR gain to the right in this other guy remain just the same. And 20 days after, beautiful recover of the VOR gain for this guy with now definite diagnosis of definite Meniere's, right Meniere's disease. In this case, we see that the VOR gain still low and a shower of covert and over saccade indicates and confirming that we are in front of uh, uh, a right vestibular neuritis. Etiology. So the etiology is not well known, but the, uh, these two, uh, two guys, George Portman and Charles R. Pike, uh, at the, in, um, the earliest of the, of the last century, uh, showed the post-mortem in this kind of patient that the, 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 the here, the affected here, was affected of, uh, uh, by a distended endolymph. Um, so they introduced the terms of endolymphatic eye drops. Endolymphatic eye drops in 1983 was beautiful, in this beautiful paper, reviewed from uh, Harold Schuchnecht, uh, and uh, 
he showed the post-mortem the theory and postulate the theory of the rupture of the membrane so the uh, the potassium uh, the potassium ions uh, affect the, uh, the 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 cells of the vestibular system and uh, cause uh, the crisis the uh, vertigo crisis uh, Another very important paper about the endolymphatic hydrop uh, was this one from the, uh, these uh, three giants in our field, Somil Merchant, Joe Adams, and Joseph Nadol, uh, and they postulate that um, the, uh, the endolymphatic hydrops is uh, uh, probably a marker of Meniere disease, but is, it, it is a marker also of uh, other disease. In fact, searching for Meniere's disease syndrome in 28 clinical cases, each case had eye drops in the affected ear. Searching for uh, endolymphatic eye drop, 79 cases with eye drop in at least one ear, 35 have idiop idiopathic eye drops. 44 cases, secondary eye drops, 26 only with Meniere symptoms in idiopathic eye drops, nine without Meniere symptoms, two cases with Meniere thin symptoms, and 42, that this is very important, uh, 42 cases without Meniere symptoms. So endolymphatic eye drops could be associated with also autoimmune, autoimmune in a rare disease, temporal bone fracture, autosyphilis, end stage of the autosclerosis, endolymphatic sac tumor, and acoustic neuromas, but could be not associated with vestibular migraine. So, uh, the, all of this disease, all of these disease, uh, act just like a memo with many ear disease. So the clinician must be very, very uh, care, uh, careful in diagnosis many ear disease uh, without exclude this kind of other pathology of the inner ear. Endolymphatic eye drops may be necessary, but not sufficient, sufficient for MD development. The natural course, typically progressive, fluctuates in a way unpredictable, vertigo, early stages, frequency of acute vertigo attack increasing, increases during the first few years and may eventually decline to near complete cessation. This will not well understood. Natural course of hearing, a beautiful paper in 1984, and uh, this kind of paper showed us uh, how the earring uh, tend to stabilize to a sort of stabilization uh, all over the ear of the disease. The natural course is a big challenge uh, when uh, episodic nature of, of MD attacks affect the patient. Uh, because the asymptomatic periods in between the attack uh, not well understood and positive e effect of treatment versus alternative diagnosis that may mimic Meniere disease could affect our attempt of diagnose the disease. In the, uh, the elderly MD patient, uh, they may be not the typical MD-like temporal patterns. This may be replaced by severe imbalance or vague, vague seed dizziness. I will jump to the treatment. The medical treatment in the Meniere disease allows for attempt to prevent or at least reduce the severity of and the frequency of vertigo attack. The treatment uh, could relieve or prevent hearing loss, tinnitus, and uh, 
oral fullness associated with such type of attacks. The medical treatment uh, try to alleviate any chronic symptoms, for example, tinnitus and imbalance. And uh, the treatment uh, could prevent progression of disease, in particular, the loss of hearing and balance function, with char which character characterize the disorders and improve overall the quality of life. Uh, but no single treatment at this time um, has been shown to achieve all of these aims. Treatment approach. Uh, usually, the clinician try to modify the lifestyle, lifestyle factor, for example, diet. Uh, could be useful a mental health treatment, could be useful medical or surgical treatment. And uh, the treatment approach uh, show a separate, try to find a separate goal to enhance patient preferences and preference-centered care to minimize the adverse effect of therapy in both scope and frequency. Since the etiology is not known, uh, there are inherent limitations about the efficacy of proposed treatments exist. The variable or variables that cause symptoms in the setting of endolymphatic eye drops are not clearly understood. And uh, the paper about Meniere's disease uh, are poorly designed uh, about uh, the, uh, the therapy and often uh, show an underpowered uh, or inad inadequate control. The last paper from otolaryngology and the neck uh, surgery from Basur and colleague uh, show us that uh, many clinicians uh, try to uh, obtain uh, specific but I underlie unsubstantiated therapeutic, therapeutic approaches. This results in a tremendous practice pattern variation in subjective treatment regimens and subjective reporting of MD control. Uh, traditional treatment approach, dietary, lifestyle, and trigger management approaches. Uh, there are uh, medical uh, therapy, and I will open a window on, on this, uh, on this uh, topic uh, in a couple of, uh, of slides, surgical, complementary or alternative approach, oral therapy, and that's crucial for me, oral or intratympanic uh, medication. Medical treatment. Could be uh, a medical treatment evidence base for um, many disease patients. Uh, the Cochrane uh, uh, collaboration uh, come in, uh, in help of us. The first step, the most used, uh, uh, the most used uh, therapy, beta -esteem. With beta for many years disease, uh, can, we, uh, can we use beta -esteem? Many of us use beta for uh, for Meniere's disease or syndrome, but the review of the Cochrane, uh, first published in 2001 and uh, updated in 2008 and 2011, uh, with the objective of uh, uh, with the objective to assess the effect of betastine in people with Meniere's disease. Say at the end, in conclusion, there is insufficient evidence to say whether beta esteem has any effect on Meniere disease. The same for diuretic, diuretics, uh, the same conclusion. So diuretics in update also from the Cochrane, uh, Cochrane collaboration, 
there is insufficient good evidence uh, of the effect of the diuretics on uh, vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, oral fullness, the symptoms of the Meniere disease. And uh, so, uh, there are no, uh, there are no uh, evidence-based treatment for this uh, disease. Of course, the choice of treatment uh, depends on hearing status. Usable hearing, uh, non uh, um, all of us to uh, to choice non ablative procedures, non meaningful, useful hearing. Uh, all of us to use a, a surgical or chemical inner ear ablative treatments. Uh, the rationale for ablative approach is to attempt to convert an unstable ear to a static ear. Ablative approach are designed, above all, to control the vertical attacks. So, I want uh, to say thank you for the attention, uh, good stabilization for your many years disease, and above all, thank you from Italy. And uh, uh, I will, uh, I am very happy to be there in the Vertigo Day. Thank you. All righty, we have Dr. Manzari live with us. We also have Dr. Pierce and there in Italy. Ryan, what are the questions? <laughs> How late is it there in Italy? Hi. Well, uh, Dr. Manzari, there's hey. a couple of questions for Meniere's disease patients. Uh, can someone still have Meniere's without hearing loss? Uh, yes, yes, especially in the first step of the disease. Uh, the, the question is very interesting since uh, it's possible to find patient with uh, only vestibular manier and uh, the question uh, is debated uh, for years and probably uh, the patient come in the clinic with this uh, kind of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, manier's uh, manier's uh, disease uh, just in the first uh, step of uh, the the attack and we cannot recognize the the disease since uh, uh, the the patient show us a uh, uh, audiometric uh, uh, problem but we have now several weapon to to, to understand that th those attacks are related with the early stages of the manure disease. That's my opinion, of course. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, there's a question here from Fiorella. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, uh -huh. What approaches are there for avoiding attacks? Does it include uh, being aware of triggers of any sort? I guess how... How do you normally suggest to people to to uh, avoid Meniere's attacks? Uh, yes, very interesting question. But uh, I think that uh, actually we don't do not have uh, any um, any uh, any kind of uh, procedure to prevent attack. Probably uh, based on uh, ABM uh, evidence. Probably uh, we can uh, we can use uh, many uh, many kind of uh, of uh, procedure such as uh, th uh, therapy with di diuretics or uh, steroids or beta steam. But the problem is uh, uh, who uh, can uh, who is the uh, the the killer that uh, uh, open the uh, that open the uh, the labyrinth and uh, uh, allows uh, the endolymph increasing 
and uh, so we we we, we cannot uh, interfere with the killer we we just uh, wait and see what happens gotcha gotcha um camellia is wondering what is a drop attack is that something you mentioned in your is a is this something that Meniere's patients uh, experience, a drop attack? Uh, in my opinion, the answer is no. Uh, not, not, not all the patients uh, experience uh, drop attacks. Probably at the, uh, the, the, the last stages of the, of the disease, when the utricular macula is very damaged, and uh, probably all VAMs now uh, are the key to understand drop attacks. Uh, I saw um, three or four patients at the time of drop attack, just nearly the time of drop attack. Uh, I'm very fortunate here, since I stay in the middle of Italy, in a small city, and I, and I can uh, see patients at the time of the attack and near, nearly the drop attack. Uh, so I can confirm that uh, Drop attack is a very dramatic um, situation for the patient. Uh, um, a sudden fall uh, for the patient uh, without uh, without uh, the, the patient experienced no loss of consciousness, and uh, above all, the patient is uh, very involved uh, in the in, in in the fear to to return in this kind of symptoms. So uh, this is my my position for uh, the drop attack and the marking crisis in this kind of patient. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Brooke, anything you'd like to add or ask of Dr. Manzari before we kick it off to the next presentation? It's just the last thing that I'm seeing kind of in the live comments, um, you had mentioned beta histine. Um, is that something that is worth trying that's kind of showing up kind of in the live comments from from people? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, beta histine is a, a, a very controversial uh, kind of therapy. Um, I can say it works, but uh, it, it probably works out just like a placebo. So I don't know. I am. I'm. I'm not in the real uh, right position to say Bedestin is effective in all uh, in all uh, no kind of many of disease. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Q. You want to kick it off to the next one? Yeah, we can go ahead and start up the next one. The next one I believe we have is vestibular neuritis. Brooke, let me get, let me pull that up really quick. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Very pleased. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, quick question on Marco. Will Marco be joining us? Uh, no, he's got patients that he's taking care of, so he will not be. All right, well, can you give a quick intro to Marco and who he is, what he's been working on? Brooke, I don't know if you have that info. I know Amy was behind this one. Amy was, <laughs> um, but we will get Marco. He'll go ahead and kick it off. It's going to be on um, vestibular neuronitis and mm -hmm. labyrinthitis. So this will be a good one um, for a lot of people to kind of see following, obviously, the Meniere's. Got it. Well, I'm going to jump into it. You all should be able to see my screen. Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Mark Mandala from the ENT department of the University of Siena in Italy. I'm a neurologist and a skull based surgeon. And uh, this uh, presentation will be on vestibular neuritis, so uh, acute unilateral loss of vestibular function, and especially on its diagnosis and management. The term acute unilateral vestibular loss is the one that we tend to use much more at the present time because we really don't know if this kind of uh, disorders uh, in terms of uh, etiology comes from the labyrinth itself, so from the semicircular canals and otolith organs, 
or from the vestibular nerve. So acute unilateral vestibular loss is probably the right term to define vestibular neuritis. Uh, from a definition uh, point of view, um, the vestibular neuritis or, or acute unilateral vestibulopathy can divide in two forms. We, we know pretty well that the in annual incidence of the disorders is 3.5 uh, subjects over 100,000. Uh, people and um, most of these patients are seen uh, at an outpatient vestibular clinic. Even if, uh, from a symptomatic point of view, uh, this is one of the most disabling uh, vestibular disorders. So, patients present generally with an acute onset of rotatory vertigo that generally lasts for more than 24 hours. So, uh, from a symptomatic point of view, patients are really disabled. So, they, they have to often lay in bed, they have a really strong neurovegetative symptoms, so, so they are vomiting, they are really dizzy, they, they, it's also hard to keep their eyes open. Um, the vestibular neuritis can be subdivided in uh, the most uh, frequent uh, subclassification of the disorder that is called superior vestibular neuritis and in inferior vestibular neuritis that it's uh, an affection of the disorder that uh, is uh, um, localized to the inferior part of the vestibular nerve that that is important because it's uh, the um, it goes up to the um, um, posterior canal and uh, utricle. So, from um, from a symptomatic point of view, uh, it's both uh, very rare and also the symptoms are a little bit uh, harder to define. Generally, patients have a um, subcontinuous uh, dizziness and also the oculomotor uh, pattern is not 100% um, defined. Uh, when we speak about superior vestibular neuritis, generally these patients, and you will see uh, in the following slides, they, they have a pretty strong uh, spontaneous nystagmus. That means that these patients have an involuntary eye movements and uh, they, they are really ataxic. And right now, from a, a laboratory test point of view, the gold standard is to perform a caloric stimulation. So to put some uh, hot and cold uh, water in the ear canal in order to stimulate separately the two labyrinth to see if one is, uh, is working less than the other, or you may perform have video head inputs, and we, we will go all through these examinations. Um, we have to be aware that uh, um, this kind of uh, symptoms and the oplomotor findings uh, can ra rarely uh, be seen also in acute. Uh, central nervous system stroke, for example, acute pontomedullary medullary brainstem lesion or cerebellar nodular infarction can present with the same symptoms and very similar oculomotor patterns. So it's very important that these patients uh, could be sent to a um, specialized uh, clinic where people are expert in neurotologist cause uh, an acute pontomedullary brainstem lesion or cerebellar infarction can, can put uh, the patients at risk of his life. So the differential diagnosis in between uh, these two disorders is uh, it's very important. 
<clears throat> as you can see from these um, famous uh, image, image uh, you can see that how the uh, labyrinth uh, uh, neural innervation goes. So you can see there, there is a superior vestibular nerve, I, as you can see in the slides, that is the yellow one that uh, provide fibers to the lateral canal and superior one and to the utricle and an inferior one that where fibers goes to the succul and to the posterior canal. And right now we have um, different kind of laboratory tests that can uh, identify uh, any uh, pattern of deficit along uh, all, all these tiny uh, sensory structure that you can find uh, into each labyrinth in, uh, in every subject. <clears throat> Which is the natural course? So we said that this patient uh, has an acute onset of rotatory vertigo, so, so they uh, see the world uh, spinning around them, that it's a really disabling condition, so they have um, an important uh, instability, uh, they have neurovegetative symptoms, like as uh, they, so they vomit and they, they have all these kind of uh, symptoms, but the natural course of uh, the disorder is that uh, being between 60 and 70 percent of treated subjects recover labyrinth function. That uh, while only 40 percent of subjects who who are not treated properly recover uh, the labyrinth function as measured with uh, laboratory exams. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, there is uh, around 15% of subjects that do not recover from symptoms despite therapy. So this, this uh, amount of subjects have a long-term disability due to the fact that uh, the labyrinth is not working. And it's, it's also hard to say uh, how much the dysfunction of the labyrinth is related to this kind of long-term disability. But uh, it's, we, we know pretty well that vestibular rehabilitation can improve very much this condition. <clears throat> it's also important to, defy, to define if those patients who are long-term still symptomatic uh, may have some kind of residual dysfunction or uh, another kind of disorders may be uh, related to the um, emotional distress caused by the acute vertigo that uh, vestibular neuritis produced in the acute phase. <coughs> There is an interesting data regarding the long-term disability that can produce uh, vestibular neuritis, uh, and it's very similar to, um, to what happened when we perform an uh, acoustic neuroma surgery, so a major neurosurgical uh, intervention to remove a benign acoustic tumor inside uh, the brain that, and those kind of patients in terms of residual disability are similar to patients who had a vestibular neuritis or acute unilateral vestibulopathy as you prefer to call the disorder. So when we speak about the recovery from um, this disorder, we have different kind of recovery and it's very important to, do, to define it because it's strictly related to the patient's perception of residual, uh, of his, his, his disability and 
his residual symptoms. So we may have a perfect uh, recovery of the vestibular function. So all our uh, laboratory exams are back to normal. Uh, we may have a substitution. So other sensory input may compensate for uh, the dysfunction of the vestibular sin, sin of the vestibular uh, inputs, or we may have a central compensation. So our central nervous system is uh, able to cope uh, with just one uh, vestibular system that is working properly. And uh, we also have to differentiate uh, recovery in between recovery at rest, so with the head of the patient still, that it's pretty fast in the, in the follow-up of these subjects, and recovery du during uh, movements. Because we all know that the vestibular system uh, has a role while uh, mainly why we are moving. So we, it's very important in um, giving us the chance to have a perfect vision and don't have a blurred vision or oscillopsial while, while we are moving. So if you want to stress uh, the vestibular system, you have to move your head pretty fast. Just uh, to give you an idea of uh, what happens when you see a patient in the acute phase of uh, vestibular neuritis, uh, just have a look at these uh, subjects. Here we are using the friends of Googles that are simple um, lenses that uh, have a magnification of the eye of the patient to observe the nystagmus. And on the other hand, they um, remove fixation for the patients. So that will enhance the, the involuntary eye movements, so the nystagmus. Just to have a look. So, you know, the, our patients is very symptomatic. And you can clearly see this nystagmus that beat toward, sorry, um, show you it again, that beats toward the right side. Okay, uh, that means that our pathological side is the left one. So, uh, you may think to the two vestibular system as um, two arms of a, uh, of a balance, and when only the right side is working, the eyes are driven to the right side. Uh, there is also another very simple test that uh, has been a really a milestone in neurotology. It's called the head impulse test, the clinical. Then you will see the um, laboratory part, the laboratory exam of uh, the of this test that is called video head impulse test. And you can see that you have to move abruptly the head of the patients toward one side or the other, asking the patients to fixate your nose. And you will see clearly that when I will uh, move the head of the patients toward the right, as you can see now, okay, we did for the left, you see, uh, sorry, the, um, the patients can easily keep fixation of your nose. If you do the same to the pathological side, that is the left one in this subject, you will see that at the end of the head movement, the patients will have to do another movement to um, come back to fixate your nose. And this is because the left side vestibular system is not working and cannot drive very fast the eyes in respect to a head movement. 
now you you will see you see at the end of these movements you have a a movement that it's called catcha saccade you will see that to the right patients it's fine to the left you see at the end of the movements he have to do a movement to uh, come back to your nose because the eyes were not driven properly by a non-functioning vestibular system of the left on the left side uh, you can do the same with another test that is called head hip test and you can see again we have a left side lesion you see here we while in the previous test we were testing mainly the vestibular ocular reflex that arise from the lateral canal here we are testing the utricular function so a tiny end organ inside the vestibular system and you will see that when we translate the head of the patients to the right the patients can still easily fixate your nose you see while when we are translating the head of the patients to the left, the patient has to do again a cat, catch up saccades to fixate, to refixate again your nose. Because the left labyrinth is not working and is not able to drive properly the eyes. Uh, another uh, key sign in vestibular neuritis is uh, called ocular tilt reaction. So, as you can see from this picture, this is another pretty important milestone in diagnosis of uh, vestibular loss. You see that the patient has a tilt of the test of the of her head. So you see that the head of the patient is tilted to the right, and you can clearly see that you have a pathological disalignment of the eyes in respect to the horizontal plane. You can see clearly that the right eye is lower than the left, than the left one. And it, uh, this one, again, will be, uh, will suggest a peripheral lesion again on the left side. Uh, then, uh, you can perform another two bedside tests because um, one of the really um, big uh, advantage of uh, neurotology at the present time is that most of the tests that we uh, can do can be bedside tests, and you see, and you can see. Uh, um, how much uh, this kind of bedside examination is important, especially when you have to differentiate a uh, lesion of the peripheral vestibular system versus a lesion of the central vestibular system. So something like vestibular neuritis versus an acute stroke of the posterior fossa. And these are two conditions when one you need treatment that can be that can be made uh, in an outpatient setting. If you have a stroke in the posterior fascia, uh, fossa, uh, this kind of lesion uh, put the patients at risk of his life, and you, uh, these patients need to be admitted to the hospital, perform an MRI, and uh, have proper treatment in, a, in, a, in an inpatient setting. <clears throat> Another test that you can easily do to identify uh, which side is pathological, it's called head shaking, head shaking test, and it means that you can shake the head of your patients, like we are doing right now with this lady, and if you have one labyrinth that it's working less than the other, to some extent, uh, you will get a nice thymus that it's beating toward the healthy side. So in these subjects, we have a nice thymus that it's beating to the left 
of the patients, and we will probably have a right side vestibular neuritis. Because when we are doing a head shaking, we are to some extent uh, giving excitation to both labyrinth. If they are symmetrical and they're both working properly, you won't get any nice times because uh, the two stimulation uh, are symmetrical. If you have one labyrinth that is uh, working less than the other, you will have an asymmetrical stimulation and the healthy side will drive nystagmus to its side. Another very simple test that you can do, it's called mastoid vibration test. And uh, you can use one of these simple uh, mastoid vibrators that are used for, for example, for neck massage. And uh, if you have a, one of these vibrators that it's around uh, 60 to 100 hertz, this kind of frequency are able to stimulate both labyrinth at the same time, in respect if you are doing it to the, in the right mastoid, left mastoid, or or forehead, and you will see in these subjects that again you can use the friends and googles. We are doing mastoid vibration to the at the right side, and you will see this left side nystagmus clearly. So it means that our uh, left labyrinth is healthy, and the right side it's. Uh, has a deficit right now. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea to what happens to all these signs and uh, and what happens to other um, tests that uh, we can do. And uh, when we did this study, the gold standard was caloric stimulation. So we compared all these tests with the caloric stimulation. And uh, you can see clearly that uh, in the acute phase, all subjects present a spontaneous nystagmus, and all subjects has some kind of reduction of uh, their response at the caloric stimulation. Um, all the other tests have a different uh, percentage of um, positive uh, of positive uh, sign. For example, here you have the head shaking test that it's uh, very sensitive, and you have the head inputs test, the translational test, and the vibration test. Um, uh, remember that uh, especially head shaking test and head inputs test and the translational test are um, dynamic tests and to some extent also the vibration one. Uh, if you uh, test back these patients after three months, you will see that spontaneous nystagmus is uh, present only in a short percentage of patients, and uh, spontaneous nystagmus is the sign that it's most uh, responsible for the um, acute symptoms. So patients see uh, objects that are spinning are around them, and generally the spontaneous nystagmus in a week disappear in most subjects. So in a week, patients uh, generally uh, despite any kind of therapy they can do, they uh, improve uh, very much from a symptoms point of view, especially if they are static, so if they don't move their head. While uh, when patients present spontaneous nystagmus, they are generally symptomatic also if they are not moving their head. <clears throat> and you can see that at three months there is a percentage of patients that can still present all other signs. So, as uh, can happen often, these patients may not reach uh, a specialized uh, neurotology clinic in the acute phase and 
when they present to the to the neurotology clinic, you may see only those signs. For for example, you may see that uh, the head shaking test is positive. Patients doesn't have any more spontaneous nystagmus. You may see a head inputs test that is positive or a vibration test that is positive. But these patients may not have any more spontaneous nystagmus. And they may uh, tell you that they are just uh, feeling disability, that they are, have, don't want uh, to, to have um, too much head movements, that they will feel dizzy if they move too much, if they move their heads. And um, so you don't uh, only have to think about vestibular neuritis if you have a really important acute uh, vertigo spell where the patient is very busy, dizzy, it's vomiting and they see all the things spinning around him. But you may also see these patients as a long-term disabled by some kind of uh, instability, dizziness, uh, intolerance to head movements. And you see that when, if you continue your follow-up, the percentage of tests that are still positive will lower down further. Um, okay, so, so right now, just to summarize, uh, we saw with our, the case signs uh, of vestibular neuritis, the major symptoms that, uh, as, as you saw, we said, Patients in the acute phase has a rotatory spinning vertical with a, that produce a significant disability. They have uh, strong neurovegetative symptoms like uh, vomiting, for example. And uh, following up these patients, the acute vertigo tends to improve pretty fast, in something in between 48 hours and one week, but you may have a residual long-term disability. Uh, so it's very important uh, to try to identify uh, in which uh, step of the disorder uh, your patient is to, to provide the best uh, possible Treatment. Um, treatment for um, vestibular neuritis is, is, uh, can be either uh, medical treatment or rehabilitative treatment, so with vestibular rehabilitation. Um, right now, we, have, we don't have an, an evidence, evidence based, strong evidence based, gold standard treatment for vestibular neuritis. One of the reasons is that right now we uh, don't know clearly uh, the etiology of the disorder. Um, there are three different theory. The most uh, accredited is the viral one. So you may have some kind, some similar viral infection to what happened in, uh, for example, in the in herpes uh, viral infection, you may have um, a vascular um, disorder where you may have an infarction, selective inf infarction of the labyrinth, or you may have some autoimmune disorders, so some end, autoimmune, end organ autoimmune disorder. So treating the etiology, it's right now uh, hard to suggest because the, the etiology of vestibular neuritis is still largely unknown. Uh, you may want to treat the lesion and we have a uh, few evidence uh, that comes from uh, magnetic resonance evidence that you have an enhancement of the, of the vestibular nerve in the acute phase but also, um, this kind of uh, evidence is pretty low, 
and in this ca in this uh, case you may want to treat osteoarthritis with steroids or uh, you may want to treat the quality of life of patients suffering from linear disease and in this case you have to to treat them differently if patients are in the acute phase or patients have a long-term disability or long-term dizziness. What can be suggested in any kind of patients is vestibular rehabilitation. So any kind of uh, movement that uh, where you have an integration of the uh, three sensory inputs that determine our equilibrium, and I'm uh, talking about vestibular system, so head movement, vision, and somatosensory input. So how uh, the subjects feel uh, the um, The, his feet on the ground and all uh, inputs that comes from muscles, joint, these are somatosensory inputs. The integration of these three uh, different uh, sensory inputs uh, determine our uh, capacity of stand, of walking and moving. Um, so it's very important that any kind of vestibular rehabilitations uh, could provide exercise where you have the activation of all these three uh, sensory inputs. And so you can see that apart from specialized vestibular rehabilitations that is always improving uh, the patient's quality of life, or residual symptoms, acute vertigo, anything, but you may also suggest uh, patients to perform, um, for example, badminton, table tennis, tai chi. Here, uh, with this kind of rehabilitation, we have a much stronger evidence than the one we have with uh, pharmacological treatment. Uh, this is a pretty, pretty famous um, uh, page of a journal where you have a, a vestibular neuritis subjects that have long-term uh, receival dizziness and the doctor just uh, just throw the, the pills to the patients and the patient is asking why doctor you are throwing me the medications and the doctor will say that it's it, you, you will improve much more trying to catch the the drug than having the drug itself and th this is um, very true because trying to catch uh, the pills, he's using vision, vestibular system, because our lady has to move her heads, and somatosensory inputs, because she has to move uh, her feet in order to, to catch uh, the pill. So this is a really simple example of how much can be important uh, vestibular rehabilitation and we should start it uh, pretty soon if, if we see that our patients uh, is not recovery and uh, we will have always uh, good results in terms of long-term uh, quality of life if our patient is doing some kind of vestibular rehabilitation. Uh, then uh, we have also to, to know that uh, uh, which is the frequency of recurrence in vestibular neuritis that it's very low. So 
uh, after you had an acute unilateral vestibular loss, you have less than 2% of chance of having the same disorder on the other ear or on the same ear if you have a complete recovery. Uh, but after uh, vestibular neuritis, you may uh, develop another uh, vestibular disorder that is called uh, benign positional vertigo, having again a vestibular neuritis on the same side on the con or on the contralateral side can, is very uncommon. Uh, we have to say that uh, while uh, a unilateral vestibular neuritis, so if you lose the function of just one lab read, uh, patients can have uh, despite receivable dizziness or many other symptoms, they can have a uh, um, normal uh, life, even if uh, the quality of life can be uh, a bit lower. But if you lose both uh, your labyrinth, uh, the quality of life can be very low. That's due um, to the fact that vision and somatosensory input can uh, compensate uh, for a vestibular loss to some extent. So they can compensate only for um, lower, head, uh, lower velocity head movements, not for mid to high, high head, movements, uh, head movements, velocity of head movement. That means that if you are, uh, for example, um, riding a bike or driving your car and you have a bilateral vestibular loss, you will see objects uh, that move constantly on the horizontal or both horizontal and vertical plane. In this condition, it's called oscillopsia and it is one of the most disabling conditions. So, in conclusion, uh, if you have a look at treatment in vestibular neuritis, we may say that steroids can be effective in restoring vestibular function. But uh, we have very few data on recovery from symptoms and recovery from long-term dizziness. <clears throat> you may use uh, vestibular suppressant and antiemetics drugs only in the acute phase and uh, rehabilitation can be suggested in all subjects uh, and we really have good evidence in regarding the long-term recovery from symptoms and disability related to the vestibular loss with vestibular rehabilitation. And we know that uh, vestibular neuritis have a really low percentage of recurrence of the disease itself, but uh, the percentage of patients who suffer from vestibular neuritis have a higher chance of developing uh, another vestibular disorders called benign positional vertigo that, it, that and this chance it's higher than normal population. So if a patient comes to, uh, goes to the emergency department or to a doctor after a vestibular neuritis, the first thing to check is to um, have a look if this patient has a benign position that can be treated much more easily than vestibular neuritis and with a stronger evidence. Thank you very much. We've got Amy back with us and we've got Ryan. Ryan, I know you've got some questions and I am back as well. Uh, just a few questions it looks like. The first one comes from Fiona. Can you comment on 
double vision as a phenomenon with vestibular neuritis? You got to go, Amy or Dr. Pierce? Sure, I'll take it. Yeah. So one of the biggest things when the ear is not working or the ear is not sending the sig signal properly, it will actually cause the reflex between the ear and the eye to be thrown off. So that vestibular ocular reflex. So when um, you have, whether it's vestibular neuronitis and your, your ear itself is sending a weakened signal, then the perception of what's happening visually can change. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, this one sounds like a physician question, um, so bear with me, Amy or Brooke. Uh, do the vestibular neuronitis patients with head tilt and stacked eyes have their vision checked for binocular vision dysfunction? Prism glasses, question mark? So, go on, Brooke. No, go ahead, Amy. So <clears throat> any patients that come through the clinic in the UK uh, if they have any kind of um, double vision or or anything like that, they, they always will be advised to get the vision checked um, along with the, the vestibular diagnostics. I'm not sure what, what's the protocol in the US. Yeah, it's the same protocol. So it's important, obviously, that when we're ruling out any type of vision concerns, even when we go through the vestibular testing, we're looking at eye movement, not necessarily the the actual function um, um, as far as crispness or your, your vision. So working with the ophthalmologist or the optometrist is really important and kind of understanding when that last uh, vision screening happened um, plays a big role. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then Victoria was wondering, he said, I, I kind of missed this one too, but when he said that there was a name of a very debilitating condition, it sounded like he said posalotsia or something. Do you know what he said? I don't know. I, it might have been it oscilopsia. oscilopsia. Yeah. 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 What was it? Oscilopsia. Oscilopsia. Okay. Say that again, Ryan. No. <laughs> <laughs> oscilopsia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Um, you, you can YouTube videos of what oscillopsia looks like where people have tried to kind of recreate it. But um, um, oscillopsia can be a symptom of a few different dis dizziness disorders. So it's not just a symptom of vestibular neuritis. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Well, that seems like all the questions for from the chat. So if you want to take us to the next one, Q. Alrighty. Up next, we have Vertigo Day, a presentation that has been curated by yours truly, Amy. And I'm going to go ahead and get into that. Amy, do you have any things you want to say before I kick it off? No, go for it. All righty. Here we Thank go. Thank you. And um, today I'm going to talk about three subjects that um, Viviana Mucci, who unfortunately can't be with us today, she's done a lot of work. On. So I'm hoping that I, um, me taking up the gauntlet, can do some of her work justice. First thing we're going to talk about is uh, visually induced vertigo. Now, that's a, uh, a a complaint that patients may have, where they find going into visually stimulating environments quite tricky. So common examples would be the supermarket, airports underground tube, tube stations. Um, they also may have trouble working with their phones, tablets, computers, and find that, that that's very um, visually overstimulating. Typical symptoms are disorientation, general discomfort, postural instability, excessive fatigue, brain fog, agoraphobia, and anxiety. And then along with that, um, pile of symptoms they just generally the vestibular symptoms tend to get worse these symptoms lead to avoidance behaviors so um of course if you go to a supermarket and you feel overly stimulated last thing you want to do is to go back into that supermarket and so what tends to happen is patients start to withdraw and avoid those situations that they're finding extremely overstimulating and tricky So let's break it down. So when we talk about uh, vestibular conditions, we have central and uh, peripheral conditions. So peripheral conditions come from the ear and central are generated from the brain. Now it's important to remember that vestibular 
rehabilitation can help both, both central and peripheral problems. And visually induced vertigo can be a symptom of central or peripheral or both. When we talk about balance, uh, traditionally we'd say uh, you, your balance comes from your ears, your eyes and your feet and then where you are in space. But actually there's lots of um, processes going on and it's a multi-sensory integration at the brain which is what helps us balance and what, how we know where we are and where we're orientated in space. So all these different components need to be working correctly and working together for you to feel like you are centered and balancing correctly. And if any one of these things is off, then that's where you can start getting the disorientation or the stimulation. Now, the vestibular cortex in the brain is actually not in one area. So if we talk about the auditory cortex, which is the hearing cortex, that has a location. Vestibular cortex is mapped all across the, uh, across the brain. And actually, the visual cortex, which is the part of the back, seems to be... Um, there seems to be a lot more weight given to the visual cortex in patients who have a vestibular, uh, sorry, a visual induced dizziness. Um, and they know that from FMR, uh, fMRI studies, where compared to somebody who doesn't have a visual induced dizziness, um, that that area just seems to be a, a, a light topic. So there seems to be a lot more going on there in that area. So what is the management for visually induced vertigo? Well, of course, we've got our traditional vestibular rehabilitation, but that on its own uh, is not, not enough. There needs to be more than just the vestibular rehabilitation. And what seems to be being successful is ocular motor and optokinetic work, um, postural and proprioception training, pharmacology if the patient needs any medication. Uh, dealing with the behavioural aspects of avoidance. So if a patient is refusing or finding it really hard to go to the supermarket, uh, how can you gently, gently get them back into that environment? Um, emotional support for any kind of secondary anxiety issues that uh, occur because of visually induced vertigo. And what's new and what um, we now have access to is virtual reality, which is great. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Okay, so what is optokinetic? Optokinetic is uh, um, visually can be quite um, uh, busy. Uh, optokinetic work requires full field, so the patient has to be in a full visual field. And usually we give them black and white lines, black and white squares, swirls, all those kind of really highly um, stimulating uh, signals. And the reason for that is you're trying to uh, kind of desensitize that primary cortex and rebuild some resilience in how they um, uh, take into the take the visual information in. Um, so if you think about it, you're kind of um, doing it in a safe environment so the patient doesn't have to think about anything else, but just should be able just to absorb this visual information. And if it's done in short bursts, where the patient doesn't have to move, walk, function do the shopping at the same time and um, that that's given them um, that rehabilitation is a lot more safe for them than doing it in real world don't forget about your postural control so um, mus muscle strengthening exercises did the cat likes to get involved in those and um, anything that can help with any postural control and then virtual reality rehabilitation. So you can introduce the optokinetic work in a virtual reality situation, but you can also introduce real world situation in a virtual reality situation. Um, in, sorry, a virtual reality environment. <clears throat> so let's think about it. If a patient is wearing virtual reality goggles, the stimulus is controlled, so they can take them away straight away and you can give them very very short bursts of that stimulus you're taking away any proprioceptors you're taking away other vestibular inputs and um, 
they can't fall if they're seated. And this work is just to help increase their confidence and increase the resilience of that visual information. And um, with the current environment that we're in as well, can be completed at home and it can be managed in the telemedicine environment. Um, there are ways of doing virtual reality rehabilitation uh, quite in a cost effective way. Um, or you can go and buy top of the range virtual reality equipment, but there are there are ways to provide both services for patients. Now, if you remember this picture from the beginning, um, where we where I was saying that, that the visual cortex seems to be more weighted in these patients who have the visually induced vertigo, that's what we're hoping to work on with stimulating the visual cortex. So if you're a patient watching this, what tips can I um, give you? So continual avoidance of environments will delay any recovery. But if you think about it, you need to do it safely. So you'll need some support working on whatever it is that you are avoiding. And if a supermarket, for example, is an issue for you, we, we don't expect you to be going in and buying full week shopping in one hit. Maybe just going in and picking up a newspaper might be a first goal. So you've got to really kind of limit your goals and, and, and stagger them appropriately. Um, limit any kind of screen time, even if it's leisure time, especially when you're trying to go to a rehab program. There's only so much that your visual cortex can take um, each day. So by limiting any leisure screen time, it kind of gives you more to work with when you're, you're working on your rehab. Um, and sometimes working on a smaller screen will be better than the bigger screen. Um, looking at things like the brightness of your TV um, and reducing brightness can also make a big difference for you. Um, during a proper rehab program, um, we do expect this some. It can be some mild to moderate um, discomfort, but it's only in short bursts. For it to be safe, it's got to be just in short bursts. And I always recommend patients if you put your disorientation on a on a scale of zero to ten, we kind of want you at a, about a six, no more or no less, um, for it to be doing the work. But for it to be working. Remember that visually induced dizziness so far from what we've seen in the studies, it improves slowly. So being patient with it and thinking about those small goals and um, just just gradually increase. We don't expect you to be um, doing that full weekly shop within 10 days. You know, that might be a goal that we work up to over a period of a few months. With today's talk, there will be a link below with all the resources and see those resources for any tips regarding any emotional triggers. So if you have a secondary anxiety, which is more, more than usual for patients with this, uh, visually induced dizziness, look at those resources and see if there's anything in there that might help you with those emotional triggers. And most importantly, try not to overwork the system. Um, overworking the system can end up setting me like 10 steps backwards so it is it is one of those things where we have to just be softly softly <clears throat> if you're a clinician and you're thinking about maybe looking at introducing this rehab as part of a program that you can offer um it's very important to assess for visual vertigo as part of your history and that is important even if you aren't doing the rehab um, it, i think it's a it's a it's the symptom that's kind of um, skimmed over when we when we do our traditional uh, vestibular questionnaires. Um, and again, there's a resource for you in the link below, which is a visual vertigo uh, assessment game. Use outcome measures for monitoring. Because the um, goals can be quite small and slow, it's good to use those outcome measures to show that kind of graduated improvement over time. Um, set the expectations with the patient that you only accept, uh, accept uh, gradual improvement. Um, 
so that they don't push themselves too hard as well. Um, we'll use goal-oriented rehab, so really specific to that patient, what is it that they need, which is generic um, rehabilitation programs not going to work. If, they, if you're thinking about using virtual reality work in a real world environment first, just to make sure that they uh, the, that you can see whether they're ready for the virtual reality environment. And when you first introduce the virtual reality, it's um, it's good to either be with them or be with them uh, remotely on a, on a on a virtual call, and um, so you can really kind of monitor whether they're ready for it. And um, I think some some people can not get on with it at all, and you need to be aware and monitoring that. Small bursts of new stimulus and gradually increase. So in our clinic, I might start you with a nice little walk in the park, um, or a walk along the beach, which is quite nice. It's some nice sun music, not much going on, and then um, I gradually would make that harder, a harder environment to look look at and by the end of it you know you could be walking through Hong Kong in a virtual reality environment. The last one that I'm going to talk to you about is Mal's department syndrome. So what is that? So that's a very rare disorder <laughs> and uh, it has um it's when a patient kind of describes that they feel like they're moving, bobbing, uh or rocking, swaying, that kind of sensation, even though they're not. And it has two kind of onsets. So you have the motion-induced onset, which is where a patient can tell you the exact moment it started, um, post a car train, uh, fairground ride, anything like that, they can usually tell you when it occurred. There is another form where the symptoms are described as the same, but it seems to be more spontaneous and non-motion induced. Now the Barana Society has bracketed that under the PPD, for its PPD banner. It is a central vestibular disorder, so do rule out peripheral pathology. There are some peripheral conditions that may give out similar symptoms. So uh, like motor lift dysfunction or post PPD, definitely type thing. Those patients might, might get that moving bobbing sensation. Um, for it to be syndromatic, it needs to be over or longer than a month present. So, you know, you, usually, even I, when I go to the fairground, uh, the next 24, 48 hours, I'll still kind of get that movement sensation. And um, this is this is when it's lasted longer than a month. What is interesting in this patient is that they usually will say when they are in the car, they're happy, they're cool as a cucumber, and the, the symptoms seem to be a lot better. These patients like to be moving because they can't feel that they're the 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 feeling that, that they're moving despite being still. So why does it happen? What's the pathophysiology of it? We're not sure. Um, we do know that there are functional and metabolic changes on uh, fMRI, so changes in the brain when we look at the brain with fMRI. And um, some of the successful research that talks about helping patients with their symptoms talks about VOR adaptation failure or maybe a velocity storage. Now the VOR is when you, your eyes maintain on a target. So this is where my ears are driving my eyes and tell me to look at my thumb. There's some sort of issue with that reflex. <clears throat> so what they do is they try and readapt the vestibular ocular reflex. <clears throat> First thing is they do a profundus second test with you. So the Procunza second test tells tell, or gives us the information of which direction of sway that you have. And the idea is the patient closes their eyes and um, we're trying to see kind of what direction they turn to. So this gentleman will gradually move to the his right. So 
his direction of sway is towards the right. Now the measurements for these tests, um, for the for the uh, for the treatment, was using posturography. And what posturography does is it tells uh, the clinicians how much you're swaying with and without visual stimulus. So that might seem a uh, look clearer on the next slide. So if you look at this, this is the uh, the patient mat where they kind of were swaying on the board. So on the left, that's normal, and you can see that kind of the, the the red is all over the blue, which is what we want. Whereas a patient with milder debarkment, can you see the red lines are all over the place? That patient is kind of swaying. Okay. <clears throat> then those patients were introduced to a optokinetic stimulus. Um, on the left, that's taken from Rucci's study, and on the right, that's taken from Dye's study. Dye's study asked you to tilt your head whilst you're looking at those difficult OPK stimulus. Um, and Mucci asked you to do a sway, but she did it in a slightly different frequency, different way of doing the frequency. <clears throat> but all of their patients made a much uh, a much improved uh, sway result after a few days of having that OPK stimulus. So, so when they went back and did those sway scores, there was vast, vast improvement and the patient's um, self of sense um, and their self sway uh, reduced dramatically. So that's two studies that have kind of replicated each other and um, um, I know that Viviana is now, she's got a crowdfunding uh, thing going on at the moment to see if they can uh, do, do more work on this, but also uh, measure the outcomes with fMRI. So for mild advancement, make sure you rule out any peripheral vestibular disorder, any otolith uh, dysfunction. OPK tra training seems to be the one to make a big difference to these patients' lives. Um, but also, uh, as we've talked and I've repeatedly said, it's multifaceted. So don't ignore the emotional, uh, postural, proprioception. Is there a hormonal link? So women seem to get MDB, um, mild development a lot more than men. And there needs to be further research into that. And then we need, we definitely need to kind of get our heads around exactly what's happening in the pathophysiology to be able to improve treatment management in the future. All righty, we're back. Mr. Cowdery, what are the questions? Yeah, first question for MDDS. Uh, when would you suggest people to go see someone if they suspect they have MDDS? Is it a timing thing? Because you mentioned, you know, for it to present itself, it has to have us, I think, over a month or something, you said. So when would you suggest someone go in and, and, and get seek help? So with MDDS, it's a very specific kind of description. So it's more that kind of rocking, bobbing, swaying sensation. Um, uh, I, I think at this point we should talk about if you have kind of a, a rotatory spitty sensation, if you get that continuously and it, it comes on pretty quickly, that's that's the type of dizziness that needs to be seen to immediately. <clears throat> the bobbin swe swaying, uh, kind of the, the, the movement on the ocean is more of a, it's not such, a, such an urgent issue. Um, and it, we can't call it MDDBS, uh, uh, mild department, until after a month. Um, uh, so, so I would say, you know, as soon as you have concerns, you should be talking to a GP or a physician. And the quicker we can get you seen to, and the quicker we know about you, at least we can kind of monitor your situation and, and see what's going on with you. Gotcha. Um... How about, so we have a couple of VID questions. Does VID present itself in children? That's from Jane. Um, so 
children are funny one because children children you can't really give them the same questions that you can adults um so children you kind of figure out in between in between the uh, in between kind of what the parents say what between the child says that's kind of where you pick up what's going on with them so for example if you've got a quite a young child like a four five six year old mum might say to you oh they used to love playing in the playground but now when we go they hold on to me when we go to slides and swings I would be interested to know more specifics about that question really because I'm not sure of the age range um maybe the older teenagers might say that they have kind of that migraine as they get more aura and the aura makes them dizzy um so it, ju it just depends on the age range and that child specific and, and and you you would have to dive into that history a little bit more specifically gotcha okay and then the last one here for vid um this is from jim he says that uh driving causes him to get dizzy it's probably the speed that the speed and the visual stimulus that's you know hurting him but um you know more generally you spoke about taking small steps with reintroducing stimulus uh, for vid i guess is driving one of those situations where you would recommend taking small steps or is that something you should avoid altogether before you're fully recovered do you want to take this one brooke yeah, so I think with, with anything, it's a matter of working with your specialist and really kind of plugging into um, what that treatment plan looks like. So obviously, if if not um, not feeling comfortable driving or feeling unsafe driving is hindering his progress, that's something that needs to be discussed with the actual therapist that he's working with. But as a general rule, continuing to do activities that are comfortable and increasing your confidence level and your thresholds are really, really important. And so one of the biggest things that we're currently using virtual reality for is to bridge that gap between getting into the physical grocery stores or physically driving behind the wheel and slowly integrating the visual stimuli that you're able or you're able to tolerate with the real world thresholds that are fast, that change, that are different colors and different directions. So really kind of making sure that what you're doing is not, you know, driving from, you know, here to, to Los Angeles on the 405 freeway in rush hour versus, you know, maybe it is the first step after you've been working with your therapist for a while, going to the grocery store and grabbing, you know, a gallon of milk and coming home. So there, there should be a progression and a process to it. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have for uh, this segment. Um, thanks for that, Amy. And uh, Q, take us away. All righty. We are about to jump into when to start your vestibular rehabilitation therapy with Dr. Margie Sharp. Brooke or Amy, do you have any comments to add before we jump into this one? Yeah, Amy, if you could take this one away, because Margie's got some really exciting stuff, and I know... Um, if you kind of kick things off, you'll give her a good good start to this one. Mm -hmm. So Professor Dr. Margie Sharp, she's a um, leading physiotherapist in Australia. She's got a practice in Adelaide, um, and I'm sure the website will be linked in her presentation. Um, me and her have worked o over many years, and, and she is another one who is very... Um, She's pushing the boundaries and she's trying to get information dissemination to kind of push um, dizziness therapies forward. Um, so if you're in Australia, she's a good one to hook up with. And um, yeah, yeah, she's she's she knows her stuff. <laughs> All righty. Well, we're going to get into it. If you have any questions, leave them in the chat. Today, I'm going to be talking about when to start uh, vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Um, the starting point is critical for a successful outcome. Vestibular rehabilitation therapy does involve a multidisciplinary team approach um, to our um, dizzy or vertiginous patient. And that's very important because there are a number of people uh, such as um, the ear, nose and throat specialist, uh, the neurootologist, um, occupational therapist, 
and so on who are um, important people involved in the overall care of the dizzy patient. Vestibular rehabilitation as we know it today is a little different to when it first started. And it started back in 1946 in Great Britain. And uh, Cawthorn and Cooksey, um, an ENT, ear, nose and throat specialist and a physiotherapist, uh, introduced a set of general exercises essentially involving movement of people. Uh, and uh, they had some dizzy patients um, with balance problems, and these people were um, acute. That is, they were very, very dizzy, and it was they were doing these exercises at the very beginning, um, not 12 months later. And uh, they made very astute observations that uh, the people who underwent um, these exercises um, improved uh, their balance and the dizziness decreased. And um, a very important point that uh, they stressed, and it holds true today, is that um, patients who were moving about, getting up, walking, um, and moving their heads about uh, recovered more quickly than those who didn't. So we have taken that very important principle um, with us um, at this stage. And the great thing about the vestibular system, in fact, there are many great things, but from a rehabilitation point of view, the marvellous thing is that it's a very powerful system and it has an inbuilt, inbuilt um, mechanism for recovery. And we call that vestibular compensation. And just a little detail about um, the compensation is that some people can have, let's say, um, an attack of vestibular neuritis, which is generally a viral infection um, in the inner ear. And so it happens very quickly. The person is very unwell, they have vertigo, and uh, they can be very sick too. But we know that some people recover completely, um, and so we call it restoration. Now, what we do know is there are not a lot of people who fit that. Um, category. And they're an interesting group we really need to do more research on to find out what is different in their makeup that they get um, full recovery compared to most other people. What we use in vestibular rehab is looking at adaptation and habituation. And adaptation is um, getting the person again to do some very specific exercises, a little different to what Cawthorn and Cooksey did. And we can use vision, um, hearing uh, helps us to balance as well. And the information from our um, joints and muscles, especially the muscles, um, because when people have vertigo, um, they find they rely a great deal more on their vision um, to help them balance uh, than they did before. So that's uh, adaptation. And another form of adaptation we've found in very recent years um, is that when one ear is affected, as with a virus that can happen. Um, it's a little like two aircraft engines. Um, one side drops down, the engine's not working if it's on the, the right side, for example. And so the vestibular system is very clever 
at bringing in some special eye movements so that when we turn our head, we run, we jump, we somersault, um, everything stays perfectly stable um, on the back of our eye, our retina. Um, but with the virus in the inner ear, um, it doesn't work quite so well. So these special eye movements um, compensate and we can um, maximise on those in um, our rehabilitation. So the other is habituation. Now, the French have been, it was Alain Simont, a physiotherapist and a researcher, and um, several decades ago, um, he uh, chose to do habituation. So just think of yourself sitting in an office chair. What he and his colleagues use is far more sophisticated, but I think if you just think of yourself sitting in an office chair um, and you had vestibular neuritis, it involved your right ear. And so um, that uh, was weaker and you're wanting to try and bring back the asymmetry to being symmetrical because that's how our ears normally work. So what they found, and they've recently published this, but they witnessed it for a, a, num a number of years um, in the clinic, is that they put a person, so it's the whole body, you're in a chair and you're being moved to the weaker side. And, of course, there are sophisticated parameters they've used. But that gives you the idea. So the, it's to actually encourage the um, weaker ear to improve and get stronger. And whilst you're doing that, normally when we turn our head, let's say it's to the right and we're crossing the street to the left, to the right, then the right ear turns on and the left quietens down. And when you turn to the left, the left ear turns on and the right um, dampens down. So they have actually taken the system as it works normally and said, we're going to just work on the weaker side and they have published some really nice results. So that's a really um, super way of doing it, um, quite apart from what has been done quite a lot is um, using, um, you know, looking at something. I'll just, uh, I'll just get my, and I'll, I'll sit side on. So I am just looking at a target and it's a V on a um, background of stripes. So we get people to focus on the V and just to move their head a little to each side and they've got to be able to see uh, the V clearly. If they move their head too quickly, uh, they won't be able to focus. So we gradually increase the head movement. And these exercises make people a little dizzy, which is good, but you walk a fine line in keeping people motivated uh, whilst they're doing the exercises and they need to feel dizzy. So that's the wonderful part of the vestibular system and how it works to the patients, your advantage, as well as to the um, uh, clinicians. Okay, so what's the next one? Okay, but there is a critical time. Um, at one stage it was said, look, it doesn't really in people matter whether you cap capture them at the first or second week that they've had um, a bout of vestibular neuritis or six months later. 
And then some work was done with uh, monkeys. And now um, the French group uh, have actually this year published um, that uh, it really needs to be starting within the first two weeks. And they did their, what I've just done, looking at a target and moving your head um, in parallel with people and everyone was matched um, appropriately for the research program. So they also had people sitting in the chair and spinning, you know, being spun to one side, their weaker side. And in both cases, um, irrespective of the program, the treatment program, um, the critical period was within the first two weeks uh, you would gain, um, uh, re, um, sorry, you would, you would gain within the first two weeks the maximal um, compensation. And the reason why that happens is that the, the brain, the nervous system is reorganising itself so it's good to capture the patient at that time so that we can work with the nervous system. So it's a win-win a all round. Um, and we want, and so do patients want, um, optimal functional recovery and to have um, a good quality of life. Okay, there are some other factors. Um, it's very important for um, the patient to be uh, thoroughly assessed. Um, everybody's different and uh, we need to look at what the individual um, is able to do successfully and what they're having difficulties doing. And also the earlier we see people, the better for many reasons. It prevents um, a patient from uh, choosing some we call maladaptive strategies, but strategies that are really counterproductive to their recovery. And for example, avoiding is like, well, I'm not going to do that movement because it makes me feel um, unwell. And very often it's like movement. Um, you don't want to move your head. You don't really want to move around, get out of bed. It's more comfortable if you just lie or sit down all day, except you're not going to improve without movement. So to teach people that this is how you do it is very important. Um, and, yeah, we, sorry about that. Um, we really want to um, give people the best opportunities at the best time. Another uh, point that's really important is um, we either get them and prevent the anxiety or reduce it um, because people worry about, um, you know, am I ever going to be the same again and, uh, and so on. And they have lots of questions um, for us to answer. And it empowers and motivates people. There's someone that says, we can do something, we can help, and it's a team effort. So when it comes down to, you know, I've been a um, clinician um, for a, a good while, um, vestibular rehabilitation essentially is learning. We're going to be teaching um, you how to overcome uh, this loss of function. And we call it dynamic because the vestibular system is working very much in movement mode. So you turn your head, you get up, you walk to get um, a cup of coffee, cup of tea, etc. So we're moving around a lot. And that 
is its normal function. And so we look at um, different exercises appropriate for that person to help them, um, you know, return to daily living comfortably, jo enjoying their recreational um, activities and being able to return to work. So, um, and it can infect, it can involve one ear, uh, it can involve both ears. Um, and uh, quite often, uh, many cases, there's always a little bit of residual loss or damage um, left behind. But uh, nevertheless, there are strategies we use um, to help uh, substitute for that. So we're really providing people with new opportunity uh, new strategies opportunities to learn new things and do that with us it's like some people find it really difficult um, to stand on a foam uh, mat and they uh, wobble um, a great deal after especially if they close their eyes um, after um, uh, vestibular neuritis, I'll use as an example. And so um, getting them to be able to um, improve their, their balance on that surface is important because most of the world is lumpy and bumpy and uh, you just can't keep walking on um, something that's firm, flat uh, and doesn't move. So they're the things that we do. And people, I find, learn very quickly and um, they want to make a difference so they're well motivated and that's fantastic. Okay. I've really said the first before how we're teaching them um, new, new ways to do things um, uh, to compensate um, for function. We, as I have mentioned before, we customise our programs um, because one hat doesn't fit all. So my take-home messages um, are there's help for patients with dizziness and balance problems involving the inner ear, which we call peripheral vestibular disorders. But it's deep in here on each side, uh, very, very deep. And um, so when we move our head, it moves. Uh, whether we roll over, we somersault, or we jump up and down. And most people who have an inner ear disorder, they don't require surgery or medication. Perhaps in the beginning when they're acute and they're very nauseous, dry reaching or vomiting, then some medications are used uh, to uh, um, prevent that from happening. Um, they're called anti-emetics and we use Stematil a great deal, but there are different medications used in various parts of, of the world. The other important uh, point is that early, and we can use either active or passive intervention, um, that's so important to get the best outcomes. And I just can't emphasise enough the importance of health professionals, everyone, from the general practitioner, your family doctor, to the ear, nose and throat specialists, the neurotologists, the neurologist, um, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, psychologist, and so on, um, really see that the person is referred um, quickly. They, I know what happens in my city is that 
many times people come late in the piece and that could be months later and um, things are just can be quite difficult at that stage than when they come earlier um, and you can tell them what's going on and answer their questions, ease their anxiety um, and fear so that uh, they can um, improve. So I think the dizzy patient has a um, unfortunate time worldwide in finding um, the appropriate practitioners, but we're working on that. Okay, yes, it's preventing the secondary problems of anxiety and some people are just very anxious people um, and uh, the vertigo can unleash considerable anxiety. Someone may start having panic attacks and you learn that indeed they've had a history of it but they haven't had any for maybe a decade and then they end up with um, a vis inner ear problem and they're feeling extremely anxious over and above what we would um, anticipate. They can develop neck problems because they just go, oh, well, I'm not going to turn my neck because that makes me dizzy. So I will just, you know, turn my whole body around to look at someone and we need our, our neck. Um, to move, it's it's part of our um, basic movements from sit to stand, getting out of bed, um, and avoidance. If they don't, if you don't know that, it's important to start moving, but you need to pace yourself. Um, people will just a not move their head and go. Well, it's better sitting down, so that's what I'm going to do. And that's really counterproductive. So, and it empowers and motivates patients. Um, being told there's nothing that can be done, which does happen all too often, uh, is um, just dampens the spirit. But uh, for someone to say, look, there is something we can do and help, um, means a great deal and, and boosts their morale. The other thing is I can only say ask um, around about um, is there a dizzy or a vertigo clinic um, dedicated to, I'm calling it inner ear or vestibular disorders, um, but vestibular rehabilitation that I'm talking about today was um, established for the inner ear disorders. Um, we know so much more now about the brain and the vestibular system in the brain, but this talk today is focusing on the inner ear and the rehabilitation uh, for um, loss of function in, or partial loss of function of the messages coming in uh, the ear to the brain on one ear or it can happen on both. And the other is to find a local support group. In the United States, there's an excellent uh, vestibular disorders association in um, Portland, Oregon, um, and uh, that's um, helpful to find a lo you know, local support group. Uh, we... We will use it from here, um, not, uh, not quite. We can't access everyone from here, um, but we can get a lot of valuable information um, from uh, VEDA and, uh, and let people know um, elsewhere in the world where someone can help them, whether it be France, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, or one of the many states in the United States. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and it's it's been a pleasure to uh, um, talk to you, and I wish everyone all the very best. Thank you.
And we have Ah, oh, it's Margie. Dr. Margie with us. Margie, my apologies. Can you hear us, Margie? Hi Margie, can hey. you hear us? I'm not sure she can. Okay. <laughs> can you hear us? Okay, maybe not. Oh, can you hear us there? <laughs> Margie, think. are you there? Okay, nope. All right, Q. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh well, you can't. You can't hear us. It doesn't sound like she can hear us. Ryan, well, we figured that out. Any questions to start off? Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Um, the first one would be. What are the uh, signals or signs that you look for to make sure that proper compensation is taking place? Okay, Margie, if you can't if you can't hear, I'm going to hop on. Um, can you hear us? Nope. Okay. So, so one of the biggest things, especially when you start vestibular rehab is getting a baseline measurement. And so as Margie was saying, whether you're working with your physical therapy group or occupational therapy group, there's a lot of baseline testing that's happening and a lot of um, measurements that are, that are happening along the way, whether it's, you know, session over session or day over day um, or even week over week. So those metrics are being measured, whether it's um, based on sway, whether it's based on eye movement, or even going back to some of the initial intake questionnaires. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, can your, you know, I think we always kind of talk about, you know, once you learn to ride a bike, you really can't unlearn it, but can you unlearn some of these compensation uh, techni or can your brain unlearn these compensation techniques? So it really has to do with what the brain is taking in. So if the brain's not getting the information properly, when we're speaking just to a vestibulopathy, it really is a matter of strengthening that signal so the brain can start integrating the actual processes again. So it really, it's, it's a little bit different than riding a bike because what you're trying to do is essentially help the brain get the information back um, in the, the full capacity. Um, as far as the signal coming from the ear, making sure the visual system is playing its role and not not overcompensating for that loss. And then the same thing with the muscle input. So once everything syncs up again with regard to the strength of the system and those reflexes can start, you know, performing, then from that point, yeah, it's like riding a bike. So then you start kind of pushing the envelope with regard to physically what you're you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. All righty, let's do a quick audio test. Can Dr. Margie hear us? No. All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to move on. Ryan, you cool with that? Uh, yeah. There's a couple questions in the chat. Um, Brooke, I don't know if they're a little too specific or not, but, you know, just let me know. So Mirhan said, uh, for a patient with Usher syndrome with bilateral total loss of vestibular function and impaired vision, would you recommend only substitution strategies? And if it's too specific, you know, we can that. Yeah, it's it's pretty specific. I think this is a good question. We do have in the um, the actual links, you'll be able to contact um, Margie specifically. But really understanding um, from a physical therapy standpoint, what exercises do make sense and working through those substitution sub substitution strategies um, with your treating um, clinician is really important. So if it's specifically um, for your specific case, definitely reach out um, to Margie and, um, you know, with regard to exercises in general, that's kind of the, the process, um, kind of working through substitution of what you actually have left um, with regard to what the system can give. Gotcha. Kim, Kim has a pretty prescient uh, question here, I think. <laughs> she said, any exercises to help with scrolling <laughs> since we're all on our phones all the time? <laughs> okay, so I love it. So I think, again, with Margie, this would be a great question. But scrolling, usually what's happening is as you're going kind of up and down, kind of pulling the the actual question from um, when Amy was speaking about the visual induced dizziness and then, it, you know, kind of pulling from what Margie was just saying. 
a lot of the gaze stabilization exercises or when you're able to kind of find a fixation point and, and use that as a reference point, taking a break from the scrolling is going to be very important. And so we kind of pull from a few different disciplines, but just kind of, you know, following that 20, 20, 20 rule, um, kind of in the ophthalmology and, and optometry world where when you're looking at something specific, so let's say it is scrolling or the six hours we've all been staring at each other on this, this vertigo day today, um, you want to be taking breaks throughout. So visually, you're going to stop, you know, after 20 minutes, you're going to look at something that's about 20 feet away, find a gaze or fixation point to look at. So something um, simple that you're able to stare at for 20 seconds or so, and then come back to the scrolling. So that constant stimulation visually of the system is not good. So finding and using some of those, um, you know, kind of gaze stabilization exercises are pretty important. Got it. Got it. And then last but not least, Meg was wondering, uh, would vestibular rehab still be useful after 10 months of MDDS dizziness? Yeah, I mean, again, I wish we we had better audio with Margie, but this is really important to kind of take home from all the physicians today and then also um, a lot of the clinicians. 10 months of having MDDS symptoms, it's not hopeless. There is a lot that can be done. So making sure that the actual diagnosis is appropriate, that you've worked with the right specialist to understand if it's true MDDS, making sure that there are not any um, other kind of um, etiologies that potentially could be complicating things, and then working with the right specialist to make sure that you're getting the right rehab. Because again, speaking to Amy's um, discussion earlier and a lot of what Viviana and her group is doing um, with regard to this MDDS space is really exposing the system to a lot of different stimuli. And that could be a lot of the optokinetic stimuli in addition to a lot of the dynamic platforms um, that are being used. So there's a lot of research that shows what works. There's a lot of room to continue to, to explore um, with what still needs to, you know, kind of be coming out of um, kind of a lot of the research institutions. But yeah, definitely not. You know, 10 months is, it doesn't mean you got to live 10 more, you know, years like this. Awesome. Well, I think uh, we've been at it for six hours. We've got one, <laughs> fi one final presentation from right. truly Dr. Brooke Pierce. Q, take it away. All righty. Dr. Pierce, anything you want to say before we get into the age of innovation for dizzy patients? No, I'm excited. Let's, let's hear it. All righty. I will get into it then. Thank you. We're excited to kind of hop into how we put this all together with regard to technology and really the age of innovation for dizzy patients. So the first piece that we're going to jump into is virtual reality. So virtual reality is a simulation of 3D images that are computer generated while you're immersed in interactive environments wearing special electronic devices. So in the dizzy space, there are multiple um, kind of pieces of software that are used now with goggles where patients are able to be exposed to very simple, very repetitive stimuli in a 3D environment. The reason this is really important is because there is a big disconnect between a lot of dizzy patients and what they're able to tolerate from a visual standpoint. And so virtual reality is used in the therapeutic capacity for a lot of patients in order to actually bridge the gap between what we're getting in the real world with regard to um, lights and speeds and shapes and sounds and what patients' thresholds are and what they're, they're able to physically tolerate. So don't think of virtual reality in the sense of popping goggles on and just watching different video games or being exposed to um, like roller coaster rides. There's a very systematic approach to virtual reality when we're talking through the therapeutic application for dizzy patients. So a lot of times the virtual reality is providing a very calming, very simple, very visually under stimulating environment so that the patient can very slowly be increased or their thresholds can very slowly be increased in certain capacities. So what happens a lot of times with virtual reality goggles is patients are able to be exposed to optokinetic stimuli, um, gaze training, and going through a lot of habituation exercises in a very slow controlled way at home. 
So they can sit with their goggles, they can go through the treatment protocols that the clinicians have set up clinically, and then maintain the progress that they're making daily or weekly in the clinic. So it really creates a very simple and a very easy way for patients to use the resources at home. So virtual reality in healthcare in general is used in a lot of different capacities. So kind of speaking globally, in the healthcare industry, VR is being used from everything, from um, robotic surgeries to help surgeons during um, surgical procedures, to pre-op helping patients um, when they're actually sitting there, if there's a lot of anxiety or a lot of angst um, before they're actually going in for the procedure, um, during labor and delivery for a lot of patients, and even then getting into just a lot of education for patients. So it's pretty amazing to be able to pause um, the environment that you're physically in and put on virtual reality and be able to actually immerse yourself in a different environment. So it's, it's exciting for a lot of patients to be able to do that in kind of the global healthcare world. And then in the dizzy space in particular, we're able to siphon that information and make it applicable in a very specific way for our patient population. So what's really important from a dizzy space is how we're actually able to tap into two very specific senses. So a lot of virtual reality, it can expose and, and kind of engage all five senses, but particularly for dizzy patients, we're looking at the visual and the vestibular systems. And you know now from a lot of the talks that we've done throughout the course of the day, these two systems are very intimately connected to each other. And the virtual reality is just a dynamic visual environment that's gonna be able to tap into both of, both of those senses at the same time. And we can use them for rehabilitation and use it very effectively for rehabilitation for patients. So it's, it's simple, it's easy. I think the take home that we really wanna help um, all of you understand is that it shouldn't make you sick. Just because you put on you know, your nephew's VR headset at the holidays or try to VR headset to watch a movie at a certain point does not mean that that's the experience you should be having in virtual reality rehabilitation. The clinician that you're working with should be able to very systematically expose you to the right stimuli at the correct time to make this simple and palatable and effective. So the second thing that we want to tap into is going to be artificial intelligence. And so really, it's just asking a simple question of, can we actually get machines to think for us? And that's really been kind of the point of, of a lot of um, scientific minds trying to tap into, can we really simulate human intelligence in machines? And the reason that that's really important is because Dizzy patients are, are kind of bounced around from specialty to specialty. And so is there a specific algorithm that can be used and a very specific process that can be followed to get those patients to the right spot at the right time or to see the right patient in the right order? And so it's really cool to think about what's happening in healthcare right now with regard to artificial intelligence. So the goal of artificial intelligence in healthcare really should be to simplify the lives of patients, doctors, and even hospital administrators to really make tasks easier that we're all kind of doing on a paperwork you know, standpoint and, and a questioning standpoint for patients, but quicker and more efficiently and effectively with less time and at a fraction of the cost. And so that's really where artificial intelligence comes in and where it's really reinventing and reinvigorating what's happening in modern healthcare. And so if we're able to tap into machines and allow these algorithms to really predict, comprehend, learn, act, do all these things that um, we need them to do to make the, the end game easier for patients and make the end game quicker for patients, then it's a win-win on all fronts. So if you think just kind of as a general rule that artificial intelligence is machines doing the thinking of humans and taking these large caseloads and taking a lot of the human errors out of the game, that's where a lot of the excitement um, with AI and healthcare really comes into play. 
So with that, you know, electronic medical records are going to be a big piece of that puzzle and how a lot of the data is being siphoned and then how a lot of the algorithms are being um, put into play because the use of electronic medical records over the last 10 years or so has really allowed us to take patient's history, the diagnosis, any medications, put the treatment plan together, kind of the big, 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 big picture in one spot. And so it's allowing access to evidence-based tools and letting the clinicians and the providers really make decisions decisions on a global scale. So it's automating the actual um, provider workflow, but it's helping the patient experience be streamlined. Um, I'm going to read directly from the slide, but the healthcare industry and computing technologies, so taking what we know with healthcare and then the computer technology itself, really is at a final point where these enormous amounts of data that are very complex can be put together and then really evaluated in a very meaningful way. And so the reason that's important, if you keep thinking about the dizzy patient and how we kept talking about how confusing it really is to kind of go from specialty to specialty and from wheelhouse to wheelhouse, it's important to understand that through artificial intelligence and, and trying to figure out how we cut and, and shape and put the patient into the right um, department and then use the electronic medical records to really kind of look at the patient from a very, very big global um, scale, then all of this comes together a lot quicker than it used to. So what is the future of AI and dizziness and really understanding how we make supported, or excuse me, how we make very um, confident and very effective decisions. And so using AI as a decision tool to assist in the recommendations and the appointments and the treatment should really help kind of cut out the five to six to, to five to six to seven specialists that, that patients are seeing. And the goal is to allow the fastest time to correct that diagnosis of the patient with the best outcomes. So really the kind of future of all of this and putting you know, the bricks and mortar of the clinics um, at the ready of patients comes with the actual understanding of telehealth. And telehealth is the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to extend that care outside of the clinic and into patients' homes and where the doctors aren't necessarily in the same space at the same time. And so we've talked kind of globally and internationally about the lack of resources for dizzy patients and the dizzy community. And so telehealth is, a, is an amazing way that we're able to bridge the gap between bricks and mortar clinics where you're able to go in and, and physically see a patient that, or excuse me, physically see a clinician that's close to you versus telehealth where you're able to have access to patients excuse me, to have access to doctors and other clinics outside of your city, outside of your state, or even outside of your country. And so this is really exciting because not only from a diagnostic standpoint, are you able to tap into different resources and different um, clinicians, but you're also therapeutically able to access um, different tools and resources that might not necessarily be right next door to you. So. Really, whether you're at home or you're at the office with telehealth, you're able to tap into your doctor through video um, or even phone. And this is important because you can communicate, you know, via phone, via video, via, you know, even email to get the answers that you need in a very intimate way. And so you are able to very effectively and quickly communicate with your clinician that you've built trust with and that you're able to tap into the resources that they're able to provide. So when we start integrating all of this, so how do you take all of this and put it all together? And the simple answer is that working with the right clinicians, they will be able to kind of direct and put these puzzle pieces together for you. And so most clinicians that are working in integrated healthcare systems or are working in collaborative environments are very aware of what's already happening in the background. Um, a majority of us are already using a lot of electronic medical records. The majority of us are already using telehealth resources. 
really tapping into what the artificial intelligence capability is. There are multiple hospitals and different um, facilities throughout the world that are currently using AI to triage patients and get patients into the right specialty a lot quicker and a lot more effectively. And so the bottom line should be what's happening internally from a healthcare and a provider standpoint should be being translated um, on the outside. And, and for the patient, that should just mean ease of use, getting your appointments a lot quicker, getting your information translated a lot faster from, from um, your treatment team and getting the answers that you need a lot um, quicker too and a lot more effective and efficiently. So we should be embracing this. We should be excited about this from all facets. You know, technology is the future and using it responsibly and efficiently is really um, how this all comes together for all of us. All righty, we have Dr. Pierce, Ryan, what are the questions? How are you looking? Ryan, you're on mute. I mean, Ryan is, he's, he's off from the day. I think, I think six it's hours. It's been a long is beating game, him. you guys. Yeah, it's beating that boy down. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking on mute. <laughs> uh, let's hear it, Ryan. Okay. I don't know how video game streamers can do this every single day, but six hour stream. Thanks for everybody who, who rocked with us this whole time. I mean, we have, uh, Cities from Malaysia, and she must have started, or he or she must have started at 2 a.m. this morning watching. Um, yeah. We had people in the UK who just started the stuff at like 9 p.m. and watched through till 6 a.m. I mean, pretty incredible. I'm. It's amazing that everyone wanted to uh, wanted to see this stuff that bad that they forego they forewent sleep just to watch it. So thank you to everybody who who joined us for that. Kim says it was long to hang in there with vestibular problems. Kim, we tried to make it much more uh, accessible to all of you all. We were taking feedback and suggestions on the, we had the spelling and y'all a little quickly. Yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you because I know, I mean, I think just kind of speaking to kind of the, the global um, audience that we had, that this is, you know, it's very interesting for a lot of patients because there's not a whole lot of resources that they're getting in in um, in a, an efficient way. So it's exciting. I know it doesn't feel good to sit through, you know, six hours of anything, let alone when you don't feel good with a vestibular disorder. But really, the whole point is to really, you know, kind of siphon what we know nationally and internationally is happening so that these resources make a lot more sense and they start to become a lot more mainstream and that we're able to really continue to collaborate globally so that, you know, the end game is people feeling better a lot quicker. Yep. And for everybody who's still watching too, this same YouTube link will be uh, available afterwards and we'll add some comments down below in the notes that kind of breaks it up to tell you, you know, the mal de debarkments is, is at this time, the BPBV is at this time. And so we'll break it up so that you don't have to sit through six hours and you can go right to the section you want to uh, watch as well. All righty. Good. Well, with that, Dr. Pierce, you're a legend. Thank you oh, for hey everything that you've done. <laughs> Mr. Cowdery, you're a great moderator. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> and on that note, I will catch all of you all in the future, and I am out. Bye, guys. See ya. <laughs>